Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 379 of Spit and Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney from our friends at New Amsterdam Vodka here in the Barstool Sports Podcast family. What is up, everyone? The trade deadline came and went, and we had a big old sonk trade, a little recall action. We had a fire wagon battle of Alberta, no pun intended. And the craziest moment, not only in Oscars history, but one of the craziest moments in pop culture history. We're going to get to that shortly because everybody's been buzzing and talking about it. But first, as usual, we check in with the fellas. Producer Mikey Grinelli, what is up, guy? Uh, yeah, all right. A little disappointed you didn't introduce me as sumo wrestling champion Mikey Grinelli <laughs> after my performance <laughs> at the Wheeling Nailers in game. In the flyweight division. <laughs> <laughs> but to each his own, uh... Yeah, spent the weekend in Wheeling and had a blast with Biz, hit all of his old spots, and it's going to come out on video, so just can't wait for all this content to roll out. Yeah, you guys look like you had fun down there. Did a couple of other adventures we'll get to in a second, but next up on the crew, Paul, Biz Nasty, Biznet. Good to see you last week, my friend. Oh, my God, it was so fun. Well, and Atlanta, so we got a lot to get to about that trip and, of course, uh, Wheeling, but uh, it was great seeing my old stomping ground, and we got uh, KB and Nick and involved with the content and these guys i don't know how many of you people listening follow barstool know who kb and nick are but these guys are a treat so uh that really uh that was a great way to wrap up the echl jungle series um i'm excited it's done because it was you know a lot of work thank you to sean apuzo because he he's been doing a crazy amount of logistical work in order to get everything in order for us to film it of course grinelli and of course all the teams involved orlando atlanta and then wheeling. And you know what? We, we ended up going three for three in the game. So I'm down a little bit of money because I would put money on the board every time. Uh, but one thing I have become really good at is reading the lineup card. Cause I know that first game when we were in Orlando, I fucking completely butchered it. But now after the wheeling game, I think, uh, I think that's going to be my new MO. So once again, thank you to pink Whitney. Thank you to laundry sauce. Thank you to everybody. And, um, for more reasons than just this, all you spit and chicklets fans listening, even if you're not a huge YouTube guy or girl go subscribe to your YouTube channel because we're going to get to a few more reasons as to why you should. And I guess I'll wait for you to introduce wit RA before we divulge even more information going back to the Atlanta trip. And last but not least, number 19 in your program, number three in your heart, the wit dog, Ryan Whitney. What's going on, buddy? Welcome home. Why am I number three in their heart? Oh, I was just to bust your balls. <laughs> it would r- rattle you a bit. Everyone's Fuck you, all right. One, so uh, great to see you guys. Great Died. to catch up with you guys. Biz, um, I saw you were given the key to the city in Wheeling. <laughs> <laughs> I to forgot to mention that. I mean, holy shit. By the way, the key is like maybe the smallest key to the city I've ever seen. But I need to ask you about a story involving Wheeling and... Um, Something that happened uh, at a red light just outside the bar, the 19th hole years back when you were a two-time All-Star? Okay, so KB and Nick did not believe me. There's one person on this planet who can confirm this story. And I told it as we were at the or near that red light. So we were leaving Generations Pub, which is a bar there, and we were going to another bar called the 19th hole in which we visited. So I'm with Adam Henrich. We're, we're all jazzed up. I think we just won the game. Um we pull up to the stoplight. We're kind of just talking back and forth. And all of a sudden, boom, get hit from behind from a car, little Honda civic. So I'm not like overly pissed. It's like, fuck, now I got to get out and deal with this. So I get out of my car. I I start walking over to the other car and they had a stick, a stick shift, a standard car. Well, they throw it in reverse and then try to book it, but they stall the car, (laughs) the two guys. So at that point in time, you know, my antics, I ended up getting in the bar fight in Wilkes bear. Like I was a complete fucking snap show, immature young guy. I walk over the car and I boot fuck the rear view mirror right off the driver's side, right, right off the door. As they're like <laughs> stuck as, in neutral, as, as they're trying to rev this car back up. So <laughs> I, I boot fuck it off. I start walking back. You could hear <laughs> they get it going and they drive right at me. I fucking take a jump squat and I toe tap the roof. I literally jump squatted the entire Honda Civic. So I tell this story to KB and Nick and they think I'm a liabetic. They don't believe me. So I, no, reach no, out. I believe you. So I reach out. They're like, they're like, what's a jump squat? And I'm like, exactly. But like at that point in time, that was part of our training. Like we would do those box jump. Squats oh yeah. All the time. You, and you could do the big boxes, dude. Big time. I, 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 at that point I was, I was squatting close to 400 pounds. So I got these guys grilling me, calling me a liabetic the whole time. I'm on my heels. 
So I'm trying to get a hold of this Adam Henrich who lives in Toronto, who I played with, who was in the passenger seat when this went down. I'll never forget. He was like, what the fuck? What? He's like, what the fuck just happened? Like he couldn't believe his eyes at what he'd just seen. So he never ended up texting me back. I tried to FaceTime him to get him on camera, uh, on like on the camera, which we had like the whole, the film crew. So I hope that he could confirm. We need him message. to get in touch with you now because you know KB knows where I get Nick. Or like Biz is full of shit. Yeah, now they think I'm a liar. That's like the worst feeling in the world. So uh, that, yeah, I, I thought you were going to ask me about a few other stories that happened in Wheeling, but there was I've heard still, the other ones. There were some wild times there. And I, oh my, I read one comment on the Instagram after I got the key to the city and it was a pretty decent sized key. It was probably what? Yeah, a song. Time. Well, no, I mean, compared to an actual key that you would put in a door and someone goes, that's the, that's the size that he needs to do key tokes off of it. <laughs> I think someone, I think somebody wrote that, that on the Instagram comment. That one, that one had me buckled. All right. Fuck. You would need one of those huge ones. Well, that they got I, know, on the Simpsons. I know. I got Maya Quimby one. No shit. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, a, it was such a nice gesture. I was not expecting it. And uh, Louis Dumont was the other guy who was honored. Uh, yeah. As who well. was that? A uh, uh, long-time ECHLer had an incredible career with the Thunderbirds. He was there when they had the original team, and um, he was kind enough to put on the sumo suit because I was going to put the sumo suit on, but I threw my back out washing my toes, which is another one that I think people thought I was full of shit on. Um, but he ended up going out there, and I was shocked that Grinelli took him down. And Grinelli embarrassed him. He was he took Did him you down. Really, G? Oh, and then he was jumping on top of him after he was already on the gra- ground, face planted, like face first on the ice. So he did two more dives on top of him. So I went in with a game plan. I went in with a heavy game plan. It was a little <laughs> cheap. It was it was kind of cheap. Like I kind of. How old is Louis? I would say probably at least forty five. He actually played. Um, he played with the Kamloops Blazers with Shane Doan and Tyson Nash. So he, he'd won some Memorial cups with those guys. Uh, so he's, he's definitely up there in age. I would say at least 45, maybe closer to 50, but, but he took, you know, how a sumo wrestler, you're supposed to go right at the guy. Grinelli like kind of faked like that he was going to go at him and then just went whoop ole and then he and then he fell down because well, because right before we were me and biz had like a long talk right before and he was telling me how like he always over prepares for everything so right before I went I heard his voice in my head like you need a plan you got to be prepared so I'm like fuck I can't just run at him so right at the last second I'm like all right I got to do something and I just I just dodged him and he just fell on his face and then I threw the flying elbow on him all right, I'll take credit as coach for the win. Definitely. Wow, definitely I, I need credit. to see this video. I but need to see this go the, down. The, the, the fans were incredible every single rink we attended. Um, I'm not sure exactly when the videos are going to come out, but you know this this whole idea, I mentioned it before, it sparked when we did the ECHL Player Relief Fund. Wheeling had reached out to do this honorary night. Uh, we somehow got collabed with Orlando involving the Pink Whitney, and then Whit, you were obviously able to attend that one. And then the Atlanta one just fell into the mix because um, Derek Nesbitt was the one who had a hand in helping us with the ECHL player relief fund. So we're going to roll them out where the Derek Nesbitt is going to come first. Then we're going to do the pink Whitney night in Orlando. And then we're going to finalize it with the wheeling night, like as in like business coming home. So each, each video will have a different look to it. Um, and, and it's going to have a different feel from different content that we've put out on our YouTube channel. Guys, we're really just trying to push the, the, the video work as well as just the podcast. And we really hope you guys enjoy it and you're entertained, uh, much like some of you were for the ball hockey. And then we actually just released another video that uh, was, was us after Vegas uh, going to Aspen. And we, we took a little bit of heat for that because, uh, and, and G, I don't know if you want to chime in here, RA, before we get on back on track. But yeah, well, one quick thing about the ECHL series. Uh, yep. You said you're down money because you were at three games and they went three and all. I, I put four grand on the board at, at, at Orlando because they were playing Utah, who was a wagon and they won. So I've sent them two grand to Kevin Lohan. I got to get him. I got to get him another two grand. So the solar bears are probably talking about how cheap witty is, but I'm going to get you the rest of the money. I got to wait till Venmo allows me to send it. I'm going to end up getting audited over this fucking game, but um, <laughs> I do owe Orlando money still. Say so nothing. I wanted to, I wanted to well, recognize those guys well, have two G's more coming. To be fair, I think I threw 500 on the board originally, and then I brought them out to the bar, and I think I had 1,700 on my tab. So you could be off the hook for some of that money because we had to give it to them collectively as a group. They ended up making out like bandits in Orlando, and they're the most spoiled of the whole bunch. So Yeah, no uh, shit. Uh, I, so, so about uh, 
Aspen, though. I thought the video was good. And, and, and Sheldon's basement is just the biggest joke I've ever seen. Everyone has to check that out. But what did you guys get chirped for? Well, uh, oh God, now I'm forgetting the name of the town that he lives by. So we went to Aspen to, to do the skiing and, and we went to Kiwasabi. Is that the name of the hat place? Yeah. yeah what that hat cost you that, that you got biz put on it? It was a gift from Sheldon, a very nice gift. Cause you know, we took wow. care of him when he was in Vegas, 300 grand. bucks, three grand wit. Three Fuck grand. off. <laughs> that hat was $3,000. I don't know if I, I don't know. I, I didn't see the price tag on it. What does it jerk you off after you wear yeah, it? No, it does. It's amazing. Every time, every time <laughs> yeah. it tugs me off. It's amazing. I just blow inside the brim. And it Dude, actually is, it, is it. it a suede or like cashmere hat? It's you cool have, as fuck. It's you really cool. Mean, yeah, but it's three G's. Oh, wow. Well, well, it was a very nice gesture. And then of course we, it was. So the so where he ended up donating this rink and runs this charity is 45 minutes outside of Aspen, where half the population is Hispanic, is Hispanic, excuse me. So he's helped try to, to grow diversity in the game and donating this equipment to not just like rich white kids in Aspen. So some people were firing off on on YouTube like it was like, oh, yeah, like that's racist. To, 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 yeah. <laughs> All right, you can't fucking chime in when I'm trying to be serious with that shit. It's uh, <laughs> it's it's El Jabel is the town. El Jabel is the town. So, oh, so all you did was misword it. He actually is helping out tons of kids who don't have the money to usually afford to correct. play hockey. It's oh, but people the, thought Aspen. It's like the boys like, and girls club at Aspen really yeah, needs a like, lot of help. Yeah, people. Yeah, people pulling up in their Ferraris and their Bugattis <laughs> don't need free sets of free sets of gear for their kids. So he's doing a great thing for the community. 45 minutes outside of like the downtown in Aspen. And so I don't know some people were being a little bit rude in the YouTube comments for any of you who are you now going to sign up. Yeah. You don't say go, go back us up. There was a few other people who were trying to clarify that this thing is 45 minutes out of town. So nonetheless, thank you to Sheldon Wolitsky for doing an amazing thing and an amazing lid that tugs me off every time I put it on. Speaking of amazing lids, um, look at this bad boy that you can get in the Boston store. I mean, Gee, this is a good job. A little spit and chicklets action. Bauer here. Logo on the side. Good stuff, man. The Bauer hat. That's a r- sick curve you got on that. You look like the kid in Sandlot with the fishing hat on at the <laughs> beginning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm a big curve guy. You know what city kids would curve them? Fuck oh, yeah. You out. city kids are such curved hat guys. What are you talking Shady about? Fuck. <laughs> yeah, we curve hats with that. We're pulled down. That's like that's like a 80s, 1980s like city kid thing. No? Oh, okay. I mean, right. didn't um, know that. I lived around here. That, at least it was anyway. Tons of compliments on the new merch, though. We we did a, oh. a floral pink Whitney type of collab, and, and gee, you crushed it as as always. And I know we've been pumping our own tires here as far as YouTube and merchandise. People are probably like, shut the fuck up. Talk about hockey, you losers. Well, fuck, nobody else is going to pump our tires. we got to pump ourselves up once in a while. We're getting shit on for helping out rich white kids play hockey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, oh, the, fuck. the bucket hats right off right oh off. that hat looks great i love the floral arrangement within the pink whitney it's great and then pick up the uh for the youtube viewers pick up that that brim a quick all right show the underneath of the brim oh, oh yeah bang i love that a flo- little extra flower right good there. job g yeah good stuff gorgeous thanks stuff. boys uh i gotta admit i saw the aspen video and i gotta admit i was a little jelly seeing the boys out there uh on the skis, you know, like shit. Cause I was not too long ago. I was saying we got to do a group trip. Wait, you weren't there either, but uh, we, we got to sometime do like a, just whether it's just for a vacation or what a little chick, let's group ski out just to see who's the best ski. I know what biz was getting tripped. He ended up in the woods. I, I no. you looked out right out there last year. So I don't think you're the worst, but we got to see everybody. I was struggling to get my find my edges again. Uh, with, yeah. But to be fair, R.A., you guys did go to the outdoor game in Colorado Springs, and we weren't un- unable to attend. Yeah, we were yeah, worst experience of all time. It apparently, it's the worst outdoor game ever. But yeah, you, you got me there. <laughs> I, I'm, I told you guys this year I went skiing. I'm a once a year ski guy, and now that this year we did the ski and ski outhouse, I won't do it any other way. Other than that, you can have skiing. You can take it. Once a year, awesome. But in terms of like at least having to travel to do it every weekend, a lot of people, that's their kind of family. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, Retreat. Activity, right? Where all winter they go up every weekend skiing. Take it. Um, speaking of other things that happen once a year, the Oscars that took over the internet last night, I, I thought it was going to be the same old boring Oscars. Everybody was chirping at RA. And then I see your tweet. 
And I'm, and then it got me curious. I'm like, oh, it probably wasn't something that crazy that happened. RA is just over exaggerating. Well, then my timeline keeps getting filled up with more just comments. But that was before a video could get get uploaded. And then the great debate happened for about twenty to thirty minutes. And then I Kabu. think it's still happening, Biz. No, RA, right, I'll let you take it over. Okay, Biz. Yeah, uh, I had the Oscars on. Obviously, uh, we had a little powwow, and I caught this afterwards, man. I, I honestly thought I thought like at first, Will Smith was doing like a Godfather tribute because they were doing the Godfather tribute, and he was going up and doing like the fake Sonny Corleone punch. Like that's like because that's it was such a strange thing to see him get up. But then I watched him. Like, wait a minute, I think he really hit him because like in the Godfather, Sonny Corleone inf- infamously misses his punch by that much. It's probably the only flaw in the Godfather. Oh, when he's so, beating up his brother-in-law. Yeah, when he's yeah, yeah when he's beating yeah. when he's beating up. Uh, uh, was not worse than the Paul, beat up Paul, scene Paul, in the Paul, Irish, man. Paul. Huh? Not oh, worse yeah. than the beat up scene in the Irish. Yeah. Man. Well, I don't know, man. Some people might 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 contend one's worse than the other. But either way, I, I was like, okay, he made the joke, to, and I was like, GI Jane joke. That was harmless. I mean, just for anyone who missed it, he said, uh, "GI Jane, I can't wait to see you in GI Jane 2. Now, if you're not familiar with GI Jane, it was a Demi Moore movie in which she becomes like a Marine officer, and she shaved her head, literally shaved her hair off for the role. So it sounded like an innocuous joke. Ha ha. She's got it. Cause Jada's always kind of had her hair short. Well, unbeknownst to me and a lot of people and probably Chris rock as well. She, she came out a few years ago and said she had alopecia. Now I don't expect celebrities to know other celebrities, you know, medical conditions or whatever. And I don't think Chris rock would make that joke if he, if he knew it. Uh, and he's joked about Jada and it passed Oscars, nothing like that bad. And dude, we'll get up and like walked up and it, you know, felt like a skit or a bit or whatever. And he hauls off and fucking pimp slaps him in the fucking face. And I'll dig yeah, kudos to rock. He took it like a champ. He shook it off. He went back into to the audience of a hundred million people again, but everybody was like, is this real? Is this fake? What the fuck is going on? And then the audio come out. Cause everyone thought it was a bit. And I'm like, wait a minute. If it was a bit, they wouldn't have muted the audio. Cause the whole part of a bit is to make people laugh. So the whole thing was fucking muted. And then like the Japanese feed come in, the Japanese feed come in, the Australian feed come in and you could see Will Smith, the real anger. And I'm like, keep my wife's mouth, my name out your fucking mouth. And like that whole theater was silent. It was like, is this, that's when I tweeted, what the fuck just happened? Like, that's what I tweeted. And, and everybody's like, what's going on? And then the, the slow motion come in and there was no doubt he struck him. And people still thought it was fake, but, I don't know, man. Will Smith, like he, and then ten minutes later, he was the fucking best actor or what? He's oh. up there and he's and he's crying. And he's talking about love and don't you know? Family's the before everybody. And then there's the whole subtext of him and his wife that fucking interview that come out, uh, what a year ago, in which they acknowledged having an open marriage and other guys have fucking you know been been on his fucking turf. Uh, and he gets mad at that joke. I get it's a medical condition, man. It was so crazy. A pop culture thing that I, I've never seen anything like it before. Let's go to one of you guys for a reaction. Biz, we'll go to you first. Well, I knew it wasn't fake because, uh, well, like you said, the audio, but I never thought it was fake at any point because you could see how how uncomfortable The Rock was on stage. Or The Chris Rock. Rock. Chris, Rock. Chris Rock. The Rock was there, It was though. The Rock. Will Smith wouldn't have done <laughs> shit. Yeah, oh, that's funny, man. That's funny. <laughs> that's what a lot of people are saying. But uh, then you saw the behind the scenes of somebody videoing when um, – Denzel Washington and Bradley Cooper were trying to calm him down. And, you know, you could tell he was very shooken up by the whole ordeal. I guess the most bizarre part about it is when he dropped the joke, you could see Will Smith laughing. Like he enjoyed the joke. And then he looked over and Jada was not happy. And then he kind of just completely changed his oh, tone. And, that, <laughs> and I mean, you mentioned the history too. Like, yeah, like one of... One of their daughters, R and B slash rapper friends, like crushed Jada, so it kind of shook up the family. And then they went public with it. I think that Jada's got this podcast called The Red Table, and then they did brought it to there and had like an open discussion. And like Will Smith was crying, which is like, it's so bizarre because like man, like I don't really fucking like I, I go handle that behind the scenes man that's like that's your family it, i'll say that there's no way i was turning on the oscars after that because it, it what they, they basically knew that he was going to win best actor for the serena serena williams king richard what yeah. was, king richard king richard which he did a great job i ended up watching Terrific. the movie it, it was amazing I, I suggest everybody watch it but then you you know you, you start seeing the tweets about like how awkward and uncomfortable the speech was so talk about all-time Twitter nights, I would put it up there definitely in the top three, if not king king of 
the, the top of the throne with. I, I have been open about how much I kind of dislike Twitter. I'm on it so much now. That was a moment when Twitter's amazing. That is what Twitter was created for at the beginning. That's what it was back in the heyday of Twitter. That's all it was all the time. And then everyone became so sensitive and everything became so, you know, kind of hot button issues. That moment was so good. It was 10 o'clock. I was exhausted. I hadn't watched it. I didn't even know it was on. Or I knew it was on, but there's no late NHL games. I'm like, I'm just going to go to bed. It was, t- it was 10, 10, 15. I was like, this is great. I'm going to go upstairs. And then I got on Twitter and I, I just kind of in bed saw like, what the hell just happened? What was that real? I'm like, what is going on here? And boom, I saw it. I was like, holy shit, I cannot believe this happened. Meanwhile, my wife had fallen asleep, like putting Ryder to bed. She comes in. I'm like, look at this. So obviously we turn it on and then we're watching it. And we're watching that. One of the worst speeches I've ever seen. What did he say? I'm a vessel of love. Dude, you just slapped Chris Rock in the face in front of 200 million people. What are you talking about? You're a vessel of love. It was so what? Put some tussin on it. Remember, he says that in his act, Chris Rock's father. He used to say anytime they had a bumper or a bruise, he'd say, put some tussin on it. Yeah, I don't even know what you're yeah, talking about, you. but he's like, uh, he's like, <laughs> he's Chris like, Rock I'm protecting Ryan. these girls in the film. And it's like, what are you, buddy? Are you, it, it shows that I'm sure there's some amazing guys and girls out there who are actors. But for the most part, these are the most mentally fucking tapped people in the world. They think they're so important. They think everything they say should be gospel. They're just clowns. And Will Smith might be one of the biggest clowns of all time. That was an absolute disgrace. I can't believe they should have switched it up and not given him the award. Fuck that, dude. You just went up and embarrassed that guy. And by the way, Chris Rock, ultimate professional biz. You're right. He was so flustered after he's like we're giving out a documentary like i don't think he he's and the one thing i did notice right away he's like oh my he said something like oh i could do, do you know what i'm talking about right when it he was like screaming at him like he probably is like i have so much shit i could talk about you right oh, now god yeah that like, i could just fuck embarrass you i'm a comedian like it was just so crazy like imagine if he fought him back that would have been outstanding if oh, he just man, like attacks him angry. back or came out and just like cracked him while he was giving his terrible speech. What was he talking about on that speech? It was like Billy Madison when he's like, nothing you said has made any sense. I wish mercy on your soul. Do you know what I'm talking about? When he's like, oh, uh, uh, no would have done fine. It was, it was, I will, I will never forget kind of where I was when that went down. And yeah, for people to say it's not real, there's no chance it wasn't real. I did love Denzel's quote. That was a pretty good quote. Yeah, like, it's what true. The devil comes after after you when you're at your highest. Uh, just a, just an unreal night on Twitter because of what happened. I mean, I immediately was like, "Gee, can you make me a meme of the slap um, being me and an earring, a cross earring being the slapper?" Wow. So I like so, I like the I like the meme. Sorry, Biz of uh, Leafs and then the first round. Oh, of course you that was real original, yeah. real um, fucking original, guys. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, and then obviously the debate ensued about, oh, he's just sticking up for his wife. It's like, but you can't really, if you're yeah, not going to get mad at some other dude crushing your old lady. You can't get mad at the fucking it, the shaved head it, joke. And nobody was aware that, or obviously Chris Rock was not aware right. that she had this condition. And I will say, she looks pretty good with a shaved head. She's, like there's, <laughs> she's always had very short hair. She not seems always, like a loser, though, no? Frequently had short hair. <laughs> I don't know her. So what's crazy, <laughs> dude, is Regina Hall, one of the three hosts, hostesses, I guess, hosts, hostesses, she made a like a joke about their marriage earlier, and like Jada gave her like the point, like they laughed their asses off at that, which was arguably a more personal joke. And yeah, like Will Smith should know, okay, if he made that joke, he must not know, you know what? Hey, pull him aside after, like they know he was laughing, like Ben he, said, he laughed exactly. Yeah. And, That's and a also, tough look. and I know you just said like, oh, if Rock, Rock fought him back, but listen, man, I Chris Rock, I think he's one of the most brilliant comedians of all time. I've had the the, the honor of seeing him in co- in concert. Brilliant mind. He had like he was smart enough to know like, okay, if I go back at him, like you know, like a lot of guys may have done, you know, like now he, now he's gonna like roll around the stage with fucking Will Smith. He's going to be a gift forever. And, you know, people are going to fucking use that uh, to, you know, maybe both for the of their prejudices they might have. And Chris Rock is smart to know that. And he also like, did you see him? He was like, he bit his tongue, man. He, there's so much I just dirt. said that before. Yeah. He's so much dirt about, about like Will Smith. I should say dirt rumors, stuff about them that the, the industry knows that maybe the public doesn't. And he, like Chris Rock was smart enough to calculate in that five second spot. to like, all right, man, just button up here and, and you'll win. Cause like if he took the bait, it, it just would have gotten into this like pissing match, which yeah, would have been entertaining, but ultimately uh, I don't think that's what Chris Rock wanted. So I, way- I think in the end, like, 
if somebody ever put their hands on my wife, I'm I'm attacking them. And like, obviously, if somebody went up to her and like dropped a C bomb in her face, like, yeah, game on. But for a comedian to make a joke at an Oscars event where he's making fun of like every single person up for an award for the yeah. most part, it was just the most embarrassing thing I've ever seen on on live television. Like for 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 a celebrity to do that, it was it was crazy, crazy. Uh- and oh, I get—I mean, Amy Schumer, I know everyone's kind of sick of her, but that was a funny joke about Leo when she said, it's all, Leo DiCaprio, it's nice that he's going to keep the planet clean and green for all his... his so apparently she stole that. Stolen joke. <laughs> stolen oh, she joke. stole that one too? Yeah, she oh, stole that. Oh, what was the them. joke? I didn't hear the I end. Mean, it seems like an easy joke to make, but... What was the joke? It was. She, I just said, she said that, oh, Leo, good for him for making the earth, helping her make it, keep it green or whatever, and said for, for basically his future girlfriends, like, or his current girlfriends or whatever, basically <laughs> joking the fact he dates girls like 25 years younger. And and as crazy as it sounds, R.A. delivered her better than she did. <laughs> <laughs> That's a first. Please, I, I, I would say I, that, that, I would say that flying was, around in the private jets for the, the people keeping the earth clean is always, always a great th- – What's the word? I mean, he's Shit. being a hypocrite. Hypocrisy. Hypocritical. Because exactly. I delivered that joke cesarean section, so I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, we did mention that the boys were all down Atlanta last week. It was a special assignment. Everybody knows Atlanta doesn't even have an NHL team anymore, but they do have the TNT studios. Biz, I'm going to go to you. Why were we in Atlanta, and what the fuck is going on? Well, we got to interview Wayne Gretzky, guys. <laughs> that was. Oh, my God. All right. Did you just put my hat on? No, he just my, no, my he, just, he was eating hat. some pretzels and they got caught in his throat. <laughs> yeah, guys, we got to Still interview stuck. the great one, the the white whale. We got him uh, down for an hour, and uh, we're very excited to release it. Uh, we were actually going to incentivize our our fans by saying if we can get up to two hundred and fifty k on YouTube, that we're going to drop the the interview early. So we're really excited. Uh, it was amazing. It was everything we expected and more. Uh, it was kind of one of those situations where we just put a quarter in him and he just talked. It was amazing. It was probably the easiest interview we've ever done. All we had to do is tee him up for everything, and he would just take it for five minutes. And I think that he debunked about six things that that I thought were maybe different than the way that they that they originally were said to have transpired. So we're pumped, guys. Uh, we might seem a little bit tired and, and not as quick-witted today because it was a very uh, long week. We got a bunch of other interviews as well. We sat down with Rick Tockett, uh, who's been a, another mentor to me with the with the crew. Uh, we tried to get Anson Carter, uh, but he was out of town. He's been doing the, the Islanders broadcast, so he's been flying up to NYC and stuff like that. So uh, we're pumped. Uh, I don't know how you guys felt about it. Uh, Grinelli's now best friends with him. I think he ended up in his room after the next night because I had the next the, the Wednesday broadcast off, and then I was not staying at the hotel. But I guess you guys came back, and then the kids were there. Uh, and and we got to thank also Trev and Ty, who were ones who really pushed for us to get it. His his kids. So uh, Trevor was one of the guys who played net for us at, at the the ball hockey tournament. And I used to hang out with those guys who were there in college at ASU. So I've actually known them longer than I have Wayne. And thank you for them for for trusting us and allowing us to sit down with Wayne, especially given the fact that you know we're just a, a rinky dig podcast, and this is the greatest hockey player to ever live. Uh, we also did a deep dive, uh, Rick Tockett and I, into why he blocked RA on Twitter. So I think we might have to discuss that when we have Tockett on, but I think there might have been some deleted tweets from RA that Rick Tockett what? wasn't too happy about. Whoa. You're a tweet deleter, RA? So am I. Not much. I mean, I, I have... actually deleted one recently, I... but it was the first time in a long, long time. I... Not, I mean, for the, however many tweets I've had with, I mean, it's less than zero, 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 one percent. Um, we, I mean, we could look it up, G. I mean, we could pull up the history and if there's a blank thing there. But I honestly don't think I said anything offensive to him. I remember asking him about, you know, rumors that of him hitting a former teammate, and he it was there like, was a bit of back and forth. Ra, he was like, a, oh, okay, fuck you, buddy. It was. Nah, it why was do intense. you have the images of the whole conversation on I mean, Twitter? You can do a shirt. I'm too, I'll pull I mean, it up and send it to the group. Yeah, because okay, when I saw cool. I was blocked, I was like, what, what am I blocked for? And like, I don't remember, like, 
that to that level. I really don't because I wouldn't mull. I don't. I'm not like he doesn't dude. hold grudges. They were acting like best yeah. friends at well, dinner until until Ra uh, chased Gretzky off. To I mean, room. can yeah. I explain that? how this went down? <laughs> oh, we got some great behind the scenes stories, guys. This yeah. was a night to remember. Do we just save this for when yeah, we Gretzky's we, oh, on? I think we should. I think we should tell this one about the 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 lobby bar at the Four Seasons. And how R.A. na 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 na. I'll say this. R.A.'s, I guess, a man of his word and a man who doesn't back down no matter who he's talking to. But the way I saw this go down is something I will never forget. We had a hell of an interview with with the great one, just like Biz mentioned. And then after he's like, guys, you're going to come downstairs. We can have some dinner, have some drinks, like stories. You're just like, this is a dream come true. It's like fantasy camp. We don't have to pay for the fantasy camp. <laughs> and um, so we then we did talk it, and then we all went down. Talk's buddy was in town as well. And then we had Ty, Trevor, the great one, and ourselves. Avery was with us and Sean, our cameraman. So it's a blast. And Wayne's telling all these different stories. Talk, it's telling stories. We had a big table going on. And all right, like all of us, I'm not chirping you, caught a buzz and a half. <laughs> But but this time, all right, we were all kind of celebrating. So it's all yeah, good. Yeah, I think we all had a buzz and a half going on. But okay. Yeah, okay, you had a buzz and three RA's buzz, RA, When RA's buzzing, it's a little different. It's a little different. But but you know what? It was all good. And RA went over and talked to Gretzky. And they're talking for a while. Ty's sitting there for a bit. Trevor's sitting there for a bit. I went over and joined in. Talk had gone. It was basically kind of like a musical chairs. But RA and, and the great one were next to each other he for quite a while. He had him in a headlock. He had, had him in a head. verbal nah, headlock. He, he had you, in a verb, you had him in a verbal headlock. It's a good thing. I did two at one point. It was a conversation. Well, I go to the other end of the table, and I'm talking to Avery, just shitting on the, the Rangers, who might freaking win the cup. So what am I talking about? We're just, we're just giving each other shit back and forth. And I just see the great one stand up, put his drink down. All right, boys. Good night. Great time. I'm like, geez, that was kind of an abrupt ending. What's... What's what happened? It's pretty early, too. I think somebody might have said to, 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 to Gretzky, hey, it's, wait, it's a little early tonight, bud. He said, I'm, I'm going to head to sleep. Well, it turns out I said, R.A., what just happened? Why did, why did he leave? R.A. decided to ask Wayne Gretzky. I believe he has close <laughs> to 1,900 assists. Do you think Adam Oates was a better passer than you? <laughs> okay, guys. Thanks for having me on the interview. I'll see you later. Good talk. I couldn't believe what I heard. He asked the greatest <laughs> assistant in the history of sports if there was another man that was a better passer. He's than got him. more assists than the next guy has points, and 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 doubled, then tripled. Talkett was in shock at the other Talkett end goes, of the what? table. I think Talkett was not. Talkett was going to walk over like Will Smith at one point, and we had to fucking <laughs> calm him down. No, talk goes. We're trying to have Ari explain the take, and Ari's like, I've long said Adam Oates is the greatest pass I've ever seen, you fucking knuckleheads. And then talk goes, Ari, who would you rather have as your center? Ari's like, <laughs> uh, Oatsy. And we all just said, fuck, this is a no win. It's an agree to disagree. But Ari, after verbally headlocking the greatest maybe athlete in the history of sports, Asked if there was a better passer than him. Just an amazing moment in the history of our show. So all you fucking Bruins fans, fuck off paying Marshaw speeding tickets or parking tickets. You should be paying RAs, even though he doesn't have a car. <laughs> Dude, Ozzy was here for a cup, not a cup of coffee, not that long. And like you said, I'm a man of my word. It's it's a statement I've made on this show um, plenty of times. I've said it in public and. No one's ever like laugh like <laughs> dummy like Gretzky has. I can understand why he, he up and left. Incorrect, like, incorrect. The first time I don't know if it was on this show or us hanging on your coach. The first time you ever said to this to me, I almost had a heart attack, and then I needed to put on business hat from Aspen to calm me down. <laughs> All right, so so where would you put Adam Oates in the greatest passes in NHL history? Like a uh, uh, full. I don't I don't full. care. Just not ahead of Gretzky. <laughs> I I don't even have an answer for uh, you. Okay. All right. So if he's number but, two uh, or three, I what else? But, it, it, was, right, it was hilarious. But, it, was but hilarious. it created an unreal moment. Oh, it was. It isn't. It isn't his his Wayne's recollection of these stories and how Good. he tells them is second to none. I would no wonder these fucking people pay to go to these fantasy camps. I might, I should be paying to be on the TNT broadcast for crying out loud. And what a, one thing I want to mention guys. And I, and I said it right before the interview starts. And I think that we don't want to give too much more away and we can move on. And then we'll drop it when we get 250 K YouTube subscribers is 
I don't get the opportunity with TNT if not for you guys starting the podcast and bringing me on. And like, it's, it's kind of came full circle. So obviously a, a massive thank you to you guys and also our fans, guys, like the, the more people that listen, obviously people catch wind of, okay, yeah, I'll do that podcast. And I know I joked earlier about being a rinky dink podcast, but uh, you know, the fans ultimately have, have made it what it is. And, and we love you guys and we thank you. And, you know, all we try to do is, is continue to work hard in order to provide you guys more, uh, you know, more fun things to do while you're either at work at the gym uh, in your spare time. And, and uh, we all, I think we all share in the love of the game and, and we were very, very fortunate to get the greatest player to ever play. Come on. So I uh, can't wait for you guys to listen uh, as well as we mentioned, we got talk, uh, we got, should we say some of the other ones or no? Should well, we leave it at that. No, I mean, if we already said Gretzky, we can say we had Jeremy Roenick. We already dropped Cam Jansen. Um, yeah, Jordan JR, Mott- it was fun to, you know, it's been quite a while and um, yeah. some stuff went down after his last interview. We mm-hmm. we finally kind of discussed all that. So that was a great interview. Got into what JR has been up to. Um, we Jordan also Mott- talked. Jordan Mott- Mott- we oh, talked and then and, and Milan Hayduk, who we're dropping yep. today. With Alone. Adrian Kempe, we did both those guys. So we got a former and a current player. Hey, Duke, an amazing career with the Avalanche. So it was a great trip. Obviously, getting Gretzky was um was the top-notch thing. And hopefully someday I meet Tiger and I can ask him if uh, Phil's a better putter than he is. But <laughs> other than that, it was phenomenal. Hey, I, who who had a better record with Denny's wager system? <laughs> oh, Honestly, Phil might. Phil, the scumbag Phil with all the secrets he's got, who knows? Yeah, boy, boy, just to cap it, biz, I haven't had a pinch yourself moment in a long time, but like sitting there after dinner with, with, with Wayno and just, you know, I know when people are like, all right, rolling their eyes, get away from me. And I know, you know, when it's conversational, like we were just rapping and then, you know, we'd come by, you come by, just shooting the shit, picking his brain. It was like, holy fuck, man. Like, uh, like, I can't believe this is going on right now. And I was so beat the next night. I was pissed. I, I, I know those guys were getting off at 1.30 and having a few pops after. I was dog tired. I couldn't make it. And I know G hung out in the room with them for several hours, had a little hot stove with, with Wayne Gretzky. So that's awesome for G to, to get to have that moment. And just to back again what you said, to uh, shout out to Ty and Trevor, especially Trev. I was out with Vegas with him. That's when, you know, he kind of threw the idea then, like, why don't you have – Gretz on. I love how they call his dad, 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 Gretz. That's yeah, the that's fucking awesome. funniest thing in the world. And I was like, Gee, you fucking serious? He's like, yeah, dude, if you guys come to Atlanta, he'll, he'll do it. I was like, let's fucking go. And then biz, you had the squeeze on your end. And it was like, it, it, it's, you know, it, I know captain Ahab only had one white whale and we have a few of them. So it was nice to get one. And it was a, it was an honor to talk to Wayne. And even if I did chase him out of there, uh, one other announcement too. I know we, we haven't even got to the hockey yet. Toronto, uh, Big deal going on in Toronto. Boston is expanding in Penn, expanding our gambling reach into Ontario. The school hole home opener is coming to rendezvous in Toronto, uh, Saturday, April 2nd through the 4th. It's going to be absolutely electric. The Sam Roberts band is going to be there Saturday night games leading up to the big day, April 4th, when betting becomes legal, the score, um, gee, what's the, uh, the, it's the score dot bet. Uh, slash Ontario. That is that the correct address? Yup, it's the Score Bet app as well. Download the Score Bet app and pre-register there. Boys, this uh, boys and girls, this is huge for us. Obviously, we have the EBR crew. We have Mister Ice. Finally, in Ontario, it's going to be legalized gambling online, and we figure what better way to launch it. I'm coming back uh, to Canada. We're going to be doing that April fourth viewing party of the Toronto Maple Leafs against the Lightning. They're going to mop the fucking floor of them. I'm going to be wearing my my Drew jersey, just like I got on right now. Thank you to the Leafs for sending me that. And no, I will not sign a contract to come play for playoffs. My body's a little too banged up. It's going to be a great weekend. You mentioned Sam Roberts, a huge Canadian band. It's going to be going all weekend long. And G is going to hit you with more information right now. Uh, we have a really cool giveaway that we're doing and yada, 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 G. Yeah, it's free to attend. Uh, but the easiest way to get more info is to pre-register for the Score Bet app. If you're 19 plus and a resident on a resident in Ontario, the don't link even is need in to a- put money in. G, correct? You don't need to put any money. Just in. Just register, guys. Just register. And if you register, you also get an awesome shirt that we've posted on our social media. It's this really cool cartoon drawing of all the guys, EBR, Mister Ice. So pre-register right now. The Score Bet. Yeah, you and there's another me on that picture. What I do you mean? My legs look crossed. Like... I look like an absolute joke of a person. But either way, it's a great shirt. Oh, okay. It is a pretty cool shirt. So I, uh, what's it been, G? Two years since the Chicklets crew has been in Canada, right? It, it has. Like, it's been a pandemic. long time. So it's it's a long time coming, and we can't wait to get back to Canada when and start we doing there? more stuff. 
Uh, Muskoka, uh, the Muskoka. Muskoka tournament. Dude, Muskoka. that felt like 200 years ago. <laughs> Not two That's years. That's when we got Brian Burke. We had Elliot Friedman on live inside the hotel room, and then we oh, ended yeah. up going up to Muskoka afterwards. So, guys, I'm coming home. I'm pumped. I'm going to see all my friends in Ontario. Come join us. Come grab some pops, and we're going to gamble on some Leafs games. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to get to the hockey in one sec, but you, you know what? All right, everybody. The dog days of the season are here. Trade deadline has come and gone. If your team is already done, so then toast their season with some of that fine pink Whitney. And if they're playoff bound, then have a little celly for that. So head over to your lo- favorite local water and hole to enjoy a chilled shot or a nice pink Whitney in club soda. Either way, enjoy our five times distilled vodka infused with fresh pink lemonade flavor. You boys have a little Pink Whitney and Wheeling, I'm guessing, Biz. You boys uh, have oh, a good time down there. Oh, my goodness. We had, we had the Pink Whitney zone. Uh, much like there, we're going to be pouring it down your throats in Toronto when we're there in uh, in April 4th for the Leafs game. So come join us. Shout out to Pink Whitney. They've uh, they've done a ton for us, and, and we're, we're really enjoying the whole partnership. It's really taken off, and I don't know why the fuck I just rambled on like that. Let's get on to talking about hockey. Yep. Uh, I mentioned the Sonk trade in the intro in uh, Vegas. They thought they traded forward uh, of Genny Dadnoff and a second rounder to Anaheim for John Moore in Ryan Kessler's contract just before the deadline. But the trade was eventually nullified because it turns out Anaheim was on his no trade list. Uh, Vegas acquired him uh, back last summer from Ottawa. And per Pia Lebrun, uh, Vegas claims that the Senators back on the trade call in July said that uh, Dadnoff or Dadnoff hadn't submitted a trade list by the deadline. But it turns out his reps didn't fact file a, a list before the deadline. There was a paper trail for it. Uh, so the trade was nullified. And P.L. LeBron also said that a no trade list is submitted solely between a player agent and the club. The league and the NHLPA do not keep track of a no trade list, which I don't know. It seems kind of like there should be a better system in place. So it sounds like Ottawa basically gave Vegas shitty intel, which they leaned on when they tried to trade him. Uh, a deal would have, that would have taken $3.375 million off of Vegas' books. Uh, but there's not going to be any punishment for Ottawa. I mean, it seems like they basically didn't do their paperwork or their homework. Nobody's coming out and saying that. Vegas obviously was looking to dump salary to make room for Alex Martinez and or Mark Stone. Uh, Pierre Lebrun does think the NHL is going to push for a change with that this week when the GMs meet. They should have a little bit of a more, you know, I guess something between the players, the union, the players association, rather the agents and the team so that everybody gets a copy and people know what's going on. Um, the guy who probably suffered the most out of this other than the dawn off is Ryan Kessler. Uh, instead of getting traded to Vegas or his contract, it's going to cost him another 150 grand in taxes biz. I figured you might want to know that, Dale. I mean, and he's he, made so much, he probably doesn't give yeah, a shit. That's like ashtray money to him. I also saw his Instagram. He's on vacation somewhere, and uh, he's holding what looks to be a 50-inch fish. I wrote him. I go, Jesus Christ, dude. He goes, this is a record fish. Like, check. I don't know if the story will still be up tomorrow or Tuesday when you guys are listening, but he's living He's living right. Yeah, well, in the NHLPA, they weren't happy what happened because the Donoff did nothing wrong, and he had to wait. He missed games, crucial games, too. He's been one of Vegas' hottest players, and he can't play because other people screwed up. So the NHL, you know, or, or the Ottawa, whoever, uh, this is a mess that should be, that should be fixed. So this doesn't happen again, man. A guy puts a team on his no trade list, and a team t- tries to trade him two trades later. It's kind of fucked up. Anything like this? Have no, you guys- it's, it's just a classic case of something happening where – they had a shitty system in place, much like in the NFL when something happens and they're like, oh, there's no rule for this. Well, somebody's got to get fucked out of the whole thing. Um, surprised it wasn't Ottawa who ends up getting any type of punishment. Not saying that they should, but if you're trading a guy with who, who submitted an, a no trade list to, to 10 teams, you should be forwarding that on. Uh, I mean, that's bad bookkeeping. Um it sucks for Vegas because they missed a guy for two games, but in the same breath, it's like, well, they were trying to get rid of him. And they've kind of been fucked with the cap situation with all these crazy moves they continually make. And now all of a sudden, sometimes the best moves are the ones that you don't make where this guy has came back and, I mean, single-handedly kind of helped their season keep going because they don't have any room for error at this point. If they would have lost that game to the Hawks in which they are down 3 nothing, I mean, they're, like I said, they got, Dallas has four games in hand right now and I think Vegas is one point ahead of them. So, I I have been adamant that I I think that Dallas is somewhat of a boring team to watch. And I know their fans are going to be pissed at me saying that. Every time I watch them play, I'm kind of like, eh, I'm not that excited. 
Is has Vegas been the most entertaining team this year? No, but if they get healthy, they're going to be fucking entertaining as hell. And it's kind of a cool story. And then of course, with their crowd and, and the drama of Jack Eichel being in the mix, I don't know if you Sabres fans are going to be telling me I'm tugging him off like the Kawasabi had to have on, but this, this is a, a huge moment for them, a great comeback. And I'm really happy for the guy. And as Pete DeBoer said, like really sometimes in this game, your character is going to be tested and he handled everything like a true professional he didn't pout. He just came back in, got back right to the way that he he left off before it all happened, working his balls off. And it's just fitting that, you know, he's been lighting the lamp and really carrying the load offensively for them. Yeah. Um, it really goes to show that there needs to be a change. And the, 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 the whole issue with no, no trade lists or the, you know, the, the teams that you put on your no trade list is it's never been made public. So it's only been made public to with the player, his agent, and then the, the staff of the team that he's signing the contract with. And the reason it's never gone further than that is because a lot of players and agents alike, they don't want those lists to get out because there's, there's the the chance where there's some fan bases that find out this guy doesn't want to go here. It just can create headaches that are kind of unnecessary where players would rather keep those lists private. But after this, and Pierre Lebrun wrote a pretty good article about this explaining like they, they have to change it. There has to be a, a like central register, is it central registry RA that, that that they decide if all the trades go go through? Like they fucked up here. So they never they they never mess up, right? And they got a million things going on trade deadline day. But they were the ones that finally okayed this trade. So it's a little bit on them as well. But there needs to be something in place where not only is there one spot, not not for the public to see, but for the entire league to see a player's no trade list. And it also needs to be created a time where everyone produces their list the same day or by the same day. Whereas right now it's like totally different. It's up to the team and the player when they have to give the list in July 1st. Is it, is it March 1st before the deadline? So they really need to kind of figure out a way that this won't happen again. Um, the same way they're talking about maybe getting the salary cap into the Stanley Cup playoffs and calling it like the Kucherov rule, like this could be the Dadnov rule or the Dadonov rule and, and, and just kind of finally make it, well aware to every team who's on which players no trade list when it kicks in when it doesn't doesn't count because b- before if you had a no tr- like I had a no trade uh, list on my final three years of the six year deal I signed in Pittsburgh so they could do anything before those three years but then if I were to be traded it canceled out it was gone like, oh wow interesting yeah and now since the lockout of what was it oh was it 14, whatever, oh, what, oh, four, 13, oh, 12, oh, the 13 lock. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that, that, that now actually you don't lose the no trade list if you were to be traded. Interesting. Um, so it's right. kind of changed a little bit, but there needs to be some sort of like organization to this. So, and, and you guys were right in saying the dawn off. I mean, that sucks. You, you, you're with a team you enjoy playing for. You agreed to be traded there and you have to go through kind of the embarrassment and, and he, and he just didn't shrug. He didn't whine or complain. He just showed up and he's been their best player. So, and quickly about Vegas, they have 14 games left. If they don't win games. at least, at least 11 of them, I, I don't think they can get in. Um, I was, yeah, I was and, say and interesting about what you said about Dallas, the eight teams in the East have been pretty much set for, I don't know, three months. It's kind of been crazy how Training the camp. eight and eight in the Eastern conference are that different in terms of, good teams and bad teams. The West, Winnipeg has a very slight chance, but I I think it's really Dallas that could probably sneak in. Right now, the wildcard teams are currently St. Louis and Vegas. Dallas is the only team fighting for a playoff spot right now in the entire league that has a minus goal differential in the year. So it it is, I mean, they're not exciting. I'm with you, Biz. I actually think that they could cause problems if they were to get in. (laughs) They're not the easiest team to play play against. And and what's his name's playing unreal and net there right now? Uh, Wedgwood. Ottinger. Oh, Wedgwood got traded over from the Coyotes. Yeah, Wedgwood got traded over. He's been playing great because Hope he's on long term IR. So yeah, it was it was a brutal scenario for Dodonov, but he bounced back like a true professional. So you, you kind of brought up another point with you said fan bases might get riled up and maybe it would you know create maybe some insults or, or um, animosity, maybe even more so 
other teams and GMs hearing that they didn't want to come there. Yeah, or fuck when this that, guy. Yeah, when that contract runs out, it really cock blocks him as far as teams maybe being like, well, he didn't want to be here to begin with, and now that he's got no options, no, screw this guy. So maybe that's a reason that it was originally handled the way it was. So it probably has to go to some to- type of arbitrator where it you know compiles where still those other teams are not going to find out who the teams are, but yet it is in the league database. I did get a um, a huge kick out of uh, his pregame announcement of his name. Uh, Vegas's arena went wild when they announced him. The place went crazy. And I, I actually, I go to the Starbucks nearby and on Mondays from like three to five. I just kind of get on the computer, do some research, get dialed in for the show. And I was, I was laughing out loud because I was like, if I got traded from Pittsburgh to Anaheim, and two days later, that fucking thing got reversed. <laughs> and I then got announced at Mellon Arena. The crowd would have booed as loud as they've ever booed for anything in their lives. <laughs> it would have been like that girl when Trump got elected, like on the ground, like, nah! <laughs> and meanwhile, the Donoff gets this insane, like, ovation from the crowd. I was happy for him. But I was laughing, thinking about how happy people were that Kunitz was coming and I was going. And if you had to reverse it on him, I might I had to jump over a car myself that night. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm guessing you didn't get a video tribute at all either in Pittsburgh or in Anaheim when that when wasn't really played. a thing when he got dealt. Yeah, I don't think they, yeah, I was wondering that. No, they, it was for legends. Middle fingers. Or it was for legends. Yeah. I've told you that the the whole video tribute thing is completely jumped the shark. Everyone yeah. gets yeah. one. Everyone and their mothers get one now. I'll sure get them. I went back, back to Pittsburgh as an Anaheim duck. And I was like minus three in the first period, and we got worked by him. And then when I went back to Anaheim as an Edmonton Oiler, it was the last game of the year. I think we actually won, and I scored. And then that night, I didn't go back to Edmonton because all my stuff was still in Anaheim. So I went to Sharkies and met all the boys because the Ducks didn't make the playoffs, and we certainly didn't make the playoffs in, in, in Edmonton. So I went to Sharkies, and then I was getting all my stuff from my apartment and just kind of heading home a couple days later. And I remember Jason Blake came up. He's like, oh, that sucks. You got traded to the worst team. They suck. I'm like, get away from me right now, dude. It's brutal. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, yeah, Jesse Granger, uh, who covers Vegas for the Athletic, stopped by uh, the Chickens Cup in Vegas. Yeah, great guy. He said it was one of le- legit one of the loudest – ovations he heard not just like a nice cheer like legit one of the loudest and he got a, he's a heck uh, of a player like he was in, in ottawa yeah i mean flar everywhere he's been he's like scored goals he's he's produced he's one of these guys who gets bounced around a lot but a goal and two assist in that six to one win the first game after the non-trade biz and then of course you get the overtime game winner in chicago like you mentioned down three nothing going into the third five points in the two games since 32 points in 64 games Tied for second in goals. And also, Vegas was 0-57 when trailing by three-plus goals in the third period. Uh, they were in their fourth game in six days. I mean, you don't know if it's going to be a galvanizing win fun because, you know, what? They're, they're, they're kind of behind the eight ball right now. They need wins. Dallas has games in hand. So, uh, we got a hell of a race out, back, out in the West. And also, we got to give a shout-out to Pete DeBoer, who did coach his 1,000th NHL game. Uh, got a win over Nashville, the 30th coach to do so. And also, uh, uh, we want to send our best wishes out to Vegas' uh, Brett Howden. He's going to be out for a little while. Got stretched off the ice after an unfortunate hit. Looked like he was going down. And Philippe Forsberg went in. Looked like he may have already been committed to the hit. I don't think it was dirty at all. It was just kind of shit timing type thing. And, you know, it's always shitty to see a guy down like that and stretch it off. But uh, he's he was fine. No major injuries. He's going to be banged up for a bit. So, uh, nice to see he's going to be all right. But uh, either way... We, there were a lot of guys, Biz, who did get traded and had some significant impacts on what happened with their teams. Obviously, Mark andre Fleury was the big name. Uh, he didn't start right away, but he did get his first start, let's see, Saturday versus Columbus. Stopped 23 out of 25 shots with his first game with the Wild. Uh, pretty cool moment after he was named the, the game's third star, and uh, somebody threw a bouquet of flowers on the ice, and he ran over, scooped them up. Uh, good stuff so far with uh, with Mark andre As I know you mentioned that article uh, Michael Russo did about how how basically everybody in the Minnesota room was over the moon. Yeah. Uh, Kevin Fiala was fanboy and said, quote, he's my favorite goalie of all time. I wanted to be a goalie because of him when I was younger. Uh, looking at him now, he's in our locker room. It's just not realistic. I don't think I slept a minute because I couldn't wait to see Flurry in our locker room. That's a rare quote to hear from a, from a modern NHL. Very rare. And I mean, just, just seeing all the videos and the excitement around that organization and where I think you've harped on it a few times, like, 
they've waited a long time to be relevant. You know, last year they had a pretty good run, but you know, you didn't really have that sense that they were primed and ready to go the distance. Now this year with the moves that they've made at the deadline, but I tune into every single one of their home games just to see the crowd. And for a portion of it, they'll be standing up. And it was cool that in flowers game, they ended up tying it up late. I believe it was Kaprizov. He's got 35 tucks on the season. Everything is advertised and earning that fucking big payday that he got. Then they win it in overtime for him. But one of the things that talk it mentioned um, when it all went down and I'm sure Billy G had a lot to do with it and saying, Hey man, like, you know, come here, you know, I know maybe you were hesitant to, to maybe move and you don't want to move your family. And, you know, you've been through the whirlwind the last couple of seasons with what you've dealt with, like off ice emotionally, but all of a sudden now, you know, would that potentially mess with, with Cam Talbot, that would be a question that some people would have. And maybe Cam Talbot would be pissed. Cause he's like, Hey, I'm, I'm the number one goalie here, but talk. It's like, no, man, you need that healthy competition from within to push each other. Um, and you've seen it right off the hop. Look at how well Cam Talbot's been playing. He played unbelievable against the abs in their last game in which they were getting peppered early on. And that game was nothing, nothing for a while. So really cool goalie dynamic. They probably have one of the best, if not the best tandem in the league, definitely top five. Um, you know, they got Dumba back off the IR Spurgeon's playing well after his injury. Now, I think he was the one who ended up getting that overtime winner in that, that game that flower played. And Delore, Delore immediately making his impact. So not even just flower, just the energy that this team has. It is so excited. I'm excited for them. I know I said that they're kind of my dark horse. Um, Sleeper, not, I think you said. They were your sixth team. <laughs> I, listen, I'm not, I'm not a fanboy of the Minnesota Wild. I'm happy with what their fans are getting to experience, given the fact that they've had to watch a boring team for as long as they had they are very very exciting to watch they have that bruiser line they got the high flying offense they got the great connection between zuccarello the fiala has been playing unbelievable so just overall the the elevation that these trades including flower being number one that have provided them is it, it's just it's great for the game it's it's awesome for the game and i'm fucking probably just as excited as fiala is in the fact that they got them all very well said uh, I, I, this team is dangerous. They they got 18 games left. They could easily win 50 games. They got 40 wins right now. It's it's a it's it's a very deep, big, strong, difficult to play against team. And I do love the fact that Talbot has stepped up his game big time because you know what? He got challenged a little bit, and he also uh, I saw him on NHL Now, uh, the show on NHL Network here in the states, and he was mentioning how Flurry's been his favorite goalie kind of his whole career. So I think it was it was probably a little wake up call for him as well as being super excite exciting to to get to meet not an idol but a guy you certainly have always respected immensely i uh we had the opportunity to interview him on the tnt broadcast and uh we were joking around about i, I asked him what is uh, how, how does he get his teeth so white he said brush him but i think he's got nice fake jibs but one thing i interrupted him on is because talk had asked him about the pranks when i was in wilkes bear flower was not even at the bar this night i just gotten a brand new f-150 pickup truck and I came out of uh, Arena Bar and Grill, and this thing was covered in shaving cream and toilet paper and paper towels. This fucker didn't even go to the bar, and he had the balls to show up and, and prank me. So he is the ultimate prankster of this. You don't see a lot of that type of stuff going on. We've had, we had Shane Doan on at one point talking about when Brad May had the new BMW 5 Series where they rolled back the, the, the sunroof, and they filled it up with the Arena popcorn. And he had a buttery new, popcorn, the buttery popcorn, like sh putting guys, putting guys cars up on blocks. Like he is, he is like an old school prankster and talk, asked him if he'd gotten anybody on the team yet. And he's like, no, nah, no, nah, it's still early. It's like talk. He's been there for fucking three days. Like, he, uh, he, yeah, he walked in the room and like shook a guy's <laughs> hand. He had like the buzzer in his palm. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> he's all those guys who are excited and thrilled to meet him. Just wait, just wait a couple weeks. But but I was able to ask him too. I asked him about the pearly whites, and then I said, "Hey, rumor has it that Washington was making a strong push." And he said, "Nah, it just it just didn't feel right with all those battles that they had with the Penguins. I just I just couldn't do it." Which that's pretty fair, man. And the fact that they could end up meeting this year because you know, well, not not according to me. I, I know I'm pissing off the Washington Capitals fan base, and I'm trying to stir the pot a little bit, but we'll get to that later. 
Yeah, he said it, it just didn't seem right is what he said, Biz. And and uh, what, to go back to Cam Talbot, he's won his last eight starts. He got hot before uh, Mark andre came in. He stopped 139 of his last 146 shots. That's a 9.52 save percentage. So it looked like he got a kick in the pants before the trade deadline. And, you know, Mark andre they're obviously, a, 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 I don't know if he's a 1A or whatever you want to call him, but they got a hell of a combo right now. And, Biz, you just said about D.C. Well, if he did go to D.C., I'm sure that T.J. Oshie would have hooked him up with some fresh – War Road hockey threads like I'm wearing right now. War Road Original Hockey Company is the premium active wear company founded by the Stanley Cup champion TJ Oshie, a guest of the show and a spit and chicklets favorite. They've got training shirts, shorts, joggers, polos, and more. Plus, it's not just on ice gear. Like I said, I'm wearing my sweet jacket. Try to show the, the War Road logo right there if I can pull it out. All right, I'm sorry. I got to quickly jump in here because I have not taken off. This merch that the Osh Dog sent us. War Road gear. The joggers are some of the most comfortable pants I've ever worn in my life. They're amazing. The t-shirt's great. You can work out in it. You can wear it out and about. The hoodies are awesome. They got the zip downs. And what I've probably worn most, now that the weather's changing, it'll change, but is this winter jacket. It's unreal. It's puffy. It's comfortable. It looks good. It's got the hood that you can take off. You can zip it off. You can leave it on. He's done such a good job. Biz, I know he's also helping out you hockey players in War Road with this company. Yeah, part of the proceeds of the clothing brand do go to provide ice time for kids in that town. And like you said, man, I've been wearing around all Atlanta, the very soft cotton T-shirts. Uh, definitely, definitely you could work out in them. Um, but yeah, I've, I'm, I've been very impressed. I, I didn't get the jacket, though, so I might have to fucking hit up the Oshie dog and get my. I got the jacket, jacket as well, Biz. It's unbelievable. 20 degrees here in New York City today. Wore that jacket out when I took my dog for a walk. Wasn't cold at all. It's Maybe he's pissed the way I've been talking about the cap. So I, I yeah, that's it. You took a couple. She took a couple shots at his team, and, well, and he's I'll like, tell you what, if the D was as strong as the seams. On this merchandise, maybe they'd have a fucking chance of getting past the first round. No offense to the Osh dog. Now, R.A., finish up that ad read. Go to warroad.com slash SC to get a free gift with your order. That's W-A-R-R-O-A-D dot com slash SC. Mark Andre, not the only guy to make an impact right away with his new team, uh, Claude Giroux. He had two assists in each of his first two games of Florida. Uh, also, that first game with Florida, Ben Sherratt and Robert Hag got on the board as well. So, immediate payback for Florida on that trade. We'll see what happens with them going forward. Uh, quick little stat on Giroux, too. Uh, the only players with more points than him since his first full season 13 years ago, uh, Kane, Crosby, Ovechkin, Stamkos, and Tavares. So, you know, Giroux's been getting it done for a long time. Philly stunk for the last couple of years, so maybe he got lost in the shuffle. But uh, just a reminder how good a player he is. Uh, also, Dallas goalie Scott Wedgwood had 44 saves on 47 shots, stopped all three shootout attempts in a huge 4-3 to three Dallas win over the Canes the other day. Uh, what's his name? Braden Hope, he's been placed on long-term injury reserve. Wedgwood, actually a pretty significant deal for Dallas. Biz, does he remind you of anybody or what? Well, no, I was just going to say um, he was he was great in Arizona. I mean, you know, it's, it's tough to really judge when you're getting peppered and shot. Some nights you have your good nights, and then some nights you get lit up for fucking six or seven. But, uh, you know, kind of reminds me when, when Kudobin ended up having to step in for Dallas during that run and, and the, the amount of magic that he created for, for a team that wasn't really expected to go far. So I know I was critical of them playing a little bit boring, but, you know, even – you know, even when they made that run, they weren't the most high flying offense. They were just winning games by playing good structure and, and, and just really had great team chemistry with great goaltending. So smart move by them and, and looking really good at this point. And it, it does look that look as if though they are going to get that eight seed. Only problem is though, is as Daryl Sutter said, it's going to last eight days long. <laughs> Uh, that quote was beautiful. Uh, another guy who made an immediate impact, uh, Bruins defenseman Hampus Lindholm. He got an assist in his first game, played over 23 minutes, four shots on goal, and a 3-2 win over Tampa Bay. Um, the Brad Marchand quote was hilarious about him. He said his first impressive Lindholm, quote, what a good-looking guy. Man, he's got it all like an Arnold Schwarzenegger-type figure. So, I don't know. Guy's got a, like, apparently a man rocket as well. Uh, in that game, Pasta, he got his 12th hat trick, tied for third in Bruins history uh, after Phyllis Bezito and Cam Neely. His 44th multi goal game since entering the league. Only Ovechkin and Austin Matthews have more on that time frame. Uh, let's see, Patrice Bergeron, he missed his fourth game with an elbow infection. He needed a little bit of surgery. Uh, again, at the same time, you know, you, you can afford to put him on the bench right now. The Bees are kind of in this sort of playoff spot. Not, a, going not a bad thing at all. No, get, his, not, get no. his legs some rest. As long as he's able to get his reps back, I'd say eight to ten games before playoffs. Um, 
holy shit, you guys got to be impressed with their second line center right now. You guys didn't see that coming out of nowhere. Yeah, Eric Hall, definitely not. Uh, he's been playing at a level uh, above what we expect. I mean, it's not a bad thing to be a bottom six guy. I penciled in for that, but he's been putting points on the board like crazy, and, you know, he looks like a legit threat right now. Um, this team, been, like we say, they might not be a contender, but they're a team that people do not want to play, uh, especially if they hopped up on Mach- Machi Munch, <laughs> Brad Marchand's new cereal that he dropped the other day. I guess it's like a cinnamon toast crunch type of thing. Uh, pretty funny. What other kind of uh, endorsements biz have you laughed at over the years with players? I mean, I'm, I did laugh at Sagan coming out with the cologne and he had you know, the, <laughs> the tarp off photo shoot. Um, somebody, I think it was you, G, you told me about Blake Coleman having a pickle juice. He, he does was drinking yes. pickle juice in, during games, I remember. Now that Dry Sidles kind of pigeon tossed me on the cologne and the fact that. Um, he calls you Wizenet. Yeah, that too. And, and that Sagan's already done it. I, I'd be willing to collab with Taylor Hall and a lip gloss. I think that would be a, that would be a good one. Maybe I was like talking a, to Halls the other day. I maybe get a over Burt's Bees catch up. A uh, Burt's uh, Bees type thing. Make those big old lips look nice and shiny for him. What What do you uh, got, G? Blake Coleman's pickle juice is called P twenty. Oh, real original. Like, oh, sick. Um, no, uh, what's that? Uh, like, help awesome. it, they say it helps with dehydration, but like, isn't like it's just brine, like salty water that dehydrates you? I never, I never got that with pickle. No, I think you need you, you're, you're you're sweating a lot of that sodium out and, and all those electrolytes, and maybe that pickles provide a lot of natural ones. I don't know what other like vitamins and nutrients that it would have that would help you. Does it say? Yeah, the okay. NHLPA yeah. says right here, some studies have shown that drinking pickle juice stops muscle cramps more quickly than drinking water. The vinegar found in pickle juice triggers nerves, which sends out a signal to muscles to stop cramping. Interesting. Interesting. That's a pretty good definition. So not I actually pop, watched uh, that not first pop game. Like Ovi. I watched the first game Lindholm played. He was so good. He was one, it was one of the best games I've seen a defenseman play this year. Like, I actually asked McAvoy, too. He's like, I had no idea this guy was this good. So them paired together with Grizzly and Carlo on the other pair is a pretty sick top four. So, yeah, I don't know. It's like G, actually, the big Bruins fan who hung out with the Blues after they won the Cup, he said the Bruins have no chance this year with Halla as their second-line center. He's looked pretty good lately, though. When did I say they had no chance? You said they had no chance in the house biz rented with Halla as their second line center. Do you yeah, have any words. evidence of that? Because there's well, no, you'd have to there's find no it. way I said that. There's you'd absolutely have to find no What did you chance. say then? What did you say, G? I said they need a second line center. I didn't say they have no chance. I, well, when R.A. was one. just talking, R.A. didn't call the Bruins a contender. He said they might not be a contender. I turned my mic on. I grabbed it. And I was going to jump in and say, I think the Bruins are a contender. All right, even without their second line center that you said? Yes. Yes, absolutely. I think okay, they could go your mind. Okay, fair enough. He's played well enough to make you change your mind. But I actually agree with R.A. I think they could do some damage, but in the end, it might be tough for them to actually win the Stanley Cup this year. I also said last podcast that the Lindholm trade changes the whole trajectory of the franchise, making them a contender for years to come. Wow. I like, hey, I'm on on board with you, man. You definitely said that. (laughs) R.A., for you to say that they have no chance winning the Cup this year, I was very surprised to hear you just mention that. Wait. When? when, You you said they're not contenders. Well, I, I would say, no, I don't, I thought I said they're not a top, a top contender. No, I, I, I think they have a chance to win. I'm not, I, I think contenders are like the top three to five teams and the Bruins may be on a top three to five. Well, teams. I mean, buddy, but there's I've also still said, 15 games, 15 to 20 games well, left. It, and the way that they're going right now, they might end up winning that fucking it, division. And I've also said, Paul, that I wouldn't be surprised if any of 12 to 14 teams won the Stanley Cup this year. So yep. when I say not a contender, what I think, you know, in the traditional, like, top three to five teams since where kind of like how Minnesota's not necessarily a contender because they're the third team out West right now. You got Calgary and you got, okay. All right. I I now know what you meant, but by saying somebody's not a contender, I would take it as there's no chance they win it. Okay. Right. I I should have said a top tier, like a, you know, (laughs) top tier contender. I I, I could have said that better. Right. Yeah, exactly. They're going to, um, Paul Mary should come out with a chest waxing product. Uh, He's a hairy bastard. Me, me, or me, Giordano, and, and Getsy can do like, you know, the, the head shavings that you do in the shower, those raises you can hold in your hand. I still don't have one yet. You ever see those? So when yeah. you're in the shower, you shave your head. Is that how you enough. do yours? No. Well, yeah, not with one of those. I do it with a with tr- traditional razor, just like shave. Just it. How do you not one. cut yourself? 
Oh, I have. It's because oh. it, <laughs> that gotten, one must not stop bleeding. Yeah, for days. Well, thing, yeah, it's oh man, I've gashed myself good, but no, I, I've kind of you know practice makes not quite perfect, but I've kind of gotten the routine down where you almost hold it like a pencil, and you you know you you know where you're susceptible to get cut and stuff. But yeah, I'm still lazy though because I got a haircut last week and I still haven't shaved it yet, but. I, I do. I have figured out a routine. Listen, uh, with, uh, yeah. you did mention Giordano about the shaving, but uh, let's go to his play. Um, oh. I pulled. I pulled up a tweet here. What you got? You got it. You want to tee it up? No. Oh no! Perfect segue. Uh, the Leafs are in Boston tonight. Matter of fact, is that you brought okay, up? Okay, so yeah. there's there's two two games that I have circled. It's uh, uh, Leafs Boston that's going to be dropping tonight, and this podcast would have uh, or the game would have already been played when this podcast comes out. It is. Um, Carolina at Washington. I've been taking some heat because of what I've said about Washington. This is going to be a good test for the Washington Capitals. Hey, they got two wins in a row. I was questioning their goaltender. This uh, is Vanacek. Is that how you pronounce it? He's been, he's been playing well. I was not crazy about the fact that they didn't, weren't able to add in the goalie position at the deadline. I do think that their back end is a little bit soft. I got about 50% of Caps fans agreeing with me. The way that the Carolina is going right now, not only defensively, but the way that they're able to sustain pressure in the offensive zone, they ended up losing that game to New York the other night where they fucking had them hemmed in the entire third period because Gorgiev stood on his head. But true test, just like the Leafs had Florida at home and were able to conquer that game and show everybody, hey, we're, we're the real deal now. We got a, a competent defenseman at the deadline, Giordano. And Mrazek got, was really good, too. And mirazic has been great the last two games, and I'm really happy for him. Kind of like the, the Dadnov situation where you get pigeon-tossed and, you know, you get put on waivers and nobody picked him up, and now he's back. And, you know, sometimes, you know, it just you just need a little bit of a wake-up call. But he was definitely great um, down the stretch in that third period when the wheels fell off a little bit. But great goal support. Um, I keep pumping Bunting's tires. He had no points in that game. But all the intangibles, the little things that he does, the, 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 you know, stripping defenders, uh, you know, creating turnovers, drawing penalties in front of the net, getting to the rough areas. Um, Matthews career high, 48 tucks. I can't be harping. That was a sick on- empty netter, by the way, he was. sailed it over everyone's head. Um, I can't be harping too hard on the MVP train right now because there is a few other guys who have entered the conversation as far as MVPs for their team. I would say there's probably five to six guys who could be in consideration right now, but I, overall, I, I know, dude, they should do five finalists this year. Yeah. Want to know but- mine? Before, before, let's finish the Leafs quickly. Uh, Giordano, though, so far in his three games, has looked rock solid, uh, you know, helping out offensively. He hasn't got a lot of ozone starts, but just very solid. He did have that crazy situation where they called him for a penalty and then he went to the box and then they rescinded it. That I think more of you think it was, yeah. I, I all right. Have- did you watch the replay? He I doesn't even touch him. No, man. I watched it 17 fucking times. He, he <laughs> makes contact with his skate, and he falls but, within a, a, a point to three seconds after that, man. Look, I, I get no... They I know do I that once a decade. Like, I know. I just thought he... I thought... Uh, listen, I know it wasn't a traditional, like, pull the, the front of your stick and pull a guy like a, like a hook-type trip. But when you hit a guy's skates and he falls, that's a fucking trip, man. I, I, I thought that was, like, not textbook. Fair trip. enough. But you hit a guy skates, he falls within a point three seconds of it. You tripped him. And, and I, I'm surprised, Biz, in your Leafs fandom and your Leafs uh, underwear you wear, you don't even ever, maybe not this season, mention Mikheyev. The guy is one of their best players. He's nasty. He's one of the fastest players in the league. And he really doesn't get credit from you and a lot of other Leafs fans. So I'll shout out that guy. I watched that whole game last night. He scored that beautiful goal. I think it was Marner's yeah. third assist. He's yeah. a good fucking player. He keeps a, getting better and better. He's a great player, and I've been hesitant to shout him out. I talked about him in playoffs last year. He's always good in the regular season, and then all of a sudden he disappears. And then oh, people are going to say, ah, oh, that's the whole team. Shut the fuck up. Um, one, one, so yes, he's been, he's had a great year and it was a great breakaway goal. Went to the backhand. Silky. How about Matthews completely ditching his breakaway for the, for, for the pass over to uh, Marner. But uh, the one concern I do have right now, and I don't want to pick on the fourth line. They're just generating nothing. They're not doing anything. I think that there might have to be a little bit of a shakeup. That's my, and only you know, the shakeup. I don't know if he would fit in on the fourth line. 
But at some point in the next two weeks, um, the University of Minnesota is going to be finishing up their season and they lo- they're moved on to the final four. It's in two weeks in Boston. They will either lose or win, but come the end of two weeks from now, Matthew Nyes could sign a professional contract with the Toronto Maple Leafs and hop right into their lineup. They, said, dude, that he, they said he could be the next Matthews. I, I wouldn't go that far. But he is, I mean, he could be a legit top two line scorer in the NHL. And I remember years back, years, Jeff Farkas, a big time prospect who played at Boston College. He left, I think he left BC after his junior, senior year. or whatever. It might have been after his junior year. If it wasn't, it was right after his senior season ended. And he hopped right into the Leafs lineup. And he made a difference in the playoffs for them. And this guy probably has a a higher ceiling than Jeff Farkas, who was a big time player. But you could see Matthew Nyes get into this Leafs lineup and really make a difference. Yep. That'd be great to see. They need they need something right now. The fourth line has been atrocious. Uh, I think they just signed somebody from Harvard, too. Maybe he hops in. Who knows? Yeah. Maybe they should reverse those Drew House jerseys and see how they play with the fucking smiley watchman thing going. I got one on right now. I like them. I oh, like them. Oh, well, let's see him piss. Like, pe- people, uh, people were pissed that uh, they, they had the yellow. And then people were making the Boston Bruins jokes. Oh, maybe if they look like the bees, they can get past the mm. burnt match. Yeah, they have like a, a watchman, like smiley face vibe on them. Like that whole Drew House thing. I, I don't feel like flipping it over right now. I have it yeah. on the side that they wore it in the I, game. I, I guess, like, if it, they make it reversible, then how come they don't, like, let them play with the reverse side? I know they wore them in warm-ups, but, I mean, if you make a big deal about the jersey, let them play with the... Did they the actually say that they weren't allowed to, or did they choose not to? I would... I'm, I'm. They would probably have to get permission from the NHL to, like, petition it to use them. I don't know if they did that, but I think they just selling it as reversible with, but they're playing with, the obviously, the Leafs on one side. I guess the thing is, if you're going to sell it as reversible, like you would think they would play with it. No, am I being like, maybe they are down the road. I don't know that information, but as of right now, I do like the side that it's on. And I think it's more for fans where they get to kind of wear two different types of looks. And given the fact that these things aren't cheap and the fans are digging into their pockets and tickets aren't cheap either. They figured, Hey, why not give back and make it a two for one special, baby? All right, moving right along with traded players. Ricard Raquel had a goal and two assists uh, on, I think it was his third game with Pittsburgh, as they hung 11 goals on the Detroit Red Wings. Just an absolute thrashing 11 to 2 win. The first team to score 11 in the cap era, uh, and the first since the Capitals back in 03, and just the third team since 1996 to put 11 or more on the board. Also, the first time the Penguins have scored 11 since uh, way back in 1993, back in the Yaga Mario days, and the fifth time as a franchise they've hit 11 or more goals. Gino had his 13th career hat trick and an assist. Uh, Penguins have been hum- humming lately, man. They can't catch Carolina, but they've been humming. Only three points back. Carolina does have two games in hand. And uh, let's see, Gino, he, like I said, he has his 13th hat trick. Still a long way to go to catch Mario. Mario had 40 hat tricks. As a Pittsburgh Penguin, what uh, what do you got in the pens for us, buddy? Well, it was a big time effort, and they really needed to have it because they got pumped, uh, I believe, by the Rangers. Was it a couple nights prior to that? Yeah. And to have a you know a big bounce back game at home, but Detroit, oh my God, the wheels have fallen off. They, I think, a month or two into the season, they might have been one of the top three teams in the Atlantic Division, where you had these two star rookies. Larkin's still having a career year and you saw some promise and it's like, oh my God, they made that trade for Nadelkovic. And I was one of the people who was all over Carolina for getting rid of him, but maybe they knew something and maybe the team defense in Detroit has been so bad where it's really hard for Nadelkovic to even look remotely good. But this team sucks. They're 32nd in the league and goals given up. They've given up in games this year. One goal, two goals, three goals, four goals, five goals, six goals, seven goals, eight goals, nine goals, 10 goals, and then 11 against the Penguins. So it's one of the all-time worst defensive teams you've seen in years, years. And for a team to get 11 on another NHL team, it hasn't happened since 2003. I think if you just said that, R.A., I apologize. I was kind of reading some notes about Detroit and how how pathetic it's been. So... I don't know if, if Blashill can, can kind of keep his job after this year. This will be his seventh or eighth year. Um, the team needs to make some steps forward. I still think the future's bright there, and they got these young stars, but it's like, wow, the whole season has completely fallen off the rails, and the other night was, was one of the craziest things I've ever seen. And that's coming from a fan of a team who gave up fucking nine 
Oh, we looked we looked like the the 2000 New Jersey Devils compared to the Wings against the Penguins. You mentioned the bright spots. I mean, they're going to have first and second runner up to the Calder this year. Uh, great effort from these young guys. Um, if anything, if you're a Detroit fan, you're probably happy that they were as good as they were early in the season so you can enjoy it, feel like you're in the race. And then now that you're getting to the last 20 games of the year, you want you want the wheels to fall off because all you want is a, a top draft pick. And when they've drafted in that sixth overall range, they've been able to turn out some studs, right? So you don't want to draft in the middle of the first round. That's when it's harder to end up getting a guy who's going to contribute to your lineup. Mind you, the argument is, a hey, with Stevie Y and crew now, doesn't matter where the fuck they're drafting. They're going to be pulling rabbits out of their ass in the seventh round. Um, you mentioned the Delkovich ugly. They got rid of Letty, and I forget the other guy's name at the deadline, so you know the defense is going to get worse. Um, and, yeah, just a very disappointing ending, and I can't imagine um, they will stick with this coach much longer if this is the way the end of the season. You got, you got to imagine they might want a new voice in that locker room heading, heading moving forward. They've lost 10 of their last 12. Yeah. It, so. uh, the, the media starting to get loud about it up there uh, for, for Blazel. Uh, the Wings surrendered nine plus goals for the third time in the last 14 games. That's, I mean, that's pretty That's bad. almost like uh, that's a, an incredible stat in that's, the current NHL. Even though the scoring's up this year, it's still wild to hear that. Let me ask you guys a question. Crazy. Who would you uh, who would you bring in as a coach who'd be available right now? Babcock. Think, I was just, I was going to say, do you think there's a chance that they bring Babcock back? No fucking way, but like Did, did he coach Iserman? Did he ever yeah, coach I'm, I'm him? I'm going to no. say no. I, no he wait, might have. No, wait. Yeah, you know what? He, I think too. he did because Cleary played no. with Iserman on yeah. a line and did Cleary ever play for anyone else in Detroit besides Babcock? Eisenman only played. Eisenman. Uh, Eisenman did indeed play for uh, Mike Babcock in the 2005-2006 season. Okay. We don't want a couple of them. Then, I'm coming home. I'm coming um, home. That's a good question. Well, uh, Eisenman, man, I wouldn't be surprised if he goes off off the grid, assuming he doesn't bring plays hey, back. I mean, he hired you know, John Cooper. Bingo. That's... And they, you know, Guy, he also, what, was he there when Guy Boucher came in too? Or am I, was that... Pre Eisman, either way, Eisman's not afraid to go off off the off the grid and bring in a guy. Wow, like that would be a fun f- a question for our fans to answer. Where we maybe maybe post it, G, and we'll go back when they eventually hire a new one if they do, and and see if somebody pulled it off the board. Like you got to imagine, there's like some college coach that people yeah. are crazy about who they think believed to get their chance, or some junior coach. That we wings posted. team, hey, that wings team, Eisman's last year went fifty eight sixteen zero and eight. Wow. That, Datsuk had 87 points, Zetterberg 85, Shanahan had 81 points, 40 goals that year. Lidstrom had 80 points in 80 games. What a fucking run that team had. 20 friggin' years of that. Wait, I wasn't done with those savage numbers either. Uh, the Red Wings, uh, in addition to the, the nine plus goals for the third time in 14 games, seven plus goals for the ninth time this season, uh, the most since uh, 88, 89 for the Red Wings. And they've surrounded five or more goals in 13 of their last 26 games. Like those, I mean, just obscene, obscene numbers for, for a team defense uh, anytime, no matter what era. But either way, like like I said, that's good, man. If you're a Red, a Red Wings fan, you should be happy about that because they're not going to the playoffs and they'll approve their draft position. So, hey, how about these Moritz Sider reverse hits coming oh my out God. one after another? Though. We man, stop trying charges. to hit him. Stop Man trying to hit him. <laughs> Those are beautiful to watch. He just like he is blowing guys up. I know. I mean, I, know. It, I mean, it's not like he's pronged his size or like Alexiak size, like the six eight guy. Like I, he, I think he's six five, six it, six, two thirty. Though I mean, he's, he's a that, monster. Was that, was that my best hot take this year? Saying he's the next pronger. Is he that? Dude, he doesn't like. He's that big for it. Yeah. Like uh, maybe not six six. And oh, fuck, maybe he's not even six five. Okay. But he's big. He's big and heavy. Like he's he's you know he's not yeah he's not the one of the tallest players in the league but he's a monster yeah and he's right. young and he is burying people on those fucking reverse hits even but. his clips of the year before in the SHL in Sweden where he was defenseman of the year he was killing guys like di- like people say he's dirty over there he's just lighting everyone up six four two oh seven is his size weight. there's no way he's two oh seven but yeah so he's tall at least okay. he's definitely he's heavier skinnier right? than that I think he's heavier all heavier. Well, that could be his draft number, you know? Well, you boys' teams had quite the battle uh, Saturday night in the latest battle of Alberta. Calgary blew out Jesus. Edmonton 9-5. to five. 
unreal game. And this is highly entertaining game. We had it all, had it all, all kinds of scoring, all kinds of Johnny Goudreau all over the place. Five assists. Man, this guy is going to get absolutely paid this summer. 90 points uh, for the second time in his career. Uh, I know everyone's picking on the uh, Edmonton goaltender, but their, their team D was just absolutely porous. I know the goalies weren't great, but uh, they were hung out to dry quite a bit in this game. Uh, the Flames now lead the Oilers by 11 points in the division. Let's, uh, <laughs> even the Edmonton social media had enough. They, they tweeted out the game, and they just said, Google it. <laughs> Literally just said, Google it, because they're so fucking done with, like, getting beat up by Calgary. Uh, Leon had a hat trick and he ended up a minus four. It's the first time that's happened since 1983, uh, a little weird statistical anomaly. Uh, but what, I don't know, man, you might have to get that passion of the Christ cross ready to go. To the, uh, to the earring shop. There was a span in December and January. I think the Oilers lost 13 of 15 games, if not more. That was the lowest moment of the season for me. I I planned my entire Saturday around the game because it's, it's a late start. So I wanted to get all this stuff done. I knew I was going to be up late watching it. And while having a blast watching, at least through halfway of the game, when it was six to five Calgary with like 13 minutes left in the second period, I was so embarrassed and disgusted by the end of it. The, the Oilers, the o- Oilers team defense while being amazingly improved five on five under Woodcroft is still so bad that I actually tweeted Paul Koskinen. And then I think I might, no, I didn't tweet Paul Smith, put Koskinen back in. It didn't even matter. Koskinen was on the bench after he got pulled. He looked like he just took a cross country road trip with Snoop Dogg and Willie Nelson in the car. He was like, (laughs) like, I, I, what just happened? Dude, they had, the Oilers got outscored nine to two, five on five. Yeah. I mean, it's like every time they play Calgary, I'm like, oh, they got to, if they get this one, the way they've been playing, they're playing great. Now they have, they have Arizona. Well, last night, as you're listening tonight, as we record, they better come up and show like the look like the Penguins did against the wings because that game was so pathetic and just shows how they are not even on the same planet as the Calgary Flames as an overall team. Yeah, power play wise, they're probably better than them. Uh, Other than that, it's like, what is going on? It's just there's no there's no respect to the game of defense from the entire team. Like Nurse has had a couple tough games. Um, Duncan Keith, you know, he's he's looking a little bit older. CC gets shit on by the fans. He didn't play great. Nobody played great. He gets shit on wherever he goes. He's like a Jack Johnson. Dude, those those goals. There was there wasn't even anyone like near the goal scores. The Goudreau assist, the, the assist he tight turned and then oh fed uh, Shillington. That was such a sick play. Goudreau, I mentioned my um. I wish there was five MVP candidates this year. Shesterkin in no particular order. Goudreau, Makar, Yossi, Matthews. Either one of those Edmonton Oilers guys aren't on my ballot for MVP. And and. And they are these incredible world-class talents. They could probably play better team defense, but the whole team as a whole, That's the honorable entire you. team as a group, just has no time and no effort to try to play defense in their own zone. It's, it's wild to watch. And that game was a low moment because if they were to somehow play Calgary, like they, they would get fucking trounced. In the playoffs. That's an honorable moment for you, Whit. I'm going to applaud that for you saying that you don't have either of your Oilers. All right. Want to fucking help out here? The only chance I have, the only chance I have is that LA stays in the second or third spot in the Pacific. The Oilers get the other spot in Pacific. They can beat LA and then maybe Calgary gets like Dallas or Vegas. Yeah, and they or lose. it's a tough, se- or 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 it's just a grind of a series to where it wears them down a little bit. Now, so, uh, they, they weren't winning that game the minute Milan Lucic walked in with that. Oh, black what a what, oh. a what an entrance! I, I think he yeah. just whacked somebody from the Donnie Brasco set. No, he sold he sold a used car and then he came over to the rink. He sold he sold his <laughs> truck with the with his he number. He was Razor Ramon. Rest. That's <laughs> like that's R. A, R. When, <laughs> when you see a guy wa- walking like that, like with that jacket on, with that swag. Did he run just, somebody over for a, shit? A bad, a bad motherfucker. So, Wit, you 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 kind of touched on it. 
Calgary's ability to score five on five is it's just amazing that they play great team defense. We mentioned their goaltending. Um, I actually feel like an idiot here because I didn't even mention Mitchie Marner when we were talking about the Leafs, but most points in the last 30 team games, Mitch Marner leads away with 53, but right underneath that Johnny Goudreau and Matthew Kachuk tied at 47, that top line, Overall, full body of work might be the best line in the NHL all season long. I think that's a very fair statement. They've been able to stay healthy. Uh, you mentioned Johnny Goudreau getting the bag. Matthew Kachuk is also going to get the bag. It's a shame that they're not going to be able to probably keep both these guys. When's his deal up? One more year? No, he's up, dude. He signed a three-year Kachuk's year. up? Yeah, he's up. He signed a he signed a three year deal where it went five million, seven million, nine million. So in the last year, which is this year, where he's making nine, his qualifying offer, I you know he's I, he's basically at nine and a half already. If he's going to so sign, so is going to be a flyer. So it's going to be difficult to keep both those guys. But the reason at you know maybe three, four weeks ago, I was hesitant to throw Johnny Goudreau in the mix. Was you know all these other guys were having these insane seasons. Well. 90 points you mentioned, 70 of which at even strength. That's first in the National Hockey League for Johnny Goudreau. And 90% of his points are primary. So either the goal or primary assists, assist, and that ranks 12 in the National Hockey League. So he's driving the bus on the top line in the league. They're able to punish teams five on five, which we all know is the hardest way to score now, especially with the way that all teams play team defense. So just Overall, man, Johnny Goudreau needs serious consideration for MVP. And that has happened probably more so in the last, as I mentioned, three to four weeks, especially in the last 30 games, being second only to, to Mitchie Marner with uh, 47 points in that period of time. So, Have you ever heard of like a more quiet sixth in the league in scoring than Kachuk this year? No. It's like, and, I didn't even, I didn't even like know it was going that well. No, granted, I should have with that line. But what a season! What a team! I, what am I going to say right now? So I, I just, I just have to hope that they lose first round, and that we get in and we and we lose first round. Because I don't uh, see how I, we're going to win. Guys, if I could just jump in real quick, uh, I tweeted out that Red Wings question. And there's an overwhelming favorite, and it's Igor Larionov, who was the Russian uh, the Olympic professor. coach this past season. And then right after that, it's Nick Lindstrom and then uh, Joel Quenville. I, guys, Nick Lindstrom doesn't want to hang out behind the bench. There's not a chicken dick's chance after playing the career that he had. Yeah, he's going to fuck, no. But Igor Larionov. That's you know, interesting because it's like Coop. Like you guys said, it's like kind of off the, off the map there. And that's how he wants him playing. You know, I've been respecting very a lot of them. Name. Right. And, and he obviously has an affinity for Russians as well. A former teammate. That's a, that's an intriguing name. G. Wow. Biz, your uh, capitals take is just gleaming right now because they've given up two goals in the first eight minutes. They look horrible. And Carolina is oh, just be dominating. careful. Be careful. You might have the fan base sending anthrax. Oh, you think I'm worried about fan bases coming at me? I've had <laughs> fan bases threaten my life for three fucking years in this podcast. You think I give a shit? I'm an you know honest, what, unbiased hockey reporter. You know what fan base should be kissing my ass right now? The Buffalo Sabres. I have galvanized this group. You're going to get suckered oh, at the Chicklets oh, Cup in July. Colin People Miller. Despise you. Colin Miller, a defenseman for their team, reached out to me saying, hey, what's your problem, bro? What's my problem? I'm fucking waking your fan base up. All of a sudden, I've galvanized not only the players, but the fan base to come together and hate my guts to where all of a sudden you're winning some fucking hockey games. All of a sudden, not only that, it's pouring over into Bill's Mafia. You're welcome for your new stadium. All of this has happened after I shit on you guys. You should be fucking kissing my ass. You can just be kissing my feet, and you could do so. We'll set up a kissing booth at the Chicklets Cup. We could do it where they break ground for their new stadium. So shut the fuck up, Buffalo Sabres fans. You're going to be Chris Rock and some <laughs> giant monster named Harry from Buffalo with his... High school ring on is going to Paige Thompson. He's going to get 30. They got their next captain, Tuck, who we've, we've had him on. We, we gave him the chicklets bump to come on over to you guys. 
Skinner's back at his goal scoring pace after I'm very happy for jump. Jeff Skinner. Yes, yeah, same taking here. a lot of shit and same it's been here. a really tough couple years and to have 27 goals now good for him. You're welcome Sabres fans. What else do you got as far as what they've been doing in the last little bit since I mean since uh, they you're trying to say up. like say thank you to me. You shit on them calling them scumbag losers. It's not about you like told them to wake up and start rooting for their team. You said they were asshole clowns. Like they don't and, like and, you. And 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 Krebs the other guy who came over for Eichel, he had a comment. No egos in the locker room. We're all galvanizing as a group because that idiot Bissonette. You don't think that they're all talking about this? Colin Miller reached out to me via text. They're fucking talking about that. it. I know. I'm going to say it again. Yeah, Biz. Uh, points in five straight. Uh, points in seven of eight. You're they welcome. Playing with purpose. Uh, they look like a much different team than they did early in the season. Uh, Tage Thompson and Jeff Skinner both have 27 goals. Kyle Ocposo, 16 goals, the most he's had in five years. Another also guy. 21 assists. Uh, Alex Tuck, our buddy, uh, eight goals, 18 assists in 34 games, plus three. He's the only plus on the roster. And uh, Rasmus Dahlin, he looks like he's sort of he's sort yep. of rounded that corner, uh, that developmental corner as a defenseman. So nice to see that he's gotten there. And Biz, not to cut you short, uh, on Buffalo, uh, we do, we're not done with Edmonton quite yet. Uh, because they did a very good thing last week. Let me just find my notes right here. Yeah, before you go to that, you're, you're not cutting me short. They're, they're finally cutting the cord on Jack oh. Eichel, which I told them to do, and they've done, and now they're starting to win some hockey games. I was just hey, I was just the bearer of bad news. Okay, you were the and midwife. I'll, I'll, I'll be your bad guy, Buffalo <laughs> Sabres fans. You were the midwife of bad you're news. You're welcome. Just make sure you get my ring size in Buffalo. And don't worry, Sabres fans. Around. When your team's good in two years, Bill Biz will pick them to win the cup, so you're all set. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's seven other teams too. I can't wait to go to Buffalo. Some of I have three way, teams, guys. Today, uh, e- either way, the Oilers did a fantastic thing earlier in the week. Uh, absolutely great thing. They brought in a young brain tumor patient yeah. by the name of Ben Stelter uh, to be their flag bearer. Uh, he joined them in the locker room and on the ice for the anthem, and they kind of fist bumped him in the way. And you know, these type of things uh, always give you a, like goosebumps. They they melt your heart, especially when the when the little man's you know going through a medical. Uh, situation like and the way these guys treat them it, it you just can't sit sit there but help but get overwhelmed by it wet i mean you're a former it was so amazing honest to god i i i really have a tough time talking about stuff like this seeing ben and seeing the support that he got seeing what he's doing and then looking at my own kids i'm telling you it is really difficult to think about but th- thankfully the edmonton oilers put on an amazing show for him and God bless him. God bless his family. And everyone's thinking about him. And that's what makes sports so great is that you could see moments like that help somebody that's going through the toughest fight of their lives. So God bless that kid. Yeah. You can follow his father on social media too. Like a a lot of amazing posts, inspirational. It's M underscore Dan 25. And he just gives tons of updates on Ben and where you, you touch on after the game, they ended up giving him the bucket and then the vest as well. And just made a made a very special night for this kid. And uh, post game press conference with Hyman was funny. Maybe we could roll the clip if you if you got it. All right, ready? Oh. All right, let's push you in here. All right. Hey Ben, how are you? Ben. What did you think of the game today? My good. How did you think Zach Hyman played today? Good. I think he plays really good. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> ben, who's your favorite Oiler? McDavid and Zoy Sardo. That's a pretty good bet, even though <laughs> I'm sitting right beside you. No offense taken. No, <laughs> no offense taken. That's a tough one to beat, hey, Zach? Yeah. So just they just they rolled out the red carpet for him, and, and this is really what it's all about, guys. I, and uh, it's uh, it's devastating. No kid should have to go through this. And it, it was nice of the others to make his uh, his dream come true. No doubt, Biz. And we, I also want to give a shout out to uh, Carolina's Ian Cole. I'm not sure if you guys caught this. He had an interaction online with a young fan named Lorelai. Uh, her dad said she's autistic and she lost her tooth and she was upset about it. You know, I guess she has a difficulty with change. So he showed her a picture of Ian Cole online, to, you know, say, hey, this guy lost his tooth, too. And he wrote back to her. Ends up inviting to her, her to a game. Uh, he, she comes to the game. He gives her a signed jersey. And it's just a great picture of Ian Cole sitting in the hallway, like, uh, you know, sitting down like what a little kid playing with her stuffed animal. And it's just like, I'm not saying like other guys do it in other sports, but to see the image of him just taking 10 minutes out of his day to sit with like this five or six year old girl and talk to her, 
gives her a signed jersey, man. It's it's just it's just beautiful to see, man. This little girl is, you know, loses a tooth, has uh, has you know has an episode about it or whatever, and Ian Cole comes over to the rescue, and I don't know, man. It, it's it's hot warming stuff to see this stuff, and I don't know. We love when these hockey guys do it. Biz, uh, did you happen to catch that? I did. I think that I think the original post was a couple of weeks ago, wasn't it? Yep. And then yeah, finally they connected yep. and then and then, then he brought her over to a game. So just a class act. And we were actually able to spend some time with him in St. Louis with when he was there. And then he ended up getting moved over, won a couple cups. So uh just Hitch a, a was great, all over him, I remember. Yeah, Hitch great salt of the that guy. Yeah, he did. Well hey, yeah, he's a well, Stanley Cup champion now. Absolutely. And, and, and he did a very good thing. Uh, and we are going to get some Milan Hey Duke shortly, but there was one other game. We just talked about the Battle of Alberta. One other game, great Sunday game, Minnesota-Colorado. Uh, we know Minnesota's not going to catch them for the division, but, you know, they still want to smack them in the mouth while they can. Uh, the Wild tied it with a little over five minutes left, then went 3-2 to two in OT on Kevin Fiala's 22nd of the year. The Wild's sixth straight win. Uh, they're also the first team to have three six-game winning streaks this season, and it's the first time the Wild have done that in their team history. Uh, the Avs outshot him 42 to 29. The Avs have also scored a power play in seven straight. Uh, it, even though this is in the pregame biz, I don't know if you saw it. It was uh, D- uh, Delaria McDermott, the opposite of tummy sticks. We thought we were going to get some fisticuffs with him, but it was Matt Dumba and fucking Nate McKinnon who ended up scrapping. Not what we saw coming. Biz, what would you take on that stuff? No, I mean, listen, as you guys know, my my uh, my feelings on, on Nate Dog flipping off Aunt Marsha and my feelings towards him and the Coyotes, but major respect for being a team guy there. A um, lot of conversation online, whether Dumba went high on Rantanen or not, but Nate Dog doesn't give a fuck. You hit one of his teammates like that, the wires cross, he's going over there to, to protect them and and do what he can for, do what he can for the team. And I, I respect superstars who are willing to do that job as well. So uh, shout out to the Nate Dog for that, but you're not in the clear. We're, we're going to get you at ASU next year, buddy. I'll pump I your tires. It. And and Dumba's quote was um, you know, I have a ton of respect playing against Nate. We love I love going to battle against him. And he just it was one of those things where I agreed. He came over and asked me. I respected him for it. It was a good fight. He kind of won. He McKinnon definitely won the fight. And interestingly enough, I think it was the game or two before Kadri fought, and they asked Bednar about it. And he's like, uh, yeah, I don't love seeing these guys fight, but then right when it's over and nobody has a broken hand or a broken orbital, I say, Oh, okay, it's great. So it really is one of those things where you got you got this team that's looking to finally win a Stanley cup with this amazing core they've had. And let's maybe now not fight the rest of the season, but it's really hard to take the DNA out of this team where they care about each other and they stick up for one another, no matter how many games are left before the playoffs start. It's just like you're in the game. You're in the heat of battle. You're not even thinking about, Oh, the playoffs start in three weeks. It's just like an initial reaction to one of your boys getting run over. So I thought it was awesome. Landy's doing it too. It's like every single one of their stars are willing to scrap. Yeah, it's good shit. Uh, what he said, uh, Dumba. Yeah, I was ready for it. It was a mutual agreement to go. I know, Nate. We have fun battling against each other. It was good. Like that's I love that shit, man. How we fought, and they both love it, man. It's like that's when people are like, oh, why is it still fighting hockey? It's like because motherfuckers want to fight each other. Like you know, nobody has to fight if they don't want to. Two guys want to fight and get it, get whatever they have to get over. It's awesome, man. It's good shit. That's a perfect example of it. Uh, boys, I think we should probably send it to Milan Hey Duke right now. Yep. This guy, uh, Avalanche legend. We have a uh, pleasure to talk to him. Another European guy. We love talking to the Euros, so we're going to send it over to him. But first, we're going to let you know that this interview is brought to you by Cross Country Mortgage. If you want to win the Stanley Cup, you need a championship, championship team. If you want to win at buying a home, you need the team at Cross Country Mortgage. Do your goalie, your defense, and your forwards. When the gloves come off, you can count on them to back you up and get it done. Cross Country Mortgage has a team of loan offices dedicated to getting you the best possible loan terms available. They have an average close time of 21 days, which is ridiculously fast. My boy Devo, he gets it done. They've got a wide variety of loan types, which means they've got everything to cover everyone. And they have some exciting news. They're giving away free Barstool and Cross Country Mortgage sweatshirts when you sign up to refi or get pre-approval while supplies last. Take it from some guys that know how important it is to have a team that's got your back. Cross Country Mortgage is dedicated to getting it done for you. Again, if you're looking to refi, looking to buy for the first time, these guys are awesome. They're going to take care of you. So go to ccm.com slash Barstool so Cross Country Mortgage can take care 
of you through the home buying process. Cross Country Mortgage, LLC, NMLS 3029. All loans subject to underwriting approval, www.nmlsconsumeraccess.org. And now, enjoy Milan Heydu. Well, it's a pleasure to bring on our next guest. This check forward was taken in the fourth round of the 1994 draft by Quebec, and he played his entire 14-year career with the Colorado franchise. In that time, he was an all-star three times. He made the all-rookie team. He was a Call the Trophy finalist. He won a Rashad Trophy. He won a Stanley Cup. He won an Olympic gold medal, and he had his number 23 retired by the Avalanche. Thanks so much for joining us on the Spit and Chicklets podcast. Milan, hey, Duke. How you been, Milan? Yeah, uh, been good. <laughs> what have you been up to, man? Nine, <laughs> nine years flies by, huh? Yeah, it does. It does. So I'm just kind of bouncing all over the place right now. Uh, uh, currently spending more time in Michigan, where uh, one of my sons play for the USA uh, National Team Development Program. So we're kind of renting here and housing him for, for this year. And next year, we'll be back in Colorado. Wow, that's that's really cool for your son, and and I'm guessing he he grew up uh, playing youth hockey in the Denver area, which is probably continuing to get better and better. Was was that the case for him and some teammates? Like seeing the improvement pretty early on for these guys. Absolutely, it's like since since the the, the Avs uh, moved from Quebec to uh, to Colorado '96, uh, you know, uh, those you can see definitely the boom in, in youth hockey. Uh, you know, boys were uh, once they uh, got out of the, the double, a, double A hockey and played triple A hockey for Colorado Thunderbirds, and and uh, I, I, you know, I was helping out. The, I was helping out coaching it also. But you see, like the hockey is just getting bigger and bigger in Colorado, which is which is great to see. Uh, you know, uh, you know, there's some good hockey players coming out of Colorado, which uh, before was not really the case. So you had a chance at the at the end of your career. I, I'm guessing where you're your son was like five or six years old in the locker room. Or was it the usual, you were not his favorite player at all. It was somebody else. Absolutely. Yeah. There was always, <laughs> always some other guys. And uh, yeah, I, I don't think I was one of them. Uh, that's, that's seems like that's the case. Uh, I remember even, even then Joe sacking skates and you know, uh, Joe was not their favorite player year. I, it just, it just, it just happens. But you know, like the, the, all the kids, uh, you know, the, the uh, kids of the pro hockey players, they go through, uh, uh, you know, we bring them to the locker room, and they just kind of uh, they, they get a taste of the you know the the hockey pro hockey life and and stuff like that. So uh, I, I thought it was really good for them. From my understanding, you also had a rink on your property with a zamboni. Is that true? Yeah, we we used to. Uh, yeah, we we don't have it anymore. But yeah, we used, we used to. Uh, it was like uh, so. For, uh, first thing what I saw was Adam Foot Footer had uh, uh, same thing basically uh, built in different different location in Denver. Uh, he, his was outdoor and uh, and we, you know we were you know, it was awesome uh, and we were talking and he said there were some issues with uh, especially when you're in Colorado it's just uh, the sun is so powerful you're a mile high uh, just to maintain the uh, outdoor rink is not not as easy uh, you have like uh, let's say leave uh, lands on on the ice with something and, and just uh, the sun just uh, hits on it and just burns through the ice so there there are some issues out there so. We had basically the same size, but just uh, in different location. And we uh, it was it was indoor. It was basically like a steel building, and uh, uh, it was like 80, 80 feet long and forty feet wide. You know, like size of the, like roughly a neutral zone. Did you did you have to learn how to drive the zamboni? <laughs> so the zam the zam is uh, it was a small zamboni. It was, it was not a uh, regular size. Smaller zamboni. They use them in, in uh, some cruise ships have ice. So th- this is what type of zamboni they use. It's a uh, it's a small small zamboni, about six seven feet uh, long, four feet wide. Uh, the the gut of the zamboni is just a water tank. So you you you, uh, you tank the you put a hot water in it, and it doesn't collect the snow. So you have to once in a while stop, uh, shove the uh, you have to shovel the snow in the pit. Uh, but it, it was it was kind of cool. I, this is what you know. I drove that zamboni for sure. So it was it was, it was cool. I, I was basically a maintenance guy for uh for you know the ice maintenance guy. So yeah, so, part time uh, NHLer, full time maintenance guy, so your kids could learn how to play absolutely, hockey. Absolutely. Yeah. Have you been keeping tabs in your old squad? Uh, you know, so I'm like we uh, uh here and there we have some uh, alum, alumni uh, events, uh, some 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 games. Uh, guys come to town. You know, there's you have more and more people actually start living in, in, in Colorado. Obviously, it's an awesome, awesome place. 
Uh, so, uh, yeah, over the years, been in touch with some. All right, now, we want to go back to your early days when you started playing hockey. Now, you know, the communism was still around. The Iron Curve was still around. Did, were you familiar with the NHL growing up? Did you see any highlights, or, or was it still pretty much? Uh, like, uh, it, it, it was kind of tough. During the com- commies years, uh, it was definitely anything coming from the West was uh, uh, it was really uh, not, not the thing we uh, – that was promoted that's for sure so uh but it, when the, the wall basically the berlin wall went down and, and the whole communist regime went down i was about 13 uh and then things changed and there was some uh so it was around 1989 so uh, i was 13 then uh then you had access after that you had access to uh uh you know nhl games and stuff like that so then all of a sudden we knew what nhl is all about but uh, before, during the communist regime, really, uh, you know, you heard about it, but, you know, there was not much information, no uh, no footage or whatever, no videos, anything like that. Um, we had a great conversation with, with Patrick Elias, and he kind of went into part of the issue now is how expensive hockey is over there. So was it the same for you where back then everyone was given gear, everyone was given ice time, and it just made it a lot easier for kids to play the way he told us it was? Absolutely. Uh, in, in a way, uh, obviously, the communist regime is brutal uh, for uh, just the normal living. But for sports, it was yeah. it was good for sports. That's that's basically uh, the, the regime's uh, uh, way to show uh, the Western countries that, you know, our, our regime is better than yours. It, it was through sports, basically, basically show them that we can you know get more Olympic medals and and. and look good in international competitions so they were pumping money in sports so basically growing up like you you got all the equipment it was free you know your parents didn't have to pay for anything so i think part of it it's probably why uh like patty like our generation and even old, older guys like yaks and uh mari ruzinski hashik and these guys they all grew up in communist regime where everything was free uh i think that the numbers of you i think you with hockey players were up when now it's now it's lot you know it's it's down because it, it, it the cost obviously it costs families more money than than uh, it used to be so that's that's probably part of a problem too i think what made you fall in love with hockey in particular did you play other sports growing up or did you always gravitate towards hockey and if so was there was there a guy that you you wanted to emulate or a guy that you looked up to and that's why you gravitated towards it well, uh, so my dad was, uh, he played hockey kind of on the uh, uh, first division in Czech a little bit and in the second division, and then he coached. So, uh, and he was running the youth hockey program in my hometown. My mom played tennis. Uh, so uh, I grew up playing both sports. About when I was 13, 14, I decided to go with hockey, but I played both sports. Still love tennis. It's kind of, uh, at least in, in old Czechoslovakia, that was the common thing. Guys played uh uh, winter time they played hockey and summer tennis it was just really common thing and and uh you know i played a ton of tennis i i, I you know a lot, i like the sports sport uh so that was kind of two sports what i did and uh my idols really well uh during the communist times we all admire like the uh the the red army and you have the marker of larian of Krutov, these guys are just oh. just cleaning up all the international competitions that's that's what we had access to and uh once uh, uh, the you know the the wall went down, then you start to see NHL guys and and you have you know, all kinds of you know, Alex Mogilny, Tim Silani. You know how do you not like these guys? They're rookie years, and they I mean Tim was rookie year, and he scored I don't know seventy plus goals. And so uh, then you you know you get access to to NHL hockey, and you can you can watch NHL NHL stars. Now, had you heard of the Stastny brothers before the uh, Berlin Wall come down? Were you familiar with them at all? Yeah, ab- absolutely. Yeah, they were they were, they were the legends too. Obviously, uh, they uh, they actually left uh, during uh, during the basically the way how how you could uh, leave was you have to defect, really, right? Like Alex Morgilny did, uh, how how uh, Stastny's brother did. Uh, I, I remember that I think for a while there was there was a rule that uh, all these. Uh, you know, national team stars, they, they could leave uh, after they, they served, I don't know how many years for a national team. They had to be over 31. Then you, you could leave after that, but it was usually they're past their prime time. So if you want to uh, uh, leave earlier when you're prime time, you have, you have to defect. 
Huh. Being a, a fourth round pick yourself, you played for quite a while in check after the draft. So, I mean, I'm noticing there was definitely probably one season that you could have headed over, but you stayed for that fourth year. Was that your decision? Was that the abs almost saying, you know, just wait it out? Like, how did it all go down to wait that long when you were really lighting it up in Europe? Uh, actually, actually, it, it served me well, really, because, you know, I was uh, at 18, I was drafted by Nordiques. Then uh, the team moved to Colorado. Uh, so I was obviously nowhere ready to uh, uh, to play uh, National Hockey League. So it kind of served me well. Like Basically, it was like a minor league or, or playing basically four years of college, something similar to what guys do. But I just played in Europe, which you know, was, you know, really pretty solid league and then helped me well. Uh, Actually, I never went to any any training camp, really. So uh, after you know we won Nagano and and and, uh, and and that, so then I I finally I signed. So I didn't I didn't go to training camp without a contract. So uh, I, obviously there was not much interest from the ass. I was a late pick. Uh, obviously there was there was a lot of guys ahead of me uh, in in the pecking order, and uh, so just kind of uh, I developed my game in Europe and uh, served me well. Was it always the plan to go after that season or, or did the Olympics have an impact and maybe playing with some of the guys that had already been overseas? I, I think it uh, uh, helped me for sure. And probably uh, kind of the ass will look at me maybe a different way too. All of a sudden that you cannot, you can compete on the, on the highest level against NHL stars and be fine. So maybe that they thought this guy might be ready. So that's why I, right after that, I, I signed an initial contract. Uh, was uh, that your first time coming to North America when you went to training camp? Uh, to Denver. Uh, no, I, well, with, with uh, you know, the international, we, we played uh, actually 17 and under or 18 under, 16 under. We played some games in, we were in uh, Alberta. We played uh, the Viking Cup with, uh, when you were 17 and under uh, national team, but actually with Patty Aliash too. Uh, so, uh, we, we we visit uh, you know United States and and, and Canada for a, a few times, but uh, in Denver it was my first time. What, what did you know about Denver or Colorado before you moved there? Anything? Uh, you know, not much. Uh, you know that they have awesome mountains and pretty uh, sunny state, but other than that, not much. And they, I, I knew they had a good hockey team, obviously. I uh, I was a big fan of Chris Drury because I was a you know always watched BU and. So all of a sudden you guys are rookies together. I believe it's happened maybe three times since, but you were both up for the Calder Trophy. You actually had more points, but Drury ended up winning it. But getting over there and having a, another guy in similar age to you, obviously a big part of the team right away. It must have helped a ton just to kind of feel more comfortable that you weren't the only rookie, even though you were playing so well. Uh, absolutely. It was, it was awesome. Uh, I, uh, Chris was um, my roommate uh, actually a few times. It was, it was obviously difficult with me. So I, I showed up in North America. I didn't speak any English. So that oh, it wow. was obviously it was it was tough. It was difficult. Uh, the apps kind of helped me out with you know hiring uh, some English teacher. But back to Chris, uh, yeah, he was an awesome guy. What a what a clutch performer. Uh, definitely it helped. So I was n- not the only rookie there. Uh, Chris was with me there, and uh, you know he was a phenomenal player. Like when when the games were on the line, he was just phenomenal he you know he produced and what a what a competitor uh great guy and obviously doing you fu- doing really fine job with rangers now yeah he is and sorry just to go back to what you said so that they the team hired you a, an english instructor so was this kind of after practice a couple of days a week you'd go over and and just basically like talk with them or were you actually doing different grammar like how did they go about teaching you that and were you almost almost a little annoyed like i want to learn english but i really don't want to do this after practice Right, like you're you're absolutely gas after practice, right? Like as a rookie, <laughs> everything feels so hard to you. Uh, you're you're tired after practice, and then uh, uh, you have you gotta you know talk to the English teacher for a couple of hours a day. Uh, but I, I knew like it, it it's it's better for me. Uh, it, it it's not easy when you're in a locker room, guys guys talking about whatever, and and you you have no idea what they're talking about. Same thing with uh, coach. Uh, so it, it was kind of a little bit difficult, but. Uh, I think in a way, once you get through it, it makes you tougher. Like, yeah, I don't think nothing ever surprises you in life anymore. Uh, and and I think I think at the end it served me well. But the, the first couple, two or three months were tough. 
I mean, with some of the things I hear about Bob Hartley, it's probably a good thing you didn't speak English. <laughs> uh, I think so. Uh, Bob, Bob, Bob sometimes went to English, French, and when, you know, and uh, when he went French, he was not ugly, and then he was kind of ugly. Uh, when, uh, well, actually, Alex Tangi was my second year. Alex Tangi came there too, and yeah. So uh, when they start speaking French, he was usually not good. Uh, but, you know, Bob was a tough coach, but... Uh, a uh, very successful coach where anywhere he went, he, he won. So, uh, credit to him. Impressive. I, I mean, I even heard, a. it might be a rumor. Did it get to the point where even after you guys had won your cup that he got locked out of the locker room or is that just a, an, an old wise? No, tip? that, that, that never happened. So okay. uh, it was just a rumor, but I, I, I gotta give you that one story. Uh, I think it was my first year. So, uh, uh, we're, uh, we're running some, some drill and I, you know, I screwed up the drill a couple of times, uh, probably you know not knowing exactly what's going on there and bob bob lost it on me and he goes hey edge out go sit on the bench so i'm sitting on the bench guys the practice practice is running uh and like for like 15 minutes i'm just watching the guys from the bench they're, they're just the drills are going on and i'm just watching <laughs> so that's unbelievable yeah it, it was you know, bob was tough like especially on the rookies but uh you know the after the first year, then then he was fine, and he was actually really good to me. Was that the first time that you'd ever experienced a coach that was maybe that intense and, and that hard towards the yeah. players, or had you? Yeah, I mean, in, in Czech, you had some tough coach, but this this was a different level, definitely. And uh, you're like, okay, uh, you, you got to deal with it. But at the end, I think it, it does make you a little bit tougher, and, and things don't surprise you anymore. Now, uh, one quick one, one more about Bob Hartley here. Would he speak a little bit differently to Forsberg and Sackick <laughs> more so than the other guys, though? Because I can't imagine him raising his voice to Sackick. Yeah, yeah, like maybe maybe a little bit. But, uh, you know, like I, I think at the end of the day, like uh, boys, they knew like he, he's, he, you know, he's uh, meaning, meaning well. Uh, but obviously, yeah, he, any coach you got to treat the top players a little bit differently, right? They had a little bit longer leash than others. That's, that's just, just common thing. And uh, it was no different with Bob. Did you know just how good those guys were until you started playing with them? Joe, uh, Joe and Peter. Yeah. Like I like heard about them. And then once uh, uh, you step, uh, step on the ice with them uh, and, and especially like watching them daily on, on uh, you know, during the practices, I think it, it, it helps uh, all the players, not just me, uh, you, you see, like how how they deal with different situations on the ice, under pressure, what they do. Uh, obviously, it's awfully difficult to duplicate because they're just they're superstars, and very few people can do this what they did. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, both really, uh, you know, just hard workers and and uh, and impressive players. It definitely helped me to spend, you know, be on the same line with them. At you know, my first NHL game was with. Uh, Joe Sackick and, and Keith Jones. Actually, Jonesy's passing oh, on my first NHL goal. Jonesy. How the hell did Jonesy get on Sackick's line, for Christ's <laughs> sake? I know. He, he, he was on, on the top line. He could talk his way in any situation, Jonesy. <laughs> That's I probably headed up. Yeah. Yeah, I think he did. Uh, the, the most legendary um, – I guess there's a lot of them for Peter Forsberg, but the thing that I think of is the year, I think it was 01, 02. He missed the entire regular season, didn't play one game and comes back and leads the playoffs in scoring. Like I know you've seen so many wild things that he accomplished, but that must've been like mind blowing to see him come back first game of the playoffs after so long and just immediately light it up. Well, it, it, it started basically. Uh, so 2001, we won the cup and, uh, and the training camp is in Sweden. And Peter is a big, big part of it. Pete uh, basically set it up in, in Stockholm. So we have a training camp in Stockholm. Uh, it was basically the same team when we won the Cup 01, plus a few other extra guys. And Pete announces there that he's retiring. And we were like, what? Wow. Uh, no, one, no, no one saw it coming. So we were in Sweden right then. Actually, the, the camp uh, training camp was cut short because of 9-11. So uh, the t- Twin Towers went down and we left uh, uh, Europe earlier because of that but pete pete had a prior that in, in sweden he had a, a press conference and announced retirement i mean like wow what's what's going on here so pete missed the whole so had a tough but, night at cafe oprah <laughs> yeah yeah like yeah 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 we spent some time there uh, <laughs> and, and uh so pete announces retirement misses the whole season then he comes back and he's 
it just lights out in the uh, you know in in uh, in, in uh, playoffs. He's probably you know I don't know what he average two points a game or something like that in playoffs, missing the entire season. Like it's you know who can do that? Like it's just unbelievable, impressive. So at the time, I mean, was that already the beginning of the foot injuries that really plagued the rest of his career, where where, where he was almost yeah yeah, yeah it okay was, it, it was part of it. Like he was dealing with some pain and 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 it was just you know too annoying for him and. Uh, and he, he called it a quits there. And, wow. and and we just won the cup, right? And then we're just kind of ready to go for another run. And and you're, you know, arguably the best player is gone. You're like, whoa, that's that was that was a massive blow. Was that was Theo Flurry your first roommate on the road? Yeah. Uh uh after no, Theo was not the first roommate, but once we got him on a tri- uh in on a deadline, yes, Theo was my my roommate. Yeah, what a beauty that guy is. Oh, my. You guys had quite a few characters on that team. Claude Lemieux, too. So there was never a dull moment. No, it, it was not. It was uh, definitely a live locker room, and it, it was fun. And, and obviously, when the team is winning, then everything, everything, is, all, everything is good. And, uh, and that, that, was, that was the case. It was a really fun atmosphere and fun to be around these guys. An insane character I've always heard is Sean Podeen. And, and he was the first guy, I think, to leave his equipment on for 24 hours after you guys <laughs> won it in 01. Like, did you know that that was going to happen? Or did you see him the next day? Like, dude, no, you have no, a shower no. yet? Yeah, yeah. Sean didn't didn't take his stuff. Uh, it was just, he just kept it on. So we're just going, uh, you know, through downtown with the cup. And, and Pod's got the, the whole full gear on for, uh, I think, like, yeah, all day, 24 hours, whatever it was. Yeah, it was uh, absolute beauty. But, like, what a what a clutch player too! Uh, uh, his line with uh, uh, was Eric Messier and Stefaniel, and uh, they were phenomenal. Like when when we need to shut down uh, other teams' opponent, the top lines, and or kill the last minute of the uh, of the game, uh, they were they were phenomenal and really big part of the the playoff, uh, the Stanley Cup run. And yeah, Pose was absolutely great guy. Uh, he's awesome. Just live, yeah, I think living back in Minnesota now. When I think back to that time period, I, I would say probably the biggest rivalry in the NHL became you guys and the Detroit Red Wings. Had that already started before you got there, or do you remember the exact moment when it when it did transpire? Well, actually, the, the nastiest stuff was before me. So my first year was 98-99 season, and uh, I want to say the big fight uh, the, when Lemieux and um, McCarty, I think it was 97, but it's, it was still uh, uh, still uh, – you know, massive rivalry. Uh, anytime we play them, even regular seasons, were just holidays for for everyone. People got into it both places, Denver or Detroit. Uh, and then uh, usually in the West, like uh, in you know the late '90s, you had basically four teams that battled it. Right? It was us, Red Wings, Stars, and Blues. There was other teams were not really factors that much. You know, there was pre pre salary cap era. These teams were spending and. Uh, this is what it was, and you you knew at some point you have to go through Red Wings, and then you you they knew it too. So uh, that's how you build a rivalry. When uh, year after year you meet them in the playoffs, you go you go distance, you go seven games, and and nasty stuff happens, and that's exactly what it was. Would you get a little extra nervous before those types of games, or or did you did you kind of well, embrace all the hate? Yeah, I kind of embraced it. Like you, you knew that these games matter more than than just regular, just on other games uh, for some reason. And 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 the the playoff series were awesome. Uh, just just the intensity, you know, the the playoffs intensity is already you know hyped up quite a bit, and and these games were even more. So uh, I think yeah, it had to be one of the best uh, rivalry in, in 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 hockey, you know, these days. I always wonder about guys who play with Patrick Waugh because there's times he's a snap show. There's times you can't score on him. I mean, was this somebody in practice you didn't even consider shooting high on? Like, would he come flying out at guys if they fucked with him? <laughs> yeah, like, usually rather keep it low. But, uh, yeah, Pat, Pat is such a competitive guy that, uh, you know, there, there, was some, there was some stuff, you know, sometimes destroying stuff in the locker room, stuff like that, when we didn't have the first or second good period, whatever, it happened. Uh, Patty was just passionate guy, but when the games was games were on the line, you want to have him in the net and on your side. And uh, uh, you know, you don't, you know, Patty won four cups, two with two with Canadians, two with, with the ass, and just just tough tough competitor. That 
he was he was passionate and yeah uh especially young guys rookies you you yeah you, you don't want to go near high or near his head or anything like that that's for sure was was he the vocal leader in the locker room uh one of them yeah there there, there was there was a bunch of guys but uh patty patty sometimes sometimes snapped there all right like things were not going well you we were not playing well and uh patty definitely uh, let you know that this is not acceptable. This is cannot continue. And uh, uh, yeah, he was he was one of them. Not not the leader, but one of them. During the uh, 2001 Stanley Cup, you guys are actually down uh, three games to two to the Devils. Did any panic set in the room at all? I know it was a lot of veterans in the room, but what, what was the room like after the, you guys were down in that series? Uh, well, obviously, uh, you know, you were out to be the, the you know uh, in the opposite situation when you're up three two but we we're three two going into New Jersey uh the, the Stanley Cup is ready there right uh for ceremony and uh and but we had a, such a veteran team that uh you know not many things really rattle us uh, uh that year we won the regular uh we won the president's trophy at 118 points I think we lost like 16 games that year so uh, the team is used to winning, and and even if you're down, down in in, in inside of the series or down in, in inside a game, it just didn't really rattle us that much. Uh, you have that, you know, when you're part of the winning team, so you have the the uh, the feeling, the the confidence in the locker room that nothing really rattles the team. So, and obviously, you can go the other way too when you're part of the losing teams. It, it, it's just exactly opposite. So, uh, but like you know, we had a veteran team, nothing really rattles all that much, and and and. I think uh, what was the game three nothing or four nothing? I think game six, something like that. Uh, and we sent it to game seven to Denver. And a legendary hockey moment of Joe Sackick handing the cup over to Ray Bork. I, I, I'm guessing nobody talked about that before the game. Joe didn't tell anyone because there was a game to be won. So how shocked were you, and how memorable was it to see Ray Bork that emotional with all his family there? Uh, very emotional. Uh, I, it was uh, it was basically it was actually Ray's second year with us. So uh, Ray spent uh, obviously the whole career in in in, uh, in Boston, and then then uh, we got him on a deadline one year, and uh, uh, the first year didn't work out. Second year uh, uh, we got it done, and it, it was it was such a treat to have Ray with us. Uh, you know, such a you know competitor. Like you really uh, could see. The preparation for the games and practices, what he did, uh, uh, how much it meant to him, and then uh, what it takes to uh, stay that long and and play that on that high level for such a long time. What he did, uh, it was definitely Ray was probably one of the reasons why we wanted to, but because uh, uh, everyone was pulling for him too. Not not like we want to just win for him, but uh, it was a big part of it. Uh, you uh, you could see like how much it means to him and. Uh, then you know, watching him crying, the, and the whole family crying when we won it, and uh, and Joe hanging the cup, uh, it was just uh, things that you'll remember the rest of your life. Um, some of the stories that our fans like to hear are the ones uh, not on the ice. Um, is it true that one uh, Halloween, Peter Forsberg dressed as Bill Clinton, and you went as Monica Lewinsky? <laughs> yes, that's that, that's 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 right. Yeah, How but, did you end up getting Monica? Yeah, like, uh, Peter, Peter wasn't uh, getting her. <laughs> Pete, Pete goes, yeah, do you have a costume for uh, for Halloween? I'm like, no, uh, I have one for you. I'm like, all right. Uh, <laughs> not, it was not, I, I didn't know it was going to be this one, but I'm like, all right, I'll go with it. Uh, so so this is what we, we did. What are some of the other like funny off-ice stories that you remember from your time in, uh, in Colorado? Like, are there any ones that pop out in your head of, of maybe silly situations you guys found yourself in? Because I feel like that period of time in the NHL, there was a lot more off the ice activities where the guys might be a little bit more tame nowadays. Uh, I, I think it was probably, I would definitely agree that it probably these days were uh, definitely probably more fun for the players than it's now. Uh, I'm not saying like it, it, it was less serious, but uh, I don't know. There's probably more money in it now, and uh, you know, guys, the eating habits, what they have, and everything is just uh, off the chart. That before it was kind of a little bit more loose. And uh, I remember there were some there were some trips that we were taking golf clubs with us, and you know, so trainers are loading up hockey equipment plus our golf st- golf stuff. So uh, guys didn't want to rent uh, rental clubs and just bring their own stuff. Uh, you know, 
a lot of stuff is probably not terribly uh, <laughs> some of it. So uh, it's just, uh, it, it were fun times. It, it was kind of running a uh, really family oriented club, kind of, kind of almost like a country club. When you're winning, everything is good. You could even tell because they ended up doing that like 24-7 style show on you guys. And I'll never forget, that was when you guys ended up picking up Paul Correa. And I forget who it was, but one of the guys was all over him about how cheap he was. Right, yeah. Well, Tamu. So we got Tamu Solani and, and Paul Correa from Anaheim, from Ducks. And yeah, Paul was telling, uh, uh, Tamu was telling us a story that uh, uh, Paul didn't, uh, you know, uh, spend a dime really. Whatever he made, he made forty million till that time, and then he still has got forty million in his in his account. Uh, I remember there was a, there was a, uh, one story when uh, uh, when when you check in on the road, and uh, so boys got uh, in the Paul Korea's room early, clean up everything there, and just put a crib there. Right, Paul was I don't know whatever he was, he was five nine, five ten. I don't know what he how tall he was, and. Uh, so everything is clean out, clean out of his room, and there's just crib sitting in the in the middle of his room. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that yeah. is good stuff, so, man. Yeah. He, yeah. He, he he had quite the the pre game uh, pre game routine though with how he stretched. Had you ever seen anything like that before? Like with all the yoga and he was doing. Yeah, uh, a lot of it he did actually in his hotel room uh, that we got from Tam was a lot of was telling us that what Paul does everything before the game there. And, uh, you know, he, when he was chewing his food, I don't know how many times he chew it before he swallowed it. And uh, like he, Paul had different things, obviously a phenomenal hockey player, but uh, just a little bit different approach that the rest of us uh, did, but work for him. He was, you know, uh, he's a hall of famer. So, yeah. I got to imagine some guys were probably teasing him and trying to mess with, mess with his routine a little as well. I even heard that if, if his uh, stick was a millimeter different than what he, he, he could feel it, he could pick it up and tell that it was off by one millimeter. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so yeah. Yeah. I was talking to uh, uh, trainers and uh, yeah. Like when, when, so Paul was using the two uh, that time uh, two it was all, there were no one piece sticks. So two piece to get a, whatever Eastern shaft and, and, and blade so when you when when you heat it up and, and put it together and rest it on the wall, it in his mind it it you know he thought like he's gonna change the change the angle a little bit and uh, it's gonna have a different lie. So they they're they're supposed to put putting the sticks opposite uh, the button down. So it, it when it cools down, it doesn't change the the lie, I guess. And, and there's probably something to it. Uh, just uh, you know, Paul liked liked his things and uh, and. Like I said, it worked for him. Uh, in, in looking over your career, just the numbers are, are, are outstanding. And I think 630 goal seasons, 140 goal season, but 0203, you win the Rocket Richard, you get 50 goals. At what point, 98 points, too. So like at what point in that season did you start thinking like 50 is realistic? Like, is it when you get 30 early on? Like, and were you even thinking about it at all? I think it was, it was the season, uh, uh, actually, when, uh, we didn't have a good start. I think in the fall, I think like November, uh, maybe December. Uh, I think Bob Harley got fired. Tony oh, Granado yeah. took over. Tony Tony took over. Tony Granado. Uh, he put a, a um, Forsberg, Tangy, and, and myself on the line, uh, and we start producing. And and we, I I want to say that we were probably the hottest. Uh, a line in, in the league that year. So everything starts clicking after, after Christmas and, and we're scoring a bunch of goals. And obviously you cannot put up the big numbers if, if the line or team is not clicking. And, and that's, you know, uh, it was, it was, uh, awesome combination. Uh, just we're all three different players and then just for some reason it worked out. And, uh, I remember I got, when, when I got closer to 50, I think at the end, I got like a seven, eight goals in the last four or five games. So eight, no I, way. Was not, I, was, yeah, I was not thinking 50 at all. and oh. scored a 50 on the, the uh, last game of the regular season. Uh, Pete, Peter won, uh, I think, uh, the scoring title. I think he got, uh, whatever, 110, 15 points or whatever he had. Uh, and, I, and I won. So actually, it was, it was kind of a race between uh, uh, Peter and Marcus Naslund. He, they were kind of fighting for the for the scoring title, and I think it was myself and Todd Bertuzzi or, or Naslund also with goals. It was it was getting close, and and uh, I scored uh, the 50th goal in the last game of the season. 
what a memory that must be. That's that's yeah. sick. Yeah, it was you, awesome. Yeah, you know, I know you were the C in Colorado for for a spell. Was that the first time you were ever a captain on any on any level? Uh, probably since PVs. Yeah. Uh, uh, obviously, I was I was the most experienced guy there. Uh, we didn't have a good year. Was, so probably like like early in my career, we had all these good teams and and, and everything was rolling. And then uh, and I got taste of the, some some lean years too. And uh, when we when we got the uh, you know it was this first second overall pick out of the season, so it was one of them. It was it was it was it was a, such a huge honor. But just we didn't have the good teams that you know these years and. Uh, uh, there was there was one of them, but definitely I enjoyed it. It was it was such a huge honor, and following the footsteps of uh, uh, Joe and 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 uh, and Footer, so it, it was great. And then basically I handed the C to to Andy, so uh, so that that was, that was that was cool. I was going to ask you about that. I mean, your numbers retired not just because of the early crazy offensive numbers in the cup, but later on you turned into the, the veteran that you kind of got to meet when you came over as a rookie. So, you know, Landis Scott, Paul Stasny, Ryan O'Reilly obviously isn't there anymore, but how cool was it for you getting to stay with the same team and then totally changing roles, even though it might've been a little tougher as the ice time started to dwindle a little bit. Yeah. 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 Definitely. You, 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 you see, you know, when the off- offensive production goes down and you, you start having different role and, uh, uh, you're kind of mentoring more the younger guys, but you know, you know, uh, yeah, I saw when the rise of the you know Matt Duchesne and, and uh, Ryan O'Reilly, Paul Sasney, uh, Landy, Landy came in, and uh, it was just kind of the rebuilding, the rebuild, basically what was happening, and and, and you know, I think the guys did a really good job, and obviously sometimes it takes uh, it takes a little bit of time and. Uh, so I was a captain one of you know one of the year that it was just uh, not the best situation the product on the ice but uh, uh, still a really good experience and 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 be part of the young group was was, was cool. We kind of glanced over Nagano and I mean I gotta imagine yeah. that celebration going back home with oh. the gold medal where you guys. I mean, I don't even know if you guys were expected to medal in that Olympics because it was the first time that NHL players were allowed to go. And then I believe you guys end up upsetting uh, the Team Canada. Gretzky doesn't shoot. I got to imagine you guys are probably like, what the fuck is going on over there? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, we're coming in. Uh, I don't know if we were even dark horse of the tournament. Obviously, we had some superstars with, with Hasek and, and Jager, uh, but, you know, Second half of the team are guys from Europe, like myself. At that time, I played in in Czech Republic. Uh, definitely coming in, there was no expectations whatsoever. It was really cool. Uh, first time ever, the uh, the NHL players players were allowed to uh, be part of the Winter Olympics, and uh, and we got in there and and, and started rolling. And uh, in in some uh, quarterfinals, we uh, we beat uh, loaded team in the United States. They just won. Was it '96? I get. I want to say they won the Canada Cup. They were loaded, right? And uh, and we beat them four-one. Just rolled them over. Uh, then Canada in the in the semis in shootout. Yeah, like you mentioned, Gretzky doesn't get picked for the for for the shootout, which kind of it, it was awkward. I'm like, where where's Wayne? And 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 he didn't go. Didn't didn't get the nod. I, uh, Wayne, he was at the end of his career, kind of. But still, uh, how do you leave him out? But you know. No Canadians score a goal against Hasek. And then uh, I think I want to say Robert Reichel got one against, against Patty Raw. And, and we went in the finals. And, uh, and in the finals, uh, just a tough grinding uh, match against Russia. And uh, and then uh, Peter Svoboda scored uh, uh, the only goal of the game. And uh, and uh, and we won the gold. And then, then you know, uh, obviously during the tournament, we, you kind of hear what's going on back home. And we got all these, you know, uh, emails and, and letters from from the fans and, and uh, the whole country went absolutely nuts. And uh, when when we flew from from uh, from Japan back to uh, back to uh, Prague, uh, the celebration was insane. It was just uh, uh, an awesome experience. You know, I mean, how many hundreds of thousand people waiting for us there, and uh, yeah, it was definitely the biggest uh, uh, you know hockey achievement what uh, Czech, Re- Czech Republic ever had. W- was that a private flight home or a commercial air <laughs> flight? Uh, it, w- it was the government plane. Okay, all right. They got your plane. <laughs> I, I figured that. You guys must have got wrecked. <laughs> yeah, absolutely crushed. Yeah, we were uh, we were uh, uh, 
you know, obviously a lot of celebration, drinking on the plane and jumping on the plane. And, uh, yeah, it was crazy. Uh, one of the assistant coaches didn't, did, uh, was not in the best shape. They, they had to carry him out on the stretcher, just absolutely <laughs> crushed. Uh, it just, uh, good memories. I would imagine that was, uh, given, especially the fact Patrick Waugh was a snap show, not something that you would brag about or bring up, uh, later when you guys ended up being teammates. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, yeah, well, you know, uh, brought it up a few times. Probably did not, <laughs> not, not Patrick's best, the best memories, but yeah, he had a plenty of good ones. But this one was not uh, probably not the best one. Um, I was just going to ask quickly before we get into we have uh, your your buddy Marty who how this whole interview ended up getting set up. Uh, do you remember your rookie party, your first year? Did you have to get up and, and tell jokes and or dress up? Or uh, I, uh, yeah, it was down in uh, in Tampa. So me and Chris Chris Drury were the rookies, and uh, we both had to uh, uh, sing national anthems. Actually, so Chris is uh, singing in the U.S. national anthems, and I was singing the Czech national anthem. So uh, that was that was the rookie party. Uh, it was fun. They're all obviously all all fun, but uh, uh, then uh, once you're not a rookie, you're enjoy- enjoying them more, right? All these mm-hmm. years when. Uh, the rookies are paying and you're having fun. And yeah. So it was all good. Awesome. Well, yeah. So uh, I had a friend from uh, Scottsdale, Corey works at the Fairmont and he said, Hey, would you guys be interested in getting Milan Hayduk on the podcast? I said, absolutely. So he ended up uh, putting me in touch with Marty here. Who's just hopped on. If you want to say hi. Hey guys. Hey Marty. What's up, Marty? Hey, how you doing, buddy? And, good, and good. what I found really cool was a story that Marty told me about how you guys originally met and now the charity work that you guys are doing. So I'm going to hand it over to Marty, and you guys are doing some amazing things. And I want you to kind of go to the full backstory as to how you guys bumped into each other at a rink in Denver and all this amazing charity work came to be. Yeah. Yeah, I'll take some of this, Milana, and um, you can jump in if you want. But um, uh, it was right when – Think Milan, you were getting ready to retire, not quite retired yet. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was uh, during the. Uh, that was the lockout. It was just a half season. We, I think we, uh, those we were locked out till like a January, I think. So that was during the time when I was coaching my, my kids' teams, right? That's when we met first time, I think. Yeah. So I was actually going to my my high level beer league hockey game and um and uh, rolling in and and. Uh, walking in with bag over my shoulder and I see this guy Milan Hayduk who I recognized instantly and um had two little kids next to him and on each side of him and I of course went up and and like any fan would would do that and introduce myself and I just started this charity to design to help hockey families in need about a year before that and and um uh introduced myself and he said man that sounds kind of cool and I told him about a young man that had just been paralyzed and it was a pretty tough stories uh, kid named Cody that has uh, had a few beers and um, college kid. He's 21. So nothing wrong with that. And he did what the right thing, what you'd hope your kids would do. He actually decided to uh, uh, call his buddy and have his buddy pick him up and pick his car up the next day. And, uh, and in a twist of irony, they, they drove all of two blocks and were hit T-boned by a, a drunk driver without insurance. And it changed Cody's life forever. It paralyzed him um at that point and and uh he was going through a really down time at the time he was a recipient of ours and I got to know him and his family and he literally chose to play hockey as a little boy um because of Milan Hayduk and so I told Milan that story and said would you um be able to sign something for this kid and and Milan instantly said yeah that'd be great and I didn't have anything so he said give me your phone and literally Milan put his phone number in my phone and hand it to me. I went down the locker room and told all the boys, I just got met Milan Hayduk and got his phone number. And they were like, whatever guys, that's like, that's like the hot chick in high school that gives you, (laughs) uh, it's really, it's, it's Taco Bell or something, but I got, but so the next morning I, I picked up the phone and, and Milan said, come by the the practice. And I, I called it and sure enough, it was Milan Hayduk. I was like, that's pretty sweet. So um, ended up, Showing it is showing up at his practice that day where, like you said, he was on, on a lockout and coaching these little guys and he came out and, um, and I had a jacket on with the dog logo on kind of right on, uh, with like the shirt I got on right here. And, um, and he said, wait a minute. And he went to his puck bag and he reached in and unbelievably pulled out a dog nation puck. And he goes, I didn't know what this was for. 
And I, so he goes, tell me a little bit more about it. Cause our meeting was super brief in the lobby of this rink. And so I told him about it. He goes, that's really cool. And he signed a couple things for Cody. And then um, uh, I said, would you be up for doing, picking up the phone and calling him? And um, I know he'd be blown away. I, we're not going to use your phone. So he's not going to have your, your cell phone number and we'll call him off of mine. And Cody answered and it wasn't a zoom or anything. So it's just a voice. And, and I handed it to Milan and he's, uh, I can't even imagine Cody on the other one. He's, this is Milan Hayduk. And uh, oh. I was, uh, I, I, I know it probably meant the world. I, yeah, I know for sure it meant the world, Cody, but uh, I thought it'd be a two minute, not even that 30 second conversation. But, but uh, this guy that you're talking to right here, he told me, he said, um, you know, okay, if I, I can't hear very well, I'm going to take this in the coach's office. And he went in and, Two minutes went by, five minutes went by, 10 minutes went by. And I was thinking Milan Hayek just stole my cell phone. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, he came out a, uh, after that and and he kind of had tears in his eyes. And I said to him, I said, thank you for doing that. And Milan looked back at me and said, thank you for letting me do that. And and uh, that's really kind of when our friendship started. And and uh, he asked me if I ever see Cody. And I said, you know, he's really down right now. So um i'm actually going to pick him up tomorrow uh or go drive up to his house tomorrow he lives lives quite a bit north uh, north end of denver and and um i'm going to take him out for beers and pizza he's got we were with our charity able to buy him a van a handicapped van that can lift it lift his wheelchair into the van and this and that and and um and because milan said does he drive i said no he can't drive but i can drive so i just he's got to just make teach me how to use the lift and so we did that and or i i said that to milan and he said can i go and i said are you serious and he goes yeah i want to go and so the next day in my office got a call from um marty richardson you have milan hey duke at the front desk and all my buddies were punching me in the shoulder like whatever dude and they all snuck down and checked it out and sure enough milan hey duke was in my office so now <laughs> And, wow. and that was really how we met, right, Milan? And we had a great night that night. And we found out on that drive a ton of stuff we had in common, too, that was really weird. Yeah, absolutely. And then I, I got to tell you guys, Marty's doing a phenomenal job uh, with this with this uh, Dog Nation Charity Hockey Foundation. It's uh, It's been a blast to be part of it, really. Uh, and then, like Marty said, it started with, with Cody. And over the years, we've met, you know, so many people that, that need our help and, uh helping families that it's just it's just crazy how many bad things happen to people and, and freak accidents and all kinds of things that's uh, it's just uh it, it's crazy and it, it, it's really nice to be uh part of this organization and then and, and try to help out when we can it's uh it's really it's been it's been really uh, uh awesome experience me and i'm happy to 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 help I'm actually on the website right now, Marty and, and, and Milan. It's just a really, really cool situation that you guys have going here. You see all the, ability, all the fundraisers in progress. You can donate to all these different individuals. So anyone, dognationhockey.org. This is, this is really impressive what you guys have done. What's the, what's the ultimate goal? I think you were telling me, Marty, that you guys want to create a facility where you, you guys could kind of host any type of, whether it's a paraplegic athlete and just mm -hmm. kind of get everybody and more people involved in the game of hockey. Yeah. Thanks Biz, for that. Um, uh, really this thing has grown to proportions that we never, ever, uh, thought. And, um, few years back, I was an international finance director for a little company called Oracle. And that's where, that's actually when I met, what I was doing when I met, met uh, Milan. And since then, I've, I've stepped away from that to really honestly try and change the world. And as Milan was mentioning there, Cody was just one of literally hundreds of people. We've, we've now uh, uh, been blessed to hand out checks for over $3 million to lots of families. And, and a few of those family actually are from Humboldt, Saskatchewan. So uh, we've, uh, we've, we've been tied into to that. I've been up to Humboldt a couple of times now. They actually recently asked me if Dog Nation would consider an annual scholarship to a, a aging out player each year that most represented what we do as a as a charity and of course we're going to do that scott barney their head coach is i've got to know him really well and that was his his brainchild of that so where we're what we were taking on this and it was getting so big and so 
I'm looking at this going, I'm not getting any younger. And it's really, really labor intensive type thing because we raise our money through events. And um, and so I thought, boy, this is going to be tough. But at the same time, I had started to meet some sled hockey players on disabled vets and kids that were, were born with deformities and different things like that. And they just kind of blew me away. I started volunteering with these guys. And then I started introducing them to guys like Milan and, and some of the other guys. And, and at the, at the same time, I kind of came up with this idea a few years back and Milan was really one of the very first guys I told about it. And I said, what if we built a place that was for men, women, boys, girls, able-bodied, disabled, young, old, truly, truly a place where hockey truly is for everyone. Not just saying it, like truly is. And what if we then went to a municipality and were able to get land? What if we went to a general contractor, an architect, and a mechanical engineer and said, would you want to be part of this community project? And building this rink as much as possible through the hearts of, of just thousands of people, really what Dog Nation is, and then then run this rank later, not raising money for Milan and I's um, pocketbook, but to perpetually give money back to the community forever and ever and ever, every single year. And so, believe it or not, the city of Castle Pines, uh, they have made the largest land donation in their history. The, this is a very wealthy area in Colorado and um, pretty close to where Milan used to live. And um, uh, Cindy and I are looking at places down in that area. But this piece of land is worth about $5 million, 12 oh, acres, oh, to, to, uh, to put this right on the main drive in, in, in Denver. And also, this is where USA Hockey is located and the U.S. Olympic Committee. And there, there's a lot of ties and ties with this and a lot of military in Colorado as well. And so um, we've also gotten very big, the largest, uh, one of the largest GCs, Saunders Construction, raised their hand and stepped up. So did MOA Architecture, MTech Engineering. We have about 30 companies that all said that we'll do our part. And so I'm in the midst of raising a lot of money to try and, well, try to raise a lot of money and, and, uh, and build this magical arena. And it's a lot further along than people realize. And, and we actually have a second website there. Thanks for jumping on that other one, but it's called Hockey's Heart dot com and hockeysheart.com shows a video of really what we're trying to do and may, you guys may recognize the voiceover the voiceover on it is peter McNabb, who's um recently uh uh he, he's he's in remission on a cancer battle himself right now but he's been very involved in this organization um almost as long as milan and so that's really what we're trying to do Incredible. That, that's an incredible thing. And without you starting it and then without running into Milan and that rink, who knows if it's as big as it is. So we, yeah. we appreciate more than anything, your guys contribution to charity and helping out others. What an, what an amazing message. And Milan, thank you so much for sharing your story an incredible career with your number hanging in the rafters. So we, we appreciate both you guys very much. Yeah. Thank you guys for having awesome. us. All Thanks right. guys. Good luck with everything. All right. Thank, thank you care. very much guys. Thank you very much to Milan Hayduk, Avs legend. We appreciate you coming on. It was a joy to talk to you. And I want to remind everyone that interview was brought to you by TaylorMade. Are you ready for the ultimate giveaway? We're teaming up with our friends from TaylorMade for the ultimate season opening sweepstakes and giving away 50 prizes to 50, 50 different winners. 50 prizes include everything from the grand prize, a full bag of new TaylorMade clubs to a new stealth driver to TP5X golf balls and everything in between. Now through May 10th, go to tailormadegolf.com slash barstool sweeps to enter and celebrate this season's first major and the unofficial start to the golf season. That's tailormadegolf.com slash barstool sweeps. The sweeps is running across a number of podcasts within the Barstool Network, and we want our loyal followers to win. So head over to tailormadegolf.com slash barstool sweeps right now for your chance to win, and be sure to hit let them know that you heard it from us at Spit and Chicklets. Make this golf season better and fill your bag with the best. Of course, that's TaylorMade. Wonderful, Reed. Thank you. Appreciate that. Way to crush it, Wit. Um, Wit, speaking of golf, uh, who, who was the guy who just won this past weekend? Pretty emotional uh, celebration with his fiance, wife. That, that's Scotty Scheffler, who's been like the perfect example of somebody who just kind of needs to get one win and then they explode. He's been he's been a stud his entire life. He's the kid who grew up playing on the U.S. Junior Ryder Cup team. Like 
you know, probably one of the top recruits in the country played at Texas. I believe that course, Austin country of where's where the university of Texas plays. I might be wrong there, but he won the Phoenix open. He won the waste management, whatever that's called in Scottsdale. And then he went to um, Bay Hill, Arnold Palmer, Arnold Palmer's tournament on this ridiculously tough, like greens are rock hard. Fairways are tiny one there. And then he just went to Austin country club. It's like 6,600 yards and wins the world match play becomes the number one player in the world by winning. And he didn't have a win. His first win was waste management like a couple months ago. Now he's got three in what? Two months, three months. Wow. And the, the moment with his dad, hugging his dad was so great. And every single parent, that has an athlete should witness it because the first thing his dad says, I'm kind of paraphrasing, paraphrasing. He says, I'm so proud of who you are as a person, like not your golf. Like you were just such a great person. I love you so much. Congrats basically. But it was more about, I remember my dad telling me a lot too. Like it, it, it's all about who you are as like a person and how you treat people. And you're no better than some kid who's a very successful clarinet player or you're no better than someone who doesn't even play sports himself it's just like it's how you treat people it's how you live your life and that Sheffler kid seems like a genuinely really nice guy who does a lot for others and I guess you see with his father's quote to him as they celebrated becoming the number one golfer in the world like why he's like that so my buddy actually bet on him to win the masters like six six seven months ago and I think he got him at 50 to one and right now he's like 18 to one or something like crazy odds. My, my, my buddy has on him because he's probably one of the favorites going in there and his, his major career. I think he had, I think he's got, you know, four or five top tens in majors, maybe three or four, but just a, a, a superstar that, that is not going away anytime soon. He was the 12th guy. He was the last pick to make the Ryder cup at whistling straights in, in September, October. And a couple of months later, he's number one player in the world. So it was an awesome, awesome victory for him. Although my one buddy had 300 bucks to win 15 grand on Kisner winning. And uh, so he got all the way to the final. He hedged it a little bit, but still, he, he it was a huge payday if he could have got it done. Masters yeah, coming up. That's huge. Huge. I can't wait. I cannot wait. Masters is my favorite sporting event. Th- this is the first time they're going to have fans back, right? No, they had they, they didn't have them for DJ. And then when Matsuyama won last year, they were there, but it wasn't the same at all. I believe they had a, a limited number of tickets. Um, this year, it'll be bumping. It'll be Fucking back. Right. The best thing I've ever experienced is going down to the Masters. The last it's, fun major I watched was the one that Nicholson watched when all the people were following him. Yeah, things have gone well for him since. <laughs> I wasn't teeing you up to say that, but I'm saying. No, when, that when, was that was great. That was um when that golf was said PGA. its best. Oh, oh, that, there's a reason I brought up the Masters. Well, not only because you said it, but apparently Tiger's training so he could actually finish the, the whole like the whole tournament. I saw that, too, where his caddy's down at Medalist where he plays in Hope Sound, Florida, outside Jupiter, and they're walking the course every day. You know, these guys usually play and take carts and stuff. He's got his caddy and he's walking. And on the Masters website, it already lists – because. When you win the Masters, you're, you're allowed to play for the rest of your life. You have a lifetime invitation to play until they pretty much tell you, like, hey, uh, your time's up. I think that Mickelson's name is listed as a former champion not playing, and Tigers is not. So he has not said he's not playing yet. He's probably walking because the problem with Augusta and him, it's so hilly. And I mentioned that in the JR interview that obviously hasn't played yet, but I couldn't believe going there and watching it on TV does no justice. I'm talking the elevation changes at this course are mind boggling. Really? When you I step have no through. clue either. Dude, 10th hole, it, it must go downhill 300 yards. Like it looks like a ski slope. I know. And on TV, you don't, and the ninth hole goes down and then it goes up about 60 feet to the green. It, I had no idea. So I think the walking part of four rounds there is just like what Tiger really you know, won't be able to handle if he doesn't play. But the fact that he's walking medalist and trying to give it a go is, is awesome. Cause just to have him at the masters would be sick. Yeah. That, and, and probably the, um, what's the word I'm trying to look for here. The I adrenaline. If, if he was able to get through the first two days and make the cut, the adrenaline alone would take him through the next two days. If he was able to, if he won that tournament with what has happened to him, would that be the greatest comeback of all time? I think his win in 19 was the greatest comeback of all time. And this would be just 
Uh, yeah, this guy, it's like I said he'd never win again, and he won the match. He's going to so win like, it. I have like, no clue. Amputate his own arm and then win it again. Like, he's just like, he's just a freak, this guy. Anyway, we can move on to hockey talk. Sorry, that, yeah. that tailor made ad took a turn. Well, Scheffler is yeah. a tailor made guy. He was pounding the new stealth driver in three woods. The carbon, sense. the carbon stealth? Yes. <laughs> the red face monster. Well, what you just uh, mentioned, a superstar not going away anytime soon. And I think that applies to New Jersey Devils forward Jack Hughes. This kid's been on an absolute tear. Uh, he figured it out pretty quick after a Ricky campaign that, you know, maybe had a few hiccups with. He's got 54 points in uh, 46 games this year, at least a point in 17 of the last 20. 1.16 points per game. Uh, he had two goals and a shootout goal versus Montreal this Sunday. What, why do you think this kid figured it out so quick? I think he's super skilled. Um, I think he's growing into his body, which is kind of what everyone said when they first saw him, and he looked like he's 15 years old. I think Still his does. vision's off the charts. And while some people chirp Tom Fitzgerald for giving him that contract, Biz mentioned at the time it could turn out to be a big bargain, and, and it looks like that's going to be the case. Now, New Jersey's got a long way to go before they're a contending team, but while at times questioning if he was going to be a true superstar number one pick, which a, a team really needs to change the entire organization makeup, I think that he might get there because the, the season he's having, it's out of this world. He's still very young. Uh, Quinn's a great player. And then watching his brother, Luke on Michigan is the kid. He's a freak. He's up for the Hobie Baker. He's a freshman defenseman. So they have Owen power, the first overall pick. And then Luke Hughes, the fourth overall pick Luke's the one up for the up, up for the Hobie. I still would take Owen power. If I was taking one to start my team, uh, he's bigger, probably better defensively, but Luke Hughes with the puck. It just shows biz. Talk about father sperm. This Hughes family has three NHL like star players that are coming up and um, Jack Hughes has been awesome. It's great to watch him. He just needs some help there. Yeah. Look out for his father's lids at Kiwasabi. Um, <laughs> no, I actually got to uh, correct you. I think an apology is in order. I was, I, I don't want to say I was critical. I was just weary of saying uh, at the time, I think that he had less than 80 career NHL points, maybe even fewer than that. I can't exactly remember what the exact number was when they handed over the eight times eight. And I said, I don't think that you have to do this in this situation. Why wouldn't you let the season play out? Well, it's probably a good thing they didn't because they probably would have had to sign him for fucking nine or 10 sheets a year, given with what he's done. Since 52 signed- points when they signed him, Biz. 52, 52 career 52 points. points. And I was the one questioning. It. I said, why wouldn't you just let him play out the year and see what you got? So at this point now, I would turn the criticism to his agent and fire him for taking too much of a bargain. <laughs> Wait, before the season, Galaxy I said brain. that uh, he was going to have a monster year. Oh, you're you the best. kind of gave me some shit for it. Do you think this qualifies as a monster year? Well, you deserve, you deserve an apology is what you're saying. Yeah, I think I deserve uh, an apology because um, then we came to the agreement of a point per game. So I'm, I'm not I'm judge. not I'm not willing to give you an apology right now. I'm just not. But if you said he's going to have a monster year, this qualifies as a monster year. Yes, he's got 54 points in 46 games. He's playing phenomenal. Yes. I mean, he's having a monster year. I'll give you that. But I'm not saying sorry. That is not an apology. I'm going to apologize for to Fitzy for saying that they should have waited to sign him. They got him at a bargain based on how he's performing this season. Because if he would have finished the season the way that he's going now, they would have had to pay him more money than that. So I was wrong. I'm, I'm a man. I'm a man uh, who can admit his mistakes. Uh, wait, while we took a pee break, I got a text. Um, uh, Denver's going to be in town next week for the national championship. Well, I should say the frozen four. And I, I had a request. What's the best steakhouse and the best Italian restaurant in Boston. And uh, I was curious what you would give for recommendations. So I, uh, the new moo, in the seaport, I believe, is an unreal steakhouse. M O O, like the the noise a uh, a cow makes. <laughs> and on Beacon uh, Hill too, right? Sorry. Yes, yes. There's one right near the state house, but the new one is phenomenal. I'd head over there. And the best Italian I've had. Um, just recently, I went to Contessa, which is at the Newbury Boston Hotel, right near um, the end of Boylston there, in the beginning of Newbury. Just yep. an incredible restaurant. So those two. Take um, take someone, take someone there, or just have somebody else pay. <laughs> no, I, I mean, literally, just got the text. I said uh, for a steakhouse, and I know it's you know not like off the grid, but Abe and Louis. I've never had a bad steak at Abe and Louis. 
and best Italian food, uh, Antonio's on Cambridge Street. It's not in the North End. I know everybody loves the North End, and they do have great restaurants, but Antonio's right on Cambridge Street, went right across from Mass General. If you've never had it, it's some of the best Italian in the city, so always tell people to go there. So, Biz, the city of Boston is fucking over the North End so bad, you wouldn't believe this. So, like, oh. when COVID came, um, all the restaurants were allowed to have outdoor dining, which was great because like in a lot of parts of the city, like all of a sudden you could have meals outdoor where you usually weren't able to. And the North End, the North End's the Italian area of Boston. I was there. Awesome. I was hanging out there. It was awesome. Oh, OK. Yeah. So cool. little Hanover Street's awesome. Well, now yep. they like shut down part of the street. I think they made it a one way. They had they had restaurants outside. People love the vibe in the summer there. The city of Boston has charged every single restaurant in the North End seventy five hundred dollars to have outdoor dining, and nowhere else in the city has to pay it. Fucking, it's joke. one of the biggest jokes joke. I've and, ever and, seen. And the in that area, what started to cut you off? It, it didn't overwhelmingly vote for the mayor too. So that, that there's that element too. It's like, all right, why why are you singling out the North End? Over I, every I, other neighborhood would find. I saw crazy. Foley. I saw Foley bitching about it on Twitter, and I agreed with him. And and it's just, and then somebody tried to come out with an article or something saying like, "Oh, these restaurants are profiting big time." It's like the the profit margins for these restaurants are not what people would think they are, and that's a fucking joke. That is just like joke. if it's all right. If you want to do it, like I don't agree with it, but make the whole city do it. Like it's just nuts that they blatantly go after this one area. It, so. It, Shout out my boy Frankie fucking getting hosed over. It's a joke. And they take it like, yeah, they've taken pocket spots. Big fucking deal. Like people pay a dollar an hour for meat is like, who cares? You'd rather be taking restaurant income and then fucking somebody's BMW on a spot for six fucking hours. Like it is stupid. What it, it, they are picking on the North end. So they should I, put bike bike lanes in there. Instead uh, of being able to drive. Motherfucker. Don't get me started. All right. We can move back to hockey. Like you said, Biz and, Time for the weekly Roman Yossi segment of bowing down to him. He remains red hot. A 13-game point streak, a 10-game assist streak. Uh, he's just the fifth defenseman in NHL history to reach 80 points in 64 games of fewer. Paul Coffey, Bobby Orr, Dennis Podman, Al McGinnis, the only guys to do it. Just the second predator to hit 80 points in the season after Paul Correa. Also three points shy of tying Bobby Orr's record for most points in a calendar month with 31. If he has one more point in March, he'll tie Paul Coffey for second all time. Sorry, I'm running out of breath here because what he's done is amazing. Uh, and his call the segment with Jonesy. Uh, Keith Jones, our buddy, agrees he should be the call the winner. Biz, what's your Holy take? fuck, R.A. It's the Sorry. Norris Trophy. What I'm, I'm, I know. I actually Not wrote, the Calder. You know, I, you're, I know. And I actually wrote Calder on the fucking outline. Are you shit-faced? No, no, no. I wrote Calder on the thing. I wrote Calder okay. on, the, on the thing. I okay. literally wrote Calder and nobody. Well, can it. I take this quickly before Biz? Because Biz has every right to talk about no, it. No, I'm not I, even going to trash you. I just, I, I was I, just trying to bring up the debate when we, when we sat down. I think we were even in Atlanta. And I actually was surprised you didn't give me the Will Smith special because I kept touching your arm to explain to you that, like, he oh, I watched that on video. And I was like, I didn't even realize. Like, I really was like so thinking about what I was going to say back to you. I can't believe you were touching my arm like that. That was the biggest disrespectful move. <laughs> You might as well slap me in the face instead of like, I, I, touching my I arm. That's you. how I talk to Ryder. Like, please put the toy down. Yeah. You, you, All you I'll say me. is this. Yossi, I'm still not giving him the award. And you know why? Because I talked to some guy that already made leave dinner named Wayne Gretzky, who said not only is Makar the Norris Trophy winner this year, he's the Hart Trophy winner. So as long as Wayne Gretzky's agreeing with me, I don't give a fuck what you have to say. Roman Yossi, what a season. Those numbers are sick. They're a joke. They make me want to puke how good he's been. But I got the great one saying that not only is my guy the Norris winner, he's also the MVP of the league. So everyone could take it and shove it up their hoop. My only argument was it shouldn't have been handed over at that time to where I think right now, unbiased, take Nashville fans out of it and take Colorado fans out of it. I would say you have a dead heat till the finish at this point right now. I think analytically you give slight tiny edge to Kale McCarr, but it's, it's hard because like if, if your bias is towards Roman Yossi, you're going to use the analytics that elevate him based on, and then, and then vice versa. Right. Um, I actually think since the last two, three weeks have gone by, I think that he has a better chance of winning the heart 
than he does the Norris Trophy. I you can't that, win one and not the other. Okay, but or the heart, not the Norris. And, 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 and I was going to draw it back to the year that Taylor Hall dragged his team into playoffs with the New Jersey Devils, where people, other people thought, I think McKinnon should have won it that year for the same type of reason, how dominant their team was. And he was the leading their team in scoring by a wide margin and maybe even the league. Not exactly sure on that, but what he's doing for that team right now, they might end up being in a wild card situation with not for his play. They're not a playoff team. There's I have no, no way. argument for that. All he's I have 14, is Gretzky. 14 points ahead of the next guy on his team, and he's a defenseman. And you're talking about all these other guys that he's category in the categories with. If he ends up like breaking the amount of points in, in the month of, of March, uh, surpassing these, these Hall of Fame names, I think that if, if, even if you are a Colorado Avalanche jock sniffer, you seem like an absolute fool if you're not telling me at this point right now with what he's done that it's a dead heat down the finish. That's so you're all calling I- Wayne Gretzky a fool, Biz? No. no. Oh, join the club. Uh, <laughs> fuck, me and R.A. He's never going to come back <laughs> on the podcast I, now. I didn't come no, I'll I interview him alone. I just said OT is... Have no, but but no, no. We also never had the conversation of of whether about the heart situation. He said the Norris. No, he, no, no. Right, no. and then he added he should probably be ahead for the heart. But but that was also what we interviewed him ten days ago. Yossi's been on a fucking heater since. I, Yossi's been on a heater since I said that Car was the yeah. guaranteed winner. It might have started like three games before I said that. It's nuts. This, this all was I'm a heated saying conversation is conversation that night. All I'm saying is it should be a dead heat right now. I think that's at least the courtesy you can give to Roman. Oh, I'll take that. For what he's accomplished. I'll take that. I'll gladly take that. That's all I want from all of you fans. Nashville fans are going to lose it if we don't pick UFC Colorado, if we don't pick McCarr. Even if McCarr gets over 30 goals, I completely understand. I just... You, if it if if Yossi continues on this pace and so does McCarr, you're they should be co-winners. And I don't know if that's ever happened. I don't know if it's possible to happen. You would all the writers have to vote, right? So it's very unlikely that that they would end up sharing it. But they should rig it somehow where both guys should get to lift that trophy. When's MVP the last- and Norris this year is a crazy good race, though. Crazy good race because I think I think Cider has the Calder, and I think that. Shesterkin, or I know Shesterkin has the Vesna, but the MVP and, and the Norris is going to be very exciting. And I saw Elliot Friedman mention that this year they're going to do the awards in between game three and four of the Stanley Cup final in this city that um, is hosting those those three games, three and four. So that's pretty cool. You know, there's not going to be the Vegas award show. They're going to go back to that for the uh, the, the 22-23 season. But this is going to be pretty exciting and a, and a nice little action-packed uh, day off in between the Stanley Cup finals. Hopefully we'll be there for that. Yeah, it's a, a unique way to do it, uh, with, especially to one hour, because I think the show's been too long. I know, like, it's not always the most entertaining show. So also well, they got, like, Millie Vanilli doing the musical act. So, girl, you know, it's true. <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, either way, yeah, NHL Awards at, at a normal time, a normal place. So uh, we'll see what ha- who is in the finals back then. Biz, I know you want to talk about the Blackhawks. Uh, Jonathan Taves. Patrick Kane, they re, uh, reacted to the trades that were made. Jonathan Taves said, um, it's become pretty clear the direction we're heading in as a franchise. I'm not going to lie. It was disheartening to see a couple good friends go. Regardless of what's to come in the future, I think this group has been through quite a bit this year on and off the ice. Obviously, life's been weird. It's been hard for a lot of people. Uh, and then Patrick Kane said about the Hagel trade, a uh, bit of a shocking move and that the future is, quote, a discussion for another day or over the summer, whatever it is. I'm happy here right now, and I'm just going to try to finish the season strong. Uh, Patrick Kane also had his 14th career, 20th goal season, tied Stan Mikita for team record, and only the second U.S. born player to do the same. Mike Badano, Keith Kachuk also did it as well. But, boys, I don't think it's going to be a shock at all if either one or both of these guys are traded before their deals are up. What, uh, you agree or what? I do agree. Um it's crazy to think of these guys not on the Blackhawks. And I think obviously Kane's going to get a lot more. Do you try to trade them as a tandem if that's what's going to happen? More than anything, though, was the displeasure you could tell in Taves' voice about 
not really being told and talked to about the, the Hagel move and how they Davidson had mentioned he was going to be in discussion with both of them moving forward for all these different moves, which I don't necessarily agree with. Like you take over a team, it's going to be really hard if you're like taking the input of these two players with every single move you make. It's like to, he kind of handcuffed himself a little bit with that statement when he was hired at his press conference. Now, I, these guys deserve the respect of getting to talk about what's going to be their future, where they could end up going, what the team is looking at in terms of, do we need to get rid of these guys to start a full rebuild? I think that they're better off trying to get what they can for these guys and really kind of cutting ties. And I know that's going to crush some Chicago Blackhawks fans hearts and forever. These two, their, their numbers will be retired. They'll forever be legends for this city. It's the only captain Chicago, a lot of Chicago fans have ever had in, in Jonathan Taves, but that team's not going to win a Stanley Cup in a long time. And you might as well get back to trying to redo it all. And I know that sounds crazy. And I know Patrick Kane may never want to leave. And in that case, he will not have to leave. That'll be up to him. But where are you going to go? How are you going to go about retooling and re- rebuilding what they had with what's going on there now? So I don't know how it's going to end. But I think that if you're trying to get Patrick Kane... This summer, you're going to have to pay a boatload. And with what you could get for him and Jonathan Taves, you can really start a true rebuild in Chicago. Yeah, you don't really want to slow death either. You want to get it over exactly. as quick as possible. So, and you, know, you, you mentioned it. Taves has the right to be frustrated. Um, it's also hard at the fact that it's new management and old management had made some moves. Um, you know, we could go through the list of them, the Panarin, blah, blah, blah. And they, they really put themselves between a rock and a hard place. And on top of that, also paying these guys as to what they deserved on what they earned. But like you said, like Taves, Taves isn't playing up to his 10 million. And like, he's got to be self-aware of that. Will there be some salary retained to where if he does go play somewhere third line center on a good team where they, they end up putting on a T for him where he can go maybe even compete for another cup. And you mentioned package deal potentially. I don't think that, I mean, I think the, the return could be a lot more, especially if you're going to go through those dog, dog days. You might as well have a shit team, accumulate all these types of draft picks, retain the salary, and it might even be a situation where you're just getting to the floor by, by, you know, by doing so. But it's, yeah, it's, it's just... It's, fuck the time has come. It, time, it happens. It, it happens. It's over. It's and over. Honestly, it may not have happened without some horrific moves, Right because the team was completely mismanaged since 2015. Maybe this wouldn't have had to happen, and maybe they would have been able to do it the way the Bruins are doing. Now, granted, the Bruins have one cup. They have three, so it's different. But they're going to have to go through a full rebuild there. And it's also hard for them as superstars and what they've done for the organization because probably looking back even three years ago, they had it in their minds how it was all going to play out. It was going to be the storybook ending. So the bitterness in his voice, I can understand, but... At this point, it's like, hey, man, it was a pretty good run. You ended up getting your dough. Yeah, let's see. What, let's. And see they have one can... year left, correct? Yes, correct, correct. But okay, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'd be shocked if both of them are still there. And and the thing is, too. Also, I don't understand how people are still surprised when a guy gets traded. I mean, Bobby O has been traded. Tom Brady's been traded. Wayne Gretzky's been on four teams. I just, I don't, I don't understand why people are still shocked. I don't think anybody would be shocked at this point. Yeah. Me neither. Okay, sunk. <laughs> All righty then. Uh, let's move right along. The LA Kings had a bunch of injuries lately, Biz, but they're still holding court uh, in second place in the Pacific Division. Let's see here. Uh, Phil Deneau, his signing was huge, man. 21 goals. His previous high was 15. He's been on the line with Arvidsson and Trevor Moore. But the guy you're going to hear from Shirley having a career high in goals and points with 16 games to go. He's got 28 goals. Uh, 13 assists, 41 points. Adrian Kempe, we'll get to him shortly. But also these rookie demon have come in. Uh, Sean Dersey, Jordan Spence, uh, rookie forward Rasmus Kupari. They've come in, they filled in these holes because, man, they've lost like eight, nine guys. That's a big deal uh, when you're a team coming on, off a, a, a shitty season to be able to maintain. And the Kings have done that. And also congratulations to Todd McClellan. He coached his 1,000th game uh, the other night versus Seattle. And honestly, he should get strong consideration with the Jack Adams, not just because I bet him for it, but this team is a team nobody expected. Paul, I'd say to be second place in the Pacific, and they are right now. They got to be up there for most man games lost due to injury and some pretty impactful players to their lineup. Uh, You mentioned all these names, and 
guys before the season, I had no idea who these guys were. And, um, you know, I, I've harped on it before. I played in the organization. Uh, their drafting and develop, development is second to none. Uh, they've done a heck of a job. And the fact that battling through all these injuries, these guys have been able to come in and contribute. And on top of that, having a guy like Kempe finally really, really pop off. Um, you know, I, I asked him in this interview about, you know, you know what maybe what took so long. And he, he mentions getting shuffled around and really, you know, bouncing from line to line and never really being able to develop any type of chemistry. And it seems like Todd McClellan has really understood his players put these guys in the right situations in order to succeed. He's gotten the trust from Rob Blake uh, along with, I mentioned those awesome draft and develop players. Uh, it seems like Quentin Byfield's continually slowly to take, you know, step after step and, and, and getting in a good rhythm. So I tell you what, man, and, and on top of that, Cal Peterson, and I know that the back half of the season has not necessarily gone as planned for Quickie, but he's such a good teammate and a great mentor that he's been able to hand over those reins as he has struggled. And there has been that slow development for Cal Peterson where he wasn't just thrown into the fire. So just a collection of all those things has led this team to still be in the mix. And I would be lying if I didn't say that I thought they were going to end up like Anaheim where they were going to fizzle off, even if they were able to remain healthy. But who am I to doubt? You know, former Stanley Cup champions like Drew Doughty, Ozzy Kopitar, and as Kempy's going to talk about a guy who, as far as Kopitar who has really, really helped him take that next step. And um, it's um, yeah, I'm I'm happy for that group. Obviously, they have a place in my heart, and I'm I'm really happy at the success that they had. They've had, and I I, I like when you know teams that have been out of the mix for a little bit are are now back in in uh, the mix in the playoff picture. So we're gonna get a little bit of insight from Kempe. He's not the he's he's not a, a huge talker. I I might have heard four words from him in the in the entire time that I played for him. Um, but uh, you know he'll he'll give you a little insight as to what's going on with the team and and all that chemistry that they have developed and how much they get along off the ice. So they got a, they got a really tight knit group there. With this, well said, and uh, we do want to let you know that this interview is brought to you by Roman. Newsflash: You suck in bed. That's why you use Roman, the secret to longer lasting sex. Guys, we've all been there. I mean, come on, it happens. So check out Roman swipes. They're a clinically proven way to last longer in bed. They're effective, easy to use, and fast acting. And the best pod. You don't have to go to CVS and let everybody know that you're a dupe pump jump. Roman can ship swipes to you in discreet, unmarked packaging, and each swipes packet is small enough to hide in your wallet for whenever you need it. They're super easy to use. You just take the swipes out of the packet, you swipe it on, let it dry, and you're good to good to good to go. That's it. It's simple. So go to getroman.com. Slash chicklets right now to get your first month of swipes for just five dollars when you choose a monthly plan. What an unbelievable deal! That's getroman.com slash chicklets. And now enjoy Adrian Kempe. All right, it's time to bring on our next guest, a first round pick of the LA Kings at the 2014 draft. This Swede is currently in a sixth NHL season and has already achieved a career high in goals and points. He also played in his first all star game in February. And he's a former teammate of our guy, Paul Biz Nasty Bissonette. Thanks a bunch for joining us on the Spit and Chickens podcast. Adrian Kempe, how's it going, man? All good. How about you guys? Not too bad. You must be uh, feeling good. That, not that they were going to trade you, but the trade deadline passed. You guys didn't really make any significant moves. You added a, a depth defenseman. And uh, you guys ready for the stretch run here or what? Uh, yeah, I feel like we are. I think, uh, you know, uh, ever since the start of the year, I feel like we've been kind of slowly climbing and climbing during throughout the year. And, you know, we... I think we have a lot of depth, you know, obviously a lot of guys hurt right now. So, I mean, that's tough, but you know, uh, we got another D man in kind of what, uh, what we needed a little bit more offense kind of from the back end, but I feel like uh, a couple of guys are coming back too. And, uh, we feel good about ourselves right now. And, you know, we have some, some big games coming up now for the rest of the year to, to make it a playoff stretch. Camp's contract year for you. Oh, <laughs> it is. <laughs> Holy fuck! Shaving the, the All Star game, shaving the best for the All Star year. This might be the uh, most we ever spoke, even when we were playing together. We were, in fact, roommates as well. All right, we had to live together. Oh my! All you were yeah. doing back then, Kemps, was playing video games. Are you still big on the video game train? Oh yeah, oh yeah, huge on the video games. But I mean, 
I've uh, I've come a long way in terms of uh, of uh, talking to other guys. I feel like since I uh, was back in Manch, but I mean, I still I'm still a huge uh, video game guy and um, do that every day. Buddy, your English is unbelievable. You speak better English than me now. <laughs> oh, Why did he you. struggle when you when you first met him? No Swedish guys struggle with English. Really. No, he he knew it, but there was like you know there was some stalling on on certain words you didn't know. But it's, yeah. it's gotten drastically yeah. better. And I, and I would imagine your your brother helped out a little bit with that. Yeah, for sure. And I think uh, my my first year too. I've always been kind of good in English, but I mean, obviously, coming to a new team, not knowing anybody, no other Swedish guys or anything. I was kind of shy, and you know, I I. To be honest, I am a shy guy, but I mean, uh, I've been here a couple of years now. So, I mean, uh, obviously, it's uh, getting better and better. How bad was Roma with Biz? You must have a Brutal. couple of horror stories for oh, us. Oh, yeah. No, it was great, uh, actually. Don't lie First to of all, I, 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 did, I didn't really know who Biz was uh, before I came over. But, you know, my brother oh. and all his buddies, uh, you know, they knew Biz and said it was hilarious and stuff like that. So, I, you know, I, I was expecting a lot, but I got there. But obviously, I didn't understand half of his jokes that he told me. And uh, but I, you know, I he don't was a great. Half like, half we don't either. <laughs> <laughs> he was a great roommate. You know, he took care of me a lot uh, over there. So it was uh, that was great. He was he, you were so impactful to that team when we won the Calder Cup. I think you came in uh, just as we'd started playoffs. I think what do you, what do you uh, have in the Calder Cup playoffs? Did eight goals in that playoff oh. run. So, I mean, it must have been crazy for you to come over from Moto and then all of a sudden you're in a run and, and, and winning a Calder Cup. must have been pretty exciting for you to hop right into the pro game over here. Did you notice a huge difference from the SHL? Uh, yeah, I, I feel like, the, you know, I, I came over, uh, practiced like two days, and then we had a three-on-three, three and I was like, wow, this is, <laughs> this is a lot of games. And then, uh, you know, I knew the team was, they were like first in the league and, and stuff like that. They won the conference and everything. So I knew they were going to be good, but then, yeah, I, we, we almost lost to, I remember, Portland first round. We I think we beat them in game five or something like that. And I was like, oh, this is pretty tough. And then, you know, after that, we pretty much went 4-0, 4-0, 4-1 or something like that. So, you know, the team was unbelievable. And, you know, I was playing with uh, some some good players too. So I was just, you know, sitting back door and tapping the puck in. Wait, you'll love this. He's a big soccer guy. Oh. Is, it was, it was, oh, yeah. it was it Ibrahimovic, your favorite player? Yeah, the cockiest guy in the world. Yes, he's Swedish guy too. <laughs> so, Kev, yeah, he's great. A, um, there's a faction of Barstool, Barstool Chicago. They had a draft, and we did the Sports Divas draft, and and Ibrahimovic was my pick. And mm -hmm. I, I would would you say that's fair? Like, as good as he is, as amazing he is, he he's a big time diva with some of his quotes in the past, right? Oh yeah, hundred percent. Especially when he, uh, I remember when he signed over here, when he signed for the Galaxy. You know, when he took up. Uh, like the entire newspaper and said uh, LA or welcome or something like that <laughs> when he came over oh, wow. it, was, it was hilarious and everybody on our team they're like who the fuck is this guy <laughs> we went to a game and, and uh, he scored and you know everybody everybody likes him but he is he is cocky but in a good way I feel like and uh, when I got the chance to play with uh, Markstrom um, Marky had mentioned to me that with all the Swedes, you know, Lidstrom and the legendary Sundin, all these legendary Swedish hockey players, he still thinks that he's the most famous man in Sweden. Would you agree with that? 100%. I feel oh. like he's uh, over in Europe, just in general, you know, everybody knows like, who he is, and in, especially in Sweden, too. I mean, hockey hockey's big in Sweden, but, you know, Ibra is uh, something else in, in Sweden. You know, he had his own statue in, in the city where he came from and stuff like that. So, I mean... Not just in Sweden, but overall in Europe, he's, he's massive. Kemp, I don't know if I ever told you this story. So I was in uh, Vancouver, and I don't, know if, I don't know if Sweden had missed out on the World Cup because it was during the World Cup time, and maybe he was on vacation, or maybe it was right before. I go into a Starbucks, and, and I, I had to piss my dick off. And I'm like in a panic mode, and I go up to three guys, and I'm like, hey, you guys know where the pisser is? And they all just looked at each other and completely ignored me. One of them was Ibrahimovic. No way. He completely no way. fucking pigeon tossed me. Huge <laughs> he wouldn't even, he looked at me, he wouldn't even speak to me. So, yeah, I would agree with it. He's one of the biggest divas, Whit. <laughs> well, I'm seeing, um, I'm seeing you're from, or at least Hockey DB says sometimes it's incorrect. You're from Cranfors, Sweden. Am I saying that correctly? Yeah, that's correct. So, that's uh, pretty much 40 minutes from uh, Modo or uh, Ovik where, uh, where I played uh, before. But I grew up uh, outside of that city. Uh, and played, you know, played there a lot. So what's cool is like the, the, the senior teams in the SHL, they have teams all the way down to when you're eight, nine years old. So were you playing for Moto your whole life? No, I was playing for Crown Force, you know, okay. in my hometown 
thought it was like 14, 15. And then, you know, when you, you go to school, I, I went to Moto and, and played there for, uh, for three years before getting drafted and stuff like that. But, you know, always played against those guys and being in that area uh, growing up. Kemp, the uh, Kings have had a huge turnaround since last season. What's the biggest reason for that? You guys second in the division after not qualifying for the playoffs. Oh, fuck. Last we year. just took a time machine going from fucking Moto to the fucking <laughs> oh, Kings. <God. laughs> that was a pre written uh, well, RA question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I feel like, uh, you know, we got some more depth last summer in terms of uh, a couple of guys, you know, both uh, Phil, uh, RV, and uh, Eddie came into the team. And, you know, there's. There's some good, uh, they have some good experience. All those guys, you know, veteran players, uh, good. Uh, Phil has been unbelievable. RV as well. And, you know, Eddie just coming back from injury right now too. It's, uh, it's been a great impact. And I feel like we got more depth in our lineup, just uh, not just having previous seasons. Always feel like uh, Kopi's line has been the only line that's really been doing it for us. And then I feel like this year now we have a couple of lines that can play, you know, against uh, other teams' top lines and we can score and stuff like that. So, I mean, uh, I feel like uh, that helps us a lot. You know, uh, our goal is to have been playing unbelievable, both Quickie and Cal, and, you know, that gives us a chance to win every game too. So, uh, we we believe in ourselves uh, a lot more, I feel like, this year than we've done in the previous years too. So, uh, that obviously helps a lot. Kim, uh, is it safe to say that it took you a, a little bit longer than maybe you expected to figure out the the NHL game? And and obviously this team is stuck by you, but like obviously this year is is your 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 outbreak year. Like, were, did you feel like it was a little bit more difficult earlier on to kind of understand how to how to get it done at that level? Yeah, I feel like my first year we always made the playoffs the first year, and you know. Uh, we got a lot of injuries that year as well. And I remember I played with, uh, I, I got up and played with Ty and uh, and Pierce for a little bit and had a good season. But then, you know, after that, it's kind of where we started the rebuild process. And, you know, for myself too, I think I was, you know, pretty much playing with every single guy on the team uh, for a first season and then bouncing around in every single line. So, I mean, it was, uh, it was tough to find a little bit of that chemistry going with some guys too. And, you know, uh, the confidence wasn't maybe the best for myself either. And uh, always been, you know, trying to get my consistent consistency, like up uh, every season. And, you know, that was something I had to try to find uh, for my, for my first like four or five years. And uh, maybe it took a little bit longer than I wanted to, but, you know, I'm happy that uh, I'm having a good year right now and the team is playing well and that, you know, that I can show that I can be the player that uh, the Kings wanted me to be before. Did Todd McClellan talk with you prior to the year and maybe kind of pump you up a little bit or maybe ask you or tell you what he expected and how he believed in you? Was there any sort of that before the year that maybe changed it or was it kind of just like this was my time? It was bound to happen. No, he he definitely talked to me and uh, especially adding a couple of forwards, you know, uh, he he, uh, he was talking to me, telling me that, you know, you're going to be with, we don't know um, if we're going to play with Kopi or if we're going to play with Phil, but, you know, you need to take that, you know, next step. And, uh, I, uh, you know, I like playing with pressure and, but I felt also like playing with those guys, uh, would give me a confidence boost too. you know, having good players around me for pretty much the entire season. And, you know, now I've been playing with Kopi for, uh, yeah, last 50 games, you know, uh, it, it helps a lot just, uh, being with two guys then bouncing around every single line, you find that chemistry and, and, uh, you know, where the guys are on the ice all the time. And, you know, especially gives me a lot of more confidence playing out there every game as well. Has having a consistent voice as, uh, from a coach as well? Because the first few years, I think you had three or four different coaches. Now you've had Todd for the last three. I'm, I'm guessing that's had a huge impact on your game as well. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I feel like, yeah, especially I've always had the same coach back in Sweden and stuff like that. Coming to LA, you know, had three coaches in three years. You didn't really know what to, what to expect from all of them, but, uh, Ever since Todd came, he's been great. You know, he's been honest with uh, with all the guys and me and uh, what he expects from me and uh, and stuff like that. So he's he's been great, and uh, you know, all the guys uh, really like him on the team. So it's uh, it's been good. So, so we like asking guys about different players, and you know, we haven't heard much from the Kings. And one guy I got to ask about. It's not even necessarily about his personality, but this twenty year old Arthur. Kaliev, I hope I'm saying it correctly. He was part of the world junior winning team for Team USA. 
I'm more curious about this guy's fucking tape job on his stick. If you go on Google, anyone listening, and search the knob of his stick and the tape job mm-hmm. he has, he's got one stripe of tape on the toe of his stick, and then the knob yeah. is like, what is going on with that? Have you chirped him for what's what's up top there? Yeah, we chirp him pretty much every single day. He pretty much has like five rolls on his knob. It's just if you hold his stick, it's just like you you won't reach around it. It's crazy how big it is. And then on the blade, he's just like, like one. my horn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, on the blade, He's like, like no, I've spread. seen it, Biz. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's crazy. And guys, you know, whenever he not fuck up, but whenever he maybe he misses a pass or something, Brownie and those guys always get on and that tell him, you know, if you had tape on your stick, you would have scored thirty already. But. He, he won't change it. He actually changed his knob uh, recently. So now he's oh, actually okay. using a, a, a normal knob that's still on the blade. Uh, blade uh, pretty much no tape at all. And I, I got the chance to play World Juniors with Dustin Brown way back in the day. Does he still, is he still the magician? Is he still doing that stuff? Because he was like a master magician then. Is he still doing that stuff to you guys? Or is that no nope. days back? Uh, yeah, I have never seen that, so I didn't wow. even know about that. But I'm gonna ask him that tomorrow, and then yeah, call him. He can bring some was, back. Yeah, he was fucking with all of us, pu- pulling <laughs> rabbits out of his hat and all this different stuff. You gotta call him oh, up for that. I I had no idea about that. That's funny. Uh, you mentioned Quiggy a couple of minutes ago. Uh, they, your team just celebrated his 700th game played as an uh, NHL goaltender. Uh, see, he's more of a quiet guy than a crazy goalie that what we typically expect, huh? Uh, yeah, he's quiet, but you know, he he's still. Uh, pretty loud in the locker room you know especially okay. now when we have a younger team and you know uh whenever he plays he uh you know supports the boys and stuff like that but you know he's uh he's been awesome ever since i came to you know taking care of me and all the all the younger guys and uh yeah i mean he's um, great that's all i can say Kemps, Kemps, he's been gassing up his pizza johnny's a pizza have you ever had it at his place no ever never he's <laughs> never invited okay so he says that that port and i would give him a 10 out of 10 on the pizza list Oh, I got to ask him about that, too, actually. I got to go over. It's actually Brown is doing mag- magic tricks, and, and Quickie's inviting everyone over, but Kempe hasn't seen either one of them. No, Bra- <laughs> I, think, I think Brownie retired the magic tricks. I think so, too. I haven't it- heard about it, actually, in six years. I mean, it must uh, – I don't know. Maybe I'm making this up. No, 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 no. I I went to an all-star game, not a big deal, in the OHL. And Brownie at that point was doing like David Blaine style magic tricks. Mm. But I guess at a certain point that he he stopped doing them, Kemp's. Yeah. You got 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 to get him back going because I know this TikTok generation will really appreciate his magic tricks. Yeah. Of course, I'm, I'm going to get on it right right away tomorrow. So I'll, I'll get back to you guys and see how it goes. <laughs> uh, hey, I want to go. I want to go back to Sweden. So you you played for the Moto Junior team. Like like coming up, did you have to like move 40 minutes from home and like stay in a dorm and then the train there and go to school there? Uh, yeah. So I moved um, for like the year before I went to school. I actually played in Stockholm uh, uh, for a year. I moved down there. My family moved down to Stockholm, and then. When I started school, I moved back from Stockholm up north, uh, six hour drive pretty much. And then, yeah, lived by myself from I was 16 till, uh, till 19. But, uh, my brother played for the pro team in, in same, uh, same town. So, uh, I had him there and it was, uh, you know, helped, helped a lot. What was it? Was it like, how did you get in hockey to begin with? Was it just kind of every, everybody in the ho- your hometown did it? Or was it your brother as, as the big influence? What got you into it? Uh, yeah, my brother, for sure. I feel our dad played not professional, but he, you know, he was always like big into hockey, you know, coaching and stuff like that when we grew up. And, uh, yeah, my brother obviously played, uh, uh, when I was uh, little too, you know, he's a little bit older than me. So, uh, never got to really play with him when I was younger, but, uh, always wanted to play hockey, play hockey, soccer growing up. And, uh, you know, at one point, you know, I uh, felt like hockey was, uh, my sport and, uh, the thing that I, uh, hopefully could be could be good at and um, you know after that it just took over and uh, yeah um in school you know uh when i played for moto i actually played with my brother for one year too so it was uh it was kind of cool uh when i was 17 so it was uh it was it was nice he his name is mario not a traditional swedish name is it how did he get the name mario oh he's uh, named after uh argentinian soccer player mario campus so that's where his name came from very cool. Okay. All right. And it's cool. You know, you I'm guessing you always looked up to your brother and he played in the Quebec league though. So was there ever, you know, talk about you going over to play major junior or like, how did that all come about where he went and you didn't? Uh, yeah, I was, I was drafted to Barry in the OHL. Uh, 
Oh, that's I, right. uh, yeah. So when I was 17, uh, I got called up to a pro team, uh, with my brother. So that was kind of the point where I f- figured that if I can make the team here, I feel like it's better for me staying here before the draft. Uh, but if I didn't, maybe OHL would have been, uh, been a good spot for me to go to, but then I felt like I, I was playing a decent amount of time in the, in the pro team and pl- still play with under 20s every now and then. So I felt like it was a good, uh, a good spot for me to be at before the draft and, you know, uh, got drafted. And, and after that, uh, just came over here pretty much uh, as soon as I could. Camps, one place he did play was the KHL. Did he bring any crazy stories home from his experiences over there? Uh, I'm trying to think right now. It's, uh, you know, I feel like he has some crazy stories from we don't there. Wanna, but, we uh, we, we want to keep him safe, so, so be careful. He's still there, there right? <laughs> yeah, he's still there, actually. He's, actually, he's here in L.A. right now. He's doing rehab. He, he had surgery on his knee, but uh, he's still on the contract with uh, with Minsk right now, so he has to go back there on Saturday and uh, yeah, get some money. Uh, Drew Doughty, he, is this guy the class clown of the locker room or what? Yeah, he is. He's still uh, still doing all this stuff. You know, he's hurt now, obviously, So, but he's still... Uh, around all the guys in the locker room and he's uh, chirping everybody still every single day for, for everything. So he's, uh, he's funny guy. I want to ask too, like your, your previous career high before the season, 16 goals, you already have 26. What's the biggest reason for that turnaround to how you hit this number so quick? Um, I feel like just shooting a lot more than I've done previous years. You know, I think I've right now, or after like 55 games, I've all already cracked my high in shots and, uh, you know, just uh, the mentality of shooting before passing has been different this year than previous. I've always been a pass first guy, and I feel like now, you know, uh, Kopi has taught me to shoot it all the time. So I try to listen to him, and, you know, it's been working so far. So, I mean, I just got to keep shooting as much as I can. Any discussions uh, yet in terms of re upping you, contract extensions? Is that waiting till the summer? What's going on there? Yeah, we haven't really heard anything yet. So, uh, I mean, it's not. It's not a rush, I don't think. I'm still, you know, restricted for one more year, so uh, probably happen in the summer if uh, if that's what uh, I'm guessing. But you know, uh, it would be nice to hear something. Maybe. I already, I always remember you being a bit of a hype piece. I'm sure you're loving the the LA lifestyle. Yeah, I do like it. Uh, you know, I'm not really in in Hollywood, but you know, we would say around the hair on the beach, and it's a little quieter, but uh, it's a good spot to be in, and especially going to uh, you know basketball games and all the stuff like that you yeah, you see all I, the hype i i heard you became a lakers fan <laughs> i did they're fucking brutal right now what's going oh, on with west brick <laughs> west brick i saw the video actually <laughs> boy dude hilarious. he gained some weight yeah they're, they're i don't know they're um, but they switched their like entire team from last year pretty much i mean it's hard to get the chemistry going there too your their defense has been not good at all so i mean that's uh they gotta try to figure it out um i mean they're still in a playing spot, I guess. Uh, do you so, go? I mean, do you uh, go we'll with the see. boys and sit court side, like court side of the games and stuff like that? Uh, I've only been to one game. I went to Clippers Lakers court side this year once. Uh, that's the only game I've been to, but uh, that's pretty much the only game you want to go to that this year. Were you a hoops fan before you came to the states at all? I did not. Do you understand the game? Pretty, pre- I mean, not that it's rocket science, but do you understand the game pretty much by now? Yeah, I understand pretty well. Uh, obviously, Put the play ball a lot in of the hole. Games. Put the ball in the hole, chief. Yeah. Fucking ball in the hole. <laughs> That's I play a lot of two K and stuff like that, so I kind of got a hold got a hold of it. But uh, yeah, I, I like basketball. It's probably the the biggest sport over here that I like uh, the most after hockey, obviously. But uh, not huge into football or anything like that yet. What soccer team do you root for? Like, what's your club team? Uh, Liverpool. Oh Jesus Christ! Yeah. I'm a Chelsea guy. So you got you got Man City in the FA Cup semifinals. Yeah. I, I, your team's a wagon. I give you credit for that. Yeah, they are actually. If you sign a big ticket, will you take out a, a page in the paper, just like uh, your buddy Abri- Zabrimovic or whatever the fuck his <laughs> name is? <laughs> I'm gonna try and say you're welcome, LA, but uh, I don't think I'll get that. But uh, I'm gonna definitely try. We mentioned you guys had a little bit of the injury bug lately. Uh, what do you guys need to do to ensure that you hang on to a playoff spot from here on out? Uh, I feel like still we got to, you know, uh, you know, it's tough because we have a lot of injuries and stuff like that, but we still got to, you know, uh, keep playing our game, uh, play good D zone and stuff like that. We've been doing that pretty much all year. Uh, you know, 
keep shooting the puck. I think we, we had the most shots in the league by any team for a while. And, you know, that's been helping us too and helping us scoring. And, uh, you know, special teams, uh, it's got to be, it's going to be huge for the last 20 games. Hasn't been good uh, for us all year. And we, there's something that, that we got to get better at. And uh, both PK and PP is kind of, you know, it's always going to be a, a big factor, especially in the playoffs too. So that's something we got to work on and uh, get better at here in the, in the last 20 games for, for us to keep, you know, uh, keep our spot in the, in the playoffs. I guess the last thing I was going to ask you camps, I noticed you've been posting with the same girl a lot. You finally uh, settled down with a nice lady. I mean, you're, I you're a hot, you're a hot commodity in LA, man. <laughs> no, I mean, come on, let's call a spade a spade. Tatted up. You're tatted so, up. You're you know, at six, two, the, the big, free agent. The, the big swing and dick on campus for the LA Kings. Like, come <laughs> on, man. What happened there? You got, you, you got a girl. Yeah, I do actually. Uh, figured after a couple of years, you know, I was, uh, needed someone to take care of me at home and, <laughs> and feed me. Can't, I, I couldn't just eat <laughs> garbage food all the time. So, uh, it was, uh, it was nice to find someone that, you know, can help me with a lot of stuff and I uh, know she's great. So, very so happy. put, put a ring on it yet or no, no not yet. No, 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 no. Wait to, yeah. My, slow down, Biz. Yeah. He, he, slow down here, Biz. He just, yeah. He's just early in the game, right? Well, I, yeah. I, I mean, I figured if, you, if she's cooking the good meals, like it sounds. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it will eventually, maybe, but not yet. Now in Sweden, we don't get married until we're like 30 at least. So I and have like, a couple kids. So yeah, Well, yeah, Camps, you've came a long way since those little shin pads in Manchester, buddy, and I'm really happy for you. Congratulations on a good season so far. And I know you guys got some work to do to get into playoffs here, but uh, good luck with the playoff push. And we'll get you on uh, a little later in your career, especially after you sign the big ticket. All right. Sounds great. Thanks for having me, guys. I really right, appreciate Kemp. it. Thanks for joining, buddy. Big thanks to Adrian for jumping on with us. And uh, let's go Kings, baby. I got a little cash on them, so I'm rooting for him. And uh, his interview was also brought to you by Game Time. Are you looking for last-minute deals to the Kings game, a concert, or an NBA game, or anything else? You need to check out Game Time, the new Ticket an app that makes it easier than ever to score last minute deals. Game time is the new exclusive ticketing partner of Boston Sports, and it's the only ticketing company that Boston Sports uses to buy tickets. It was created by fans for fans, and they guarantee the lowest prices because they crack the code on how to score late deals on last minute tickets. It's unreal. If you're like me and you love to be spontaneous, then Game Time is the app for you because there's nothing like snagging awesome seats at the last minute and not getting ripped off on the tickets. That's the best part. You want to sit in the glass and not pay an arm and a leg? Check out the Game Time app. The purchase process takes less than two taps in less than 10 seconds. And once you buy your tickets, they're delivered directly to your phone. It's no printer needed, nothing like that. The app also allows you to easily share your tickets with your friends so you can pass them via text so you can get your friends on the game seamlessly. It's awesome. Skip the hassle. Enjoy the moment. Go to game time. The best part, you get $20 off your first purchase. Download the Game Time app, go to the account tab to create a login and redeem the code Chicklets for $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply, but check this stuff out, folks. It's awesome. I'm not sure if you used your Game Time app for the Washington Capitals game Saturday versus New Jersey, but you would have had a very unique experience. You would have been handed a spongy apple on the way in the door for Nicholas Backstrom's 1,000 assist. And then he scored a goal during the game. And of course, everybody threw their apples on the ice. I've seen a lot of scenes, of, obviously, biz hat tricks and teddy biz and whatnot. I've never seen like spongy apples thrown on the ice. And then the Capitals come on and cleaned up the fucking apples. It was pretty funny, man. Yeah. Last time I saw something like that was the rats with uh, the Florida Panthers. Scotty Bellamy, yeah. Johnny Van Breesbrook was goaltender. But uh, no, well deserved, man. What a career for this guy. Thousand points, um, you know, just not on a contending team anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fucking around, guys. Come on, don't get that. Would, I don't need. I don't need you guys getting poopy pants over that one. Yeah, no, it, it was a, a, a unique scene. I mean, we've never seen a, actual like Nerf apples thrown on the on, on the ice before. So good stuff. Uh, and congrats, like Nicky Backstrom. Yeah, like the teddy bear toss, but with apples. Yeah. A little bit like that. Uh, also, we got to give a shout-out to Phil Kessel. He passed Doug Javis on the NHL's all-time IMA list. He's now the number two man with 965 straight games in the lineup. And uh, he's only, what, let's see, 13? No, I'm sorry. I, I'm terrible at math. 23 behind our boy Keith Yandel. Keith has 988 straight games. 
Uh, the Flyers have 16 games left, so barring anything unforeseen, which uh, boys should pass a thousand games. That will be an unreal thing if it happens. I love it. Looking forward to seeing that happen. And 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 Phil, amazing, amazing that those two guys have never haven't missed a game in this long. Oh my God, Tom Wilson just threw the biggest hit ever on Trocheck. Oh boy, four <laughs> one right now. Oh, I don't. Oh, I, I oh, Trocheck hopped up. I don't think. I think it's a clean hit. No penalty. Yeah, Vin, Vinny can take a hit like Chris Rock. <laughs> <laughs> salary cap is going up at least a million dollars next year to 82.5 million. Uh, it's been three years uh, with a flat cap, but at least it never went down and now it's going up. I know there was a lot of pessimistic outlooks when the pandemic first started, but uh, this is a good thing. It's going up a million dollars and the league is going to uh, discuss extending the salary cap into the playoffs. I know we've talked about the Kucherov stuff. Um, I'm suspecting biz that it's a few GMs from teams that are pissed off about it. I honestly don't think they're going to, make this change to you biz nope i think it's just something to talk about in the media and i think it's uh it's stupid they should worry about figuring out no trade lists first the players have to agree to it and i just don't think they ever yep. would exactly unless Wait, they gave them something else unless they were like here take this or whatever because the players it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't help them so there's no reason for them to agree to it yep exactly exactly nhlpa has to agree to it and if they don't then it's not going to happen so as a, a pair of former NHLPA guys, we'll side with you boys. Uh, the Frozen Four for the NCAA is all set. Uh, Michigan will play Denver. Uh, Minnesota will play Minnesota State. Uh, ironically, they're going to take place here in Boston. April 7th uh, is the semifinals. The finals will be on Saturday. The 9th, uh, Northeastern and UMass uh, each lost a heartbreaker in overtime Friday night. Uh, then AIC, Quinnipiac, Harvard, UMass Low also got bounced. So it's basically a Mostly Midwest Frozen Four, along with one team from the South, Piz, uh, Colorado, has a team in Denver there. So I get it. <laughs> I get it. Uh, earlier in the tourney, ND, they give their silent treatment uh, to one of their boys after a goal. Have you guys ever done that? A guy scores a big goal and everyone ignores him in the room. Is that? I don't think that was a thing, thing when I was playing. Yeah, that's new, but that was a classic one. Being one of the captains, and it's just dead silent. And he's like, at yeah, one point, I yeah. think he started smiling, and they went crazy. So that was a cool video. Yeah, pretty good, pretty good stuff there. Uh, also, too, uh, there were thirteen first round draft picks playing college hockey this year. Michigan had seven of them. Uh, obviously, they're still alive in the tournament. They've been dominating. So just a crazy stat. Not so much a thirteen, but over half of them going to Michigan. Um, let's see. Lots of teams. I hope, I hope we see a fab five type situation where they're like in the final game and they're just like the most colossal fuck up. <laughs> didn't Chris Weber fuck shit up for them when he yes, called the timeout yes, and he shouldn't yes. have? They yeah. didn't have any oh, left. Oh, baby. <laughs> yeah, they don't have one. They, they, they're up three going into the third and they blow it. Would you consider that colossal? Yeah, Absolutely. but like in terms of like what you're saying, it would have to be one individual, which I'd never root for. I never want to see that, but I know maybe what you're the, saying. Maybe if the tying goal was one where they like were getting a power play and the goalie came out and they like own goal. Put it in their to, own net. To tie. We'll see. Don't fuck you might it have up, just boys. You might have just talked something into existence here. Oh, you trusted the guy. You blew it. All right, what else we got here, boys? Uh, <laughs> gee, do you have any random topics before before we finish this podcast off? Like, throw like, what are the kids talking about other than Will Smith smacking Chris Rock? Because so I this one was more big on social media that. yesterday. Was you know every time an NBA team loses, the team will post a graphic. You know, the Brooklyn Nets lose, they'll post a graphic of Kevin Durant and it'll say the score. So this guy Kenny Beachman, he went back and you know he he saw the L.A. Lakers the past few games hadn't posted a picture of LeBron when they lost. So I believe the L.A. Lakers have lost just over forty games this season. So this guy Kenny Beachman went back through every social media graphic the team has posted during a loss this season, and not one time has that graphic been a picture of LeBron James. Does that every surprise other, you? Does every it, other it, team does their star player, not one. With LeBron, who, who, uh, who, who, what is the the number of each player? So, like, how many is Westbrook bring in the graphic, or is or is there not even another player in the lost graphic? He, he didn't go back and do that, but he went to, as far as to say that he went all the way back to the preseason games from the beginning of the year, and there was not one picture of LeBron James. Now, let me ask you guys: Do you think that is in his contract? 
Um, I'm not going to say something like that's in the contract with the agent saying you can't put his picture up on a social media post when they lose, but he could have told someone or he didn't even maybe have to tell someone never put my picture up there. I mean, that, that is maybe the most least surprising thing I've ever heard. And I also saw Jimmy Butler on social media, try to fight his coach last week. Yeah. One of the most, he, what one of the most incredible clips I've ever seen, but you can't tell what's happening. Uh, Eric Spolstra, who a lot of people consider one of the top coaches in the NBA, and all these coaches, they have to deal with the most ridiculous uh, Texas-sized egos of all these guys. And he's so – you the person in the stands that's probably like three or four, four rows back from the bench, he's filming where Butler's backs to him and he's looking at Spolstra. And there's a little bit of a intense conversation – and all of a sudden, you can read lips. You can almost hear Spolster say, what do you think? I'm going to fucking fight you? Like, so it was, it, was, it was very evident Jimmy Butler somehow was like, I want to fight you or like, let's go or something. Whereas immediately you see Udonis Haslam, I hope I'm saying his name right, who's, a, from what I've read, very well-respected, kind of tough motherfucker, NBA 15-year uh, guy who has three rings, I believe, stand up and it's like, I'll beat your ass to Jimmy Butler. So all of a sudden it's like, and Jimmy Butler, who's had some stories throughout his career of just being, while an amazing player, an enormous pain in the ass from what I've read, completely backs up. Like you could tell he wants a zero smoke with this Udonis guy. And just the fact that like, He's saying something to where the coach has to say, what do you think? I'm going to fucking fight you. We're on the middle of and the Miami Heat are the number one seed in the East. So it's like this, this Jimmy Butler guy is just an absolute clown. I would love to know what he said to get that reaction from Spolstra, but it, it's, it's a wild league. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's just dealing with egos. It's dealing with guys who probably can't handle being wrong. Um, that's coming from somebody who's not exactly great at being wrong myself, but I'll say this. I've never you've seen never a challenge a coach. I've never tried to go a coach. I've had a million coaches try to go me, but <laughs> it was a wild clip. If you haven't seen it, just Google Jimmy Butler, Eric, Eric Spolstra, because it, it, Spolstra's face is of utter shock. He's like, oh, my God, you think I'm going to fucking fight you? I was wondering if there was ever confirmation of Butler challenging him to fight because I was. I don't think it came out, but like what else would he have said? You know what I mean? For Spolstra to say that, I, I, I more think. Yeah. No, I mean, it doesn't take a detective. You got to chime in there, G? I thought. No, I was just going to say I have two more crazy things on the Internet that the kids oh, are talking okay. about. Okay. Uh, one being that a girl found out that her most uh, biggest patron on OnlyFans was her father. Uh, so that's a little fucked up. And I uh, hated oh. Pianetaire, the first love of my was life. Was she jamming herself? Oh, yeah. It was, a, uh, oh. it was an explicit. Wait, was, uh, wait, was he? Yeah, so she found out it was her father. So that was oh a little my fucked God. How much has he spent? Didn't say. But she found out that her I mean, maybe he's not watching and like, so he's just getting money to her, but I mean, that is disgusting. Fucking sub allowance. I mean, it's just send her a Venmo, buddy. Her, to, <laughs> her hitting the subreddit of 5,000. Wait, that's her it. getting the rabbit. Her, her sitting on a Sibian, giving her allowance. Uh, what's I the mean, next one? So Hayden Panettiere, the first love of my life, uh, and her scumbag boyfriend got into a massive fight outside of a bar after he allegedly spit on a patron after uh, arguing about the bill. So I wanted to ask you guys, what is the most fucked up thing you've ever seen at a restaurant? Probably R.A. waking up and eating Brett Merriman's food. Really? You're that old and that's the most like strangest thing you've seen at a restaurant? I've seen a bunch of fights. I've seen a bunch of... I don't know, like, yeah, in bars, like, I've never so, seen somebody fall asleep at a dinner and then wake up and eat one of the person's meals that was then yeah. used in the bathroom. The only thing yeah. that comes to my head, I actually told KB and Nick uh, this uh, in Wheeling. They probably thought I was lying about this one, too. One of the restaurants in Wheeling, um, my mom ordered potato skins, you know, the ones that are covered with, like, cheese and they got, like, the bacon bits in it. And she Fridays has some good ones, I think. Yeah, like, she took a bite out of it, chips. and then she's like, "Oh!" And then she took it out, and there was a piece of chewed mint bubble gum in it. Like oh. I don't know, the cook must have done that. So I mean, that's... yeah, fist fights, whatever. I mean, but that's like a, I guess, different than seeing one of those. Oof. Maybe maybe a, a girl or a guy getting a drink cum trickled in his face. I think Is it was pretty it? funny too when uh, they made. Um, I think Johnny Leclerc made Sid at our rookie party, sit in a giant bowl of like 40 scoops of ice cream. 
That was pretty funny. And then Scuds later on, Rob Scary was eating the ice cream. He's a big dessert guy. That's up there. That's up there for sure. All right. What do you got? Some fight someday, one day you saw? You know, I'm, I'm trying to think like. Don't like, think. Oh, you're so think, old and you don't have one? Don't think too hard. I know. I'm just so, like trying to think like. I'm not. Wow, you're this old. You don't have one. It's crazy. No, I I know. That's that's why I've been struggling for the last five minutes to think like some crazy thing I've seen in a restaurant. And like, I, you know, I I, I don't have like, like, oh, my God, this like crazy restaurant story. So I said you falling asleep and eating someone's meal. You immediately jumped and said, that's the craziest thing you've seen. And then you don't have one. (laughs) You got me. (laughs) I mean, yeah, I just thought me like passing out, like drunk at midnight and waking up eating the closest food to me it wasn't that big. Of Putting deal. Gretzky in a headlock. Uh, the, the, yeah, the, the, the conversation <laughs> guillotine would probably be number one on oh, my list. Fuck actually, off, fuck off, motherfucker. I know, I know to take a cue and a go. <laughs> no, but no, honestly, uh, what I I'm trying to think of like a. I mean, I'm sure I've gotten like food, like a hair, my fucking food, or some of that type of shit. Oh, I mean, that's crazy. Uh, we, At least uh, I had the peppermint I mean, hey, spearmint gum. You'd rather have a four. Inch, you'd rather have a four inch blonde than a fucking one inch short and curly. Trust me. <laughs> um, I'm done, boys. That's it. That's a wrap. All right. Okay. All right. All right, boys. I, I can't. Is that, that it? Do we have anything it's, else? Uh, the, I'm gonna bullet point a hit, Biz. Uh, shout out to your compatriots in Canada. They beat Jamaica for nothing. They qualify for the World Cup for the first. Woo-hoo! Oh yeah, that's great. That's I watched every news. game, every minute of every yeah. game. Congratulations. Huge news. Uh, if you don't want to do it, I'll do it for Canada. Uh, also, Final Four, UNC versus Duke, Villanova versus Kansas. If you root for Duke, you're a fucking traitor, no matter what. Unless you went to Duke, don't root for fucking Duke. Uh, also, shout out to Coda for winning Best Picture. None of the other movies were worthy of it. Um, not that they weren't worthy of it, but Coda fucking deserved it just because it was an off year. And what else here? Uh, oh, yeah. This is a sad note. Um Foo Fighters drummer uh, Taylor Hawkins passed away at 50 years old. Um, terribly sad news, and I'm not going to sit here and pretend I was the biggest Foo Fighters uh, fan of the world, but anytime a young guy Terrible. like that passed away, whatever the circumstances are, however it happens, it's sad, it's awful, and this guy was part of an iconic band that, uh, you know, you know, maybe after my generation, but I, I, I know what he meant to so many people. Uh, he was Alanis Morissette's drummer for years. Uh, you know, he, he's become a huge drummer in the, in the, in the annals of rock history of the last 25 years. So uh, we want to give our condolences to everybody who is sad about the loss of uh, Taylor Hawkins. Uh, we're terribly sad to hear about it. And uh, we want to extend our condolences to everybody who, who was affected by it. Boys, uh, any final thoughts before you close? One thing, guys, pre-register for the score bet app. And we will be in Toronto April 4th at Ron Davies starting at 6 p.m. before the Leafs game. Me, R.A., Biz, and the Murley man himself will be there. Caps fans, 5-1. 5-1 for the Carolina Hurricanes. There was your test tonight. All right. See you in the playoffs. Thank you for listening, guys. Love you all. Peace. Have a great week, all. 